Ladies and gentlemen, a good morning to you. This is John Cameron Swayze in the NBC Newsroom in New York. Over to the deal of the storm area today, the forecast is for better weather, which is encouraging news to many thousands of people. We'll have details of this top subject during the broadcast. Threat of a fuel oil strike in hard-hit New York City increases. Boston's truck driver strike is still in progress. Our direct reports of the morning take us to Washington, to Paris, and to London. More news in a moment, but now you're an announcer. I'm sure you don't have to be reminded that winter weather makes for bad driving and increases the chances of traffic accidents. The fact is that the accident rate in winter months goes up as much as 50%. And it's easy to figure out why snow and ice on the windshield cut down your visibility. Icy streets and roads make skidding easy. So if you have to drive in bad weather, remember to take every precaution for your safety. Use chains on your tires. Keep your windshield free of steam and frost, and above all, drive slowly. It's easy to take chances, but it's just as easy to be careful. And every chance you take may mean the one accident that will lead to death or injury. The odds are against you if you drive carelessly in bad weather, and caution pays off in safety. Now back to the newsroom. The Weather Bureau says that generally over the storm area, stretching from the Texas panhandle to the east coast, the worst is past. While that is encouraging, it definitely does not solve the problems of thousands and thousands of people in hard-hit areas. The death toll attributed to the storm is high, and the damage will run well into the millions of dollars. Hundreds of communities, particularly here in the east and the northeast, are without electric or telephone service. The estimate is that 16,000 homes in and around New York City are without electricity. What happens in that case? Well, here's exactly what happened in one of them. It's a first-hand report because this is what happened to the suburban Swayze's who are now living in a New York hotel. My son met me in the drive when I arrived home yesterday morning. We'll have to clean up this drive a little more, I told him, so that that uh, fuel oil truck can get in easily. Okay, he replied, but there's not too much of a hurry for the truck now. You see, the electricity is off. Well, here is what that rather bland statement meant. When the electricity goes off, we are without lights, refrigeration, heat, for the furnace ceases to function. The hot water heater also stops functioning, and we have no cooking facilities. So I drained the pipes, the furnace boiler, the hot water heater, put the dog in a boarding kennel, the car in a garage, and we moved to New York overnight, or maybe longer. Like thousands of other families, we'll get back maybe today, tomorrow, or next week. No one knows, not even the electric company spokesman. In the state of New Jersey, which is possibly the hardest hit area of all in the Northeast, the governor has proclaimed a state of emergency, and in the northern part, armories have been opened with cots available in order that families may find shelter. In New York City, the stock, curb, and cotton exchanges called off today's business, and the Boston and Chicago stock exchanges are also closed. The threat of another snowstorm in New York, it actually started late yesterday, seems past this morning, the storm having blown out to sea. Over the nation, the New Year's snowfall varied from 11 inches in some parts of the Midwest to 26 inches in the eastern Adirondacks. Widespread damage is reported from Pennsylvania, where highways are glazed. This is also true pretty generally in the east and in some other parts of the country. Travel of all types has been disrupted, but rail travel is returning to near normal. In Illinois, damage to telephone equipment alone is being estimated at nearly a million and a quarter dollars. However, no matter how badly off any of the recently hit communities may be, Burlington, Iowa, still is entitled to the unwanted first place in this regard. Burlington is isolated from the world except by shortwave radio, and the city of some 30,000 has been without light and power since New Year's Eve when the storm first struck. The threat of a fuel oil shortage because of the threatened strike of tugboat workers in New York City's harbor is a very real one this morning. Agreement satisfactory to the union members has not been reached between negotiators, and the strike deadline is midnight tonight. Continuous sessions will be held today with a city labor representative in an effort to avoid the walkout. This morning, the federal government is moving to aid the people in the southern states struck by the recent tornadoes. The people have already done much to help themselves. The fatality toll now stands at 22, and damage is estimated at a million and a half dollars. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin overnight, 12 firemen were overcome by smoke in a fire which knocked out half the burglary circuits of one supplying company. Incidentally, in that New York fire, which was mentioned in bulletin form during yesterday's broadcast, seven buildings were damaged, several persons injured, and because of foam rubber stored in one of the buildings, it was one of the smokiest fires in Manhattan's history. 
This morning, a small cannery tender, the Spencer, is breaking up on a rocky shore of the Alaskan coast, and so far, two rescue vessels have turned back because of the weather. A Coast Guard cutter and a Navy tug have had to put in for shelter because they began to ice up while en route to the Spencer. The number of persons aboard the cannery vessel is not known. In the overseas news today, the future of the Schumann government in France awaits the action of the National Assembly, which is meeting to vote on the Premier's anti-inflation bill. We're going to have a direct report from Paris in just a few moments in which this will be covered. It may be remembered that Premier Schumann said that an unfavorable vote from the Assembly would mean the end of his particular government. In Athens, it's reported that Greek troops are now tracking down guerrilla rearguard units. These units had stayed behind the retreating rebel forces in an effort to block entry of more government reinforcements into Konitsa. Word from Jerusalem says that Haganah, once referred to as the Jewish underground, but which has now assumed the proportions and activities of a militia, is convinced it can successfully defend a Jewish state. The information comes from one of its officers, who adds that Haganah also feels that such an effort in a partitioned Palestine, though it would be ultimately successful, would take from two to three years and be costly in lives. The UN Security Council at Lake Success will meet on Tuesday to tackle its most recent problem, the Dominion of India, Dominion of Pakistan dispute over the fighting in the princely state of Kashmir. And NBC monitors hear this morning that the Pakistan cabinet is meeting to make formal reply to the charges brought by the Dominion of India. Now for our morning travels. First to the capital for Arthur Barrio in Washington. It's pretty early in the morning to begin tossing percentages around, but the old fractions and decimals are playing a very active role in our lives. So today we have the cold fact that in the week ending December 27th, wholesale prices of 900 commodities rose three-tenths of one percent. That's the eighth straight week that the price curves on the wall charts have headed toward the ceiling. And now we stand within two and a half percent of the all-time high of May 1920. Food prices, we're told, dropped two-tenths of one percent the same week, but that still doesn't provide for a display of steaks on the bargain basement counters. And because steaks and chops are still high, Agriculture Secretary Anderson thinks we'll all be asking for meat rationing within the next few months. Anderson hopes that meat and meat alone will come under a new coupon regime and that meat rationing will cause the prices of other foods to behave themselves. The reasons for high prices of meat? Well, Anderson says there's only one answer, a big demand. Otherwise, this morning we're having the calm before the storm. Congress comes back Tuesday, and House Speaker Martin has caused visions of tax cuts, a short-range foreign aid program, and extension of rent control to whirl round our heads. Martin says the House will probably pass a tax reduction bill this month, just to let the White House know what's in the wind but it's the cinch the Senate won't maintain so fast a pace. Echoing Speaker Martin's statements is House Majority Leader Halleck. Halleck told me late yesterday that tax reduction fits right into the GOP program for bringing down high prices. So the Capitol's standing by for action. This is Arthur Barrio in Washington. Now we span the Atlantic to hear from Paul Achenard in Paris. A political truce which lasted barely through the holidays has ended. Today, the French Parliament is meeting in an extraordinary session which may decide the fate of Schumann's cabinet. For the Premier is determined to ask for a vote of confidence on his financial policy. Early next week, there may be a cabinet crisis in France. The situation has arisen over a debate on the tax plans of the government. Amendments followed amendments in the National Assembly, and Finance Minister Meyer saw his projects lose their effectiveness while the government's majority kept reducing as the days went by. The National Assembly as a whole paid more attention to local interests back home than to a drastic financial plan whose object is to save the franc. On the other hand, the upper house, which is not elected by popular vote like the Assembly, showed greater understanding for the cabinet's tax proposals. The government has therefore introduced a new tax bill, which is very much like the first project, with the amendment of the upper house included. Schumann will stake the fate of his cabinet on this new proposal. He will force Parliament to assume its share of responsibility for unpopular measures, and in case of failure, he will throw the responsibility of a cabinet crisis right into the lap of the National Assembly. And now that the $300 million interim aid agreement has been signed with the United States, French financial experts point out that more credits will be required. The interim aid will cover purchases of wheat, coal, and fuel oil, but it will not suffice to import food for cattle, meat, sugar, and various products. This is Paul Archenard in Paris. Next stop, England. Come in, Don Cook in London. 
In far-off Rangoon, nearly halfway on around the world from London, Burma today becomes an independent and self-governing nation. Meanwhile, here in London, another change of great significance is taking place in the organization of the labor government's colonial office. The cabinet post of Secretary of State for Burma ceases to exist, and the holder of the office, Lord Listowo, becomes Minister of State for the Colonies. Both changes are examples of the statesmanship of the labor government's colonial policy, for which Prime Minister Attlee is in the main responsible. Burma is the first nation to declare its independence from the British crown since the American colonies won the Revolutionary War. Burmese astrologers picked today as the most favorable day by the stars for the independence celebration. The Union Jack will come down from Rangoon Government House, and the Burmese national flag will go up in its place. Then Sir Hubert Rance, last British governor of Burma, will drive in procession through the streets of the city and embark aboard the British cruiser Birmingham for home. Lord Listowel's new post gives the labor government three ministers to deal with colonial affairs. Though the Union Jack is going down in Rangoon today, the sun still never sets on Britain's far-flung colonial possessions. In Britain's present economic difficulties, the colonies remain a prime asset. One of the three ministers at the colonial office will be traveling in the future to deal with problems on the spot throughout the world, while the other two direct policy from London. This is Don Cook in London. Here in the United States, in the labor news, the first day of the cables workers' strike in four companies appears to have cut down the amount of traffic that is normally handled with the Pacific. However, it apparently did not reduce the flow of transatlantic messages, as the companies say supervisory employees were able to handle all traffic. In Boston, the strike of some 6,000 AFL truck drivers is now in its third day, and there are no signs of settlement. Virtually the only truck traffic is that of food, fuel, and medical supplies. 450 companies are involved. In Manila, the gasoline shortage has been eased through an at least temporary settlement of the strike of major oil company employees. An overnight speaker in this country was the Navy's Director of Public Relations, Rear Admiral Felix Johnson. And the Admiral told the graduating class at Annapolis that the public should get all the information possible without violating security. He said, in part, it's up to us to tell the taxpayers what is being done with their money. More news in a moment. Now, your announcer. Is your child's school giving him the best possible education to fit him to do his job as a citizen? In many American communities, the answer is no. For throughout our country today, millions of children are going to school in crowded classrooms, are doing without essential supplies such as paper and textbooks, and in many cases are being taught by poorly trained substitute teachers. Many of the best teachers in our school systems have been so overworked and underpaid that they've left their profession, and their places are filled with inadequate teachers or not filled at all. And the reason for all this? You, as a parent and a taxpayer, simply haven't been paying enough attention to what's been going on. The situation can be corrected if you will investigate the educational conditions in your community and join with community groups to take positive action that needs to be taken if our children are not to be cheated out of the good education they deserve. Now, once again, back to the NBC Newsroom. Near Salem, Oregon, a logging truck crashed through a bridge along a country road, completely wrecking it. And then officials learned that the stork was expected in three homes separated from hospitals and doctors by the missing bridge. So the county borrowed a movable bridge from the state and is making an all-out effort to get it installed. And unless the stork shows an awful burst of speed, they figure they'll make it. In Philadelphia, the city needed new motor cars for official work and advertised for bids with the old city cars offered as trade-ins. They received two offers from dealers who said they would supply new cars and pay additional cash as well. So Philadelphia is buying 258 new motor cars, trading in old ones, and making $10,000 cash on the transaction because the dealers can resell the old trade-ins for such a high price. That's the story, folks. John Cameron Swayze saying goodbye from the newsroom in New York. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, a good morning to you. This is John Cameron Swayze in the NBC newsroom in New York. Over a good deal of the storm area today, the forecast is for better weather, which is encouraging news to many thousands of people. We'll have details of this top subject during the broadcast. Threat of a fuel oil strike in hard-hit New York City increases. Boston's truck driver's strike is still in progress. 
Our direct reports of the morning take us to Washington, to Paris, and to London. More news in a moment, but now your announcer. I'm sure you don't have to be reminded that winter weather makes for bad driving and increases the chances of traffic accidents. The fact is that the accident rate in winter months goes up as much as 50%. And it's easy to figure out why snow and ice on the windshield cut down your visibility, icy streets and roads make skidding easy. So if you have to drive in bad weather, remember to take every precaution for your safety. Use chains on your tires. Keep your windshield free of steam and frost, and above all, drive slowly. It's easy to take chances, but it's just as easy to be careful. And every chance you take may mean the one accident that will lead to death or injury. The odds are against you if you drive carelessly in bad weather, and caution pays off in safety. Now back to the newsroom. The Weather Bureau says that generally over the storm area, stretching from the Texas panhandle to the east coast, the worst is past. While that is encouraging, it definitely does not solve the problems of thousands and thousands of people in hard-hit areas. The death toll attributed to the storm is high, and the damage will run well into the millions of dollars. Hundreds of communities, particularly here in the east and the northeast, are without electric or telephone service. The estimate is that 16,000 homes in and around New York City are without electricity. What happens in that case? Well, here's exactly what happened in one of them. It's a first-hand report because this is what happened to the suburban Swayze's who are now living in a New York hotel. My son met me in the drive when I arrived home yesterday morning. We'll have to clean up this drive a little more, I told him, so that that uh, fuel oil truck can get in easily. Okay, he replied, but there's not too much of a hurry for the truck now. You see, the electricity is off. Well, here is what that rather bland statement meant. When the electricity goes off, we are without lights, refrigeration, heat, for the furnace ceases to function. The hot water heater also stops functioning, and we have no cooking facilities. So I drained the pipes, the furnace boiler, the hot water heater, put the dog in a boarding kennel, the car in a garage, and we moved to New York overnight, or maybe longer. Like thousands of other families, we'll get back maybe today, tomorrow, or next week. No one knows, not even the electric company spokesman. In the state of New Jersey, which is possibly the hardest hit area of all in the Northeast, the governor has proclaimed a state of emergency, and in the northern part, armories have been opened with cots available in order that families may find shelter. In New York City, the stock curb and cotton exchanges called off today's business, and the Boston and Chicago stock exchanges are also closed. The threat of another snowstorm in New York, it actually started late yesterday, seems past this morning, the storm having blown out to sea. Over the nation, the New Year's snowfall varied from 11 inches in some parts of the Midwest to 26 inches in the eastern Adirondacks. Widespread damage is reported from Pennsylvania, where highways are glazed. This is also true pretty generally in the east and in some other parts of the country. Travel of all types has been disrupted, but rail travel is returning to near normal. In Illinois, damage to telephone equipment alone is being estimated at nearly a million and a quarter dollars. However, no matter how badly off any of the recently hit communities may be, Burlington, Iowa, still is entitled to the unwanted first place in this regard. Burlington is isolated from the world except by shortwave radio, and the city of some 30,000 has been without light and power since New Year's Eve when the storm first struck. The threat of a fuel oil shortage because of the threatened strike of tugboat workers in New York City's harbor is a very real one this morning. Agreement satisfactory to the union members has not been reached between negotiators, and the strike deadline is midnight tonight. Continuous sessions will be held today with a city labor representative in an effort to avoid the walkout. This morning, the federal government is moving to aid the people in the southern states struck by the recent tornadoes. The people have already done much to help themselves. The fatality toll now stands at 22, and damage is estimated at a million and a half dollars. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin overnight, 12 firemen were overcome by smoke in a fire which knocked out half the burglary circuits of one supplying company. Incidentally, in that New York fire, which was mentioned in bulletin form during yesterday's broadcast, seven buildings were damaged, several persons injured, and because of foam rubber stored in one of the buildings, it was one of the smokiest fires in Manhattan's history. This morning, a small cannery tender, the Spencer, is breaking up on a rocky shore of the Alaskan coast, and so far, two rescue vessels have turned back because of the weather. A Coast Guard cutter and a Navy tug have had to put in for shelter because they began to ice up while en route to the Spencer. The number of persons aboard the cannery vessel is not known. In the overseas news today, the future of the Schumann government in France 
awaits the action of the National Assembly, which is meeting to vote on the Premier's anti-inflation bill. We're going to have a direct report from Paris in just a few moments in which this will be covered. It may be remembered that Premier Schumann said that an unfavorable vote from the Assembly would mean the end of his particular government. In Athens, it's reported that Greek troops are now tracking down guerrilla rear guard units. These units had stayed behind the retreating rebel forces in an effort to block entry of more government reinforcements into Konitsa. Word from Jerusalem says that Haganah, once referred to as the Jewish underground, but which has now assumed the proportions and activities of a militia, is convinced it can successfully defend the Jewish state. The information comes from one of its officers, who adds that Haganah also feels that such an effort in a partition Palestine, though it would be ultimately successful, would take from two to three years and be costly in lives. The UN Security Council at Lake Success will meet on Tuesday to tackle its most recent problem, the Dominion of India, Dominion of Pakistan dispute over the fighting in the princely state of Kashmir. And NBC monitors here this morning that the Pakistan cabinet is meeting to make formal reply to the charges brought by the Dominion of India. Now for our morning travels. First to the capital for Arthur Barrio in Washington. It's pretty early in the morning to begin tossing percentages around, but the old fractions and decimals are playing a very active role in our lives. So today we have the cold fact that in the week ending December 27th, wholesale prices of 900 commodities rose three-tenths of one percent. That's the eighth straight week that the price curves on the wall charts have headed toward the ceiling. And now we stand within two and a half percent of the all-time high of May 1920. Food prices, we're told, dropped two-tenths of one percent the same week, but that still doesn't provide for a display of steaks on the bargain basement counters. And because steaks and chops are still high, Agriculture Secretary Anderson thinks we'll all be asking for meat rationing within the next few months. Anderson hopes that meat and meat alone will come under a new coupon regime and that meat rationing will cause the prices of other foods to behave themselves. The reasons for high prices of meat? Well, Anderson says there's only one answer, a big demand. Otherwise, this morning we're having the calm before the storm. Congress comes back Tuesday, and House Speaker Martin has caused visions of tax cuts, a short-range foreign aid program, and extension of rent control to whirl round our heads. Martin says the House will probably pass a tax reduction bill this month, just to let the White House know what's in the wind but it's the cinch the Senate won't maintain so fast a pace. Echoing Speaker Martin's statements is House Majority Leader Halleck. Halleck told me late yesterday that tax reduction fits right into the GOP program for bringing down high prices. So the Capitol's standing by for action. This is Arthur Barrio in Washington. Now we span the Atlantic to hear from Paul Archenard in Paris. A political truce which lasted barely through the holidays has ended. Today, the French Parliament is meeting in an extraordinary session which may decide the fate of Schumann's cabinet. For the Premier is determined to ask for a vote of confidence on his financial policy. Early next week, there may be a cabinet crisis in France. The situation has arisen over a debate on the tax plans of the government. Amendments followed amendments in the National Assembly. And Finance Minister Meyer saw his projects lose their effectiveness while the government's majority kept reducing as the days went by. The National Assembly as a whole paid more attention to local interests back home than to a drastic financial plan whose object is to save the franc. On the other hand, the upper house, which is not elected by popular vote like the Assembly, showed greater understanding for the cabinet tax proposals. The government has therefore introduced a new tax bill, which is very much like the first project, with the amendment of the upper house included. Schumann will stake the fate of his cabinet on this new proposal. He will force Parliament to assume its share of responsibility for unpopular measures, and in case of failure, he will throw the responsibility of a cabinet crisis right into the lap of the National Assembly. And now that the $300 million interim aid agreement has been signed with the United States, French financial experts point out that more credits will be required. The interim aid will cover purchases of wheat, coal, and fuel oil, but it will not suffice to import food for cattle, meat, sugar, and various products. This is Paul Archenard in Paris. Next stop, England. Come in, Don Cook in London. In far-off Rangoon, nearly halfway on around the world from London, Burma today becomes an independent and self-governing nation. Meanwhile, here in London, another change of great significance is taking place in the organization of the Labor Government's colonial office. The cabinet post of Secretary of State for Burma ceases to exist, and the holder of the office, Lord Listowel, becomes Minister of State for the Colonies. 
Both changes are examples of the statesmanship of the labor government's colonial policy, for which Prime Minister Attlee is in the main responsible. Burma is the first nation to declare its independence from the British crown since the American colonies won the Revolutionary War. Burmese astrologers picked today as the most favorable day by the stars for the independence celebration. The Union Jack will come down from Rangoon Government House, and the Burmese national flag will go up in its place. Then Sir Hubert Rance, last British governor of Burma, will drive in procession through the streets of the city and embark aboard the British cruiser Birmingham for home. Lord Listowel's new post gives the Labour government three ministers to deal with colonial affairs. Though the Union Jack is going down in Rangoon today, the sun still never sets on Britain's far-flung colonial possessions. In Britain's present economic difficulties, the colonies remain a prime asset. One of the three ministers at the colonial office will be traveling in the future to deal with problems on the spot throughout the world, while the other two direct policy from London. This is Don Cook in London. Here in the United States, in the labor news, the first day of the cables workers' strike in four companies appears to have cut down the amount of traffic that is normally handled with the Pacific. However, it apparently did not reduce the flow of transatlantic messages, as the companies say supervisory employees were able to handle all traffic. In Boston, the strike of some 6,000 AFL truck drivers is now in its third day, and there are no signs of settlement. Virtually the only truck traffic is that of food, fuel, and medical supplies. 450 companies are involved. In Manila, the gasoline shortage has been eased through an at least temporary settlement of the strike of major oil company employees. An overnight speaker in this country was the Navy's Director of Public Relations, Rear Admiral Felix Johnson. And the Admiral told the graduating class at Annapolis that the public should get all the information possible without violating security. He said, in part, it's up to us to tell the taxpayers what is being done with their money. More news in a moment. Now, your announcer. Is your child's school giving him the best possible education to fit him to do his job as a citizen? In many American communities, the answer is no. For throughout our country today, millions of children are going to school in crowded classrooms, are doing without essential supplies such as paper and textbooks, and in many cases are being taught by poorly trained substitute teachers. Many of the best teachers in our school systems have been so overworked and underpaid that they've left their profession, and their places are filled with inadequate teachers or not filled at all. And the reason for all this? You, as a parent and a taxpayer, simply haven't been paying enough attention to what's been going on. The situation can be corrected if you will investigate the educational conditions in your community and join with community groups to take positive action that needs to be taken if our children are not to be cheated out of the good education they deserve. Now, once again, back to the NBC Newsroom. Near Salem, Oregon, a logging truck crashed through a bridge along a country road, completely wrecking it. And then officials learned that the stork was expected in three homes separated from hospitals and doctors by the missing bridge. So the county borrowed a movable bridge from the state and is making an all-out effort to get it installed. And unless the stork shows an awful burst of speed, they figure they'll make it. In Philadelphia, the city needed new motor cars for official work and advertised for bids with the old city cars offered as trade-ins. They received two offers from dealers who said they would supply new cars and pay additional cash as well. So Philadelphia is buying 258 new motor cars, trading in old ones, and making $10,000 cash on the transaction because the dealers can resell the old trade-ins for such a high price. That's the story, folks. John Cameron Swayze saying goodbye from the newsroom in New York. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Jurgens Journal featuring Walter Winchell. Mr. Winchell, whose famous column appears in the New York Daily Mirror and other newspapers with more than 25 million readers, is brought to you by Jurgens, the lotion for soft, smooth, romantic hands. And they said, wouldn't you like this jar of new Dryad deodorant free? A jar of Dryad deodorant free? Did they mean it? Indeed we do mean it. A regular 25-cent jar of new Dryad deodorant is offered to you free now when you buy a 50-cent bottle of your favorite Jurgens lotion. Pay the usual 39 cents plus tax for Jurgens lotion. Accept the jar of new Dryad deodorant as a gift. A lovely gift. New Dryad is the cream deodorant doctors, leading skin specialists approved. 
And Juergen's lotion is the lovely hand care the Hollywood stars use. And it's finer than ever today. Save some money, buy Juergen's gift combination. Use today's Juergen's lotion for just two weeks. If you aren't delighted, mail it back to the Andrew Juergen's Company, Cincinnati 14, Ohio, and they'll return your money. You keep the jar of creamy new Dryad deodorant as your free gift. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Walter Winchell. Attention, Mr. and Mrs. United States. The Russian delegation lost its fight to have the United Nations pass a resolution to jail all warmongers. Instead, the United Nations agreed to denounce and condemn warmongering. What is a warmonger? Was Paul Revere a warmonger? History doesn't call him that. Although if Paul hadn't made his ride that night in 1775, there certainly wouldn't have been any fighting. There wouldn't have been any United States either. The rest of this, ladies and gentlemen, is respectfully directed to Mr. Trigby Lee and the others at the United Nations, who nearly every Monday morning request copies of my remarks of the night before. It is very important to me that they listen carefully because I may be denounced and condemned by the United Nations for what I will now say. Your Excellency and members of the UN assembled at Lake Success, when do I stop being a reporter and an American and become a warmonger? If some potential enemy or unfriendly foreign visitor is planning to hurt my country from the air or underground, and I know it, should I forget it or risk being held up to scorn and public ridicule by you of the United Nations? You may say to me, no, don't forget it. Just send what you have along to Washington. Someone you know in Congress, the Senate, the White House, the State Department, or the Department of Justice. But Walter, don't get so excited and frighten the people of 48 states by telling them the truth. Well, Your Excellencies, I guess you'd better start practicing your very first warmonger condemnation. Because I am going to tell what I hear and know to the American people and not to anybody in official Washington. I'm tired and I'm done taking that five minutes after four o'clock every morning New York to Washington train without sleep to report things against the security of our country. I did that for a dozen years, and I tell you, most of the time, nothing ever came of it. Because there are too many men and women in and out of the White House, the State Department, Congress, and the Department of Justice who are either left, right, or indifferent. Therefore, I shall continue to report directly to the people and let the people take it from there. Mr. and Mrs. North and South America and all the ships at sea, is this news or warmongering? Let's go to press. Lake Success, the current issue of the magazine called United Nations World, contains a most enlightening article by Admiral Zacharias. He reports that weapons now exist which could wipe off the earth, every human being, animal, and all vegetable life. This American admiral, who distinguished himself during the war, added as follows, quote, These weapons are being manufactured right now. They are not an American monopoly. Several nations are known to have them. They are, Admiral Zacharias continues, of a bacteriological and biological nature, end quote. That, ladies and gentlemen, confirms in part what I reported a few broadcasts ago and for which some sources denounced me. Tokyo. The reason behind the Russian government's offer for withdrawal of all troops from Korea is simple. A package, revolution, is all ready. Communists would seize the Korean government within a month. Mexico City. The coming turn will open a big drive in Latin America, charging the United States with mistreating American Indians 
on U.S. reservations. The fact is that our Indian affairs badly need correction. Washington. The State Department is deeply concerned about the activities of the Polish and Yugoslavian culture representatives now touring the United States. Stockholm. Sweden, it appears, bet on the wrong horse. Expecting an American depression, Sweden tied herself up with Russian economy, and now Sweden needs American help to fill her Soviet orders. Belgrade. The biggest double talk and laugh, perhaps, of the week was this. Two top Russian leaders flatly contradicted each other. In Moscow, Mr. Molotov told the anxious, helpless Russian people that the atomic bomb was no longer a secret. In Belgrade, Russia's Mr. Zadnop told a come-in-for meeting that America had a monopoly. Obviously, there is no monopoly in Russia on lying. Moscow. Last Sunday night, I told you how to recognize a communist over here. Because, among other ways, I said a commie believes that Stalin is infallible. The other day, according to the dispatches in all the newspapers, 26 million Russian youth not only thanked Stalin for their lives and education, but they said the son should be called Joseph Stalin, quote, because Stalin is the son of the earth. Son of the what? One of Dictator Perón's plan of courting Italian emigration has turned into a laughable international scandal. The first boatload of so-called laborers there turned out to be very wealthy Italians disguised in overalls. Dictator Perón, who shuts down independent newspapers and jails liberal university profs and students, met these phonies at the pier. <laughs> the Washington ticker. The State Department has turned down the request of a dozen Harvard students to visit Yugoslavia. These students are boiling as no reason was given. I assume they wanted to see for themselves what the newspapers have stated about Tito and his alleged no commie alliance. The Navy Department. When Admiral Nimitz retires, his successor as chief of naval operations will be Admiral D.C. Ramsey. He's an airman, too. Washington. The Civil Rights Committee. Members are privately applauding John Edgar Hoover, the G-man, for a magnificent job of protecting civil rights. Why privately? The White House. The inner circle and Congress will clash on the administration of the Marshall Plan. The White Houses want a government agency. The Republican leaders want a corporation. There will be voted, I am told, interim aid for Europe. Mr. Winthrop Aldrich, the chairman of Chase National Bank, is a very big factor behind the scenes. Washington. The administration will demand universal military training in the January session. Arlington. The price of our free press, the American newspaper, which reminds you that Tuesday next is Armistice Day, is usually a nickel or two cents. Plus a million and a half wounded Americans and 350,000 Americans killed in action. To every young American, your country is quietly calling for help. See the enlistment bureau in your community for details. Mr. Jurgen, the front page story in today's New York Herald Tribune that a German army of a million and a half men was organized in Russia was reported by the Jurgen's journal editor about a year ago. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Winchell. I'd like to insert something in the classified columns of the journal. Henry Morgan, I've heard you on the radio. Thanks a lot. I'd like to read this if you don't mind. Situation wanted mail. Young comedian will be unemployed December 3rd. Prospective sponsors, please contact Henry Morgan, care of the Jurgens Journal. Thanks very much. Well, I hope you get a sponsor, Henry. And now, Mr. James Banner for Jurgens. I wonder, after I get married, should I keep on with my job? Well, that is a problem. It takes some doing to manage a household and a job, but one thing is sure. You can do dishes and laundry in your housework and still have lovely hands. Depend on Jurgens Lotion. Today's Jurgens Lotion protects your hands longer than ever against kitchen work roughness. And thanks to recent skin care research, today's Jurgens lotion makes your hands feel softer and look smoother than ever. Then I guess lots of married girls use Jurgens lotion. They certainly do. Young marriage use Jurgens lotion nearly four to one over any other hand care in the world. I know. My married sister always uses Jurgens. 
She keeps an extra bottle in her kitchen. That's a smart idea. Saves time and reminds you to use your Jergens lotion regularly. That's the secret of nice soft hands. Regular but regular use of today's Jergens lotion. Still 10 cents to $1 plus tax. Don't disillusion that young husband of yours. Have the dearest, softest hands like other smart young marrieds. Always use Jergens lotion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Walter Winchell. Ladies and gentlemen, husbands, wives, sweethearts, and boys and girls. Here's your chance to get your mother, wife, or yourself a $10,000 mink coat, brand new. The $10,000 mink coat is a gift to the Damon Runyon Memorial Fund by the Associated Fur Manufacturers Incorporated. Just send $1 to help the Runyon Committee fight cancer and submit an original definition of a communist in 20 words or less. The Runyon Fund Committee is the final judge of the best and original definition of a communist in this contest of skill. The contest closes Saturday midnight, December the 13th, 1947. And the person submitting the best definition of a communist will be announced by Santa Claus on my broadcast of Sunday night, December 21st, 1947. Just in time to give your mother, wife, sweetheart, or yourself a Merry Christmas. Now listen carefully, please, to the address. Runyon Cancer Fund, Care Postmaster, New York City. Please. Don't disqualify yourself and don't send it to me or any radio station or newspaper because that will disqualify your entry. Send one dollar to help fight cancer and your definition of a communist only to the Runyon Cancer Fund, Postmaster, New York City. To the Los Angeles Herald Express, Jack Briskin, the head of the Revere Camera Company of Chicago, sent me $25,000 yesterday for the Runyon Cancer Fund. He is Betty Hutton's father-in-law. Thank you very much, Mr. Briskin. Attention, Oregon, West Coast shipping. Astoria, Oregon. Two more Japanese mines have washed ashore on Oregon beaches. The commandant of the 13th Naval District warns all coast shipping to be on the alert while in Pacific Northwest coastal waters. And that, ladies and gentlemen, winds up another Jurgen's Journal. Until next Sunday night at the very same time. Until then, and with lotions of love, I remain your New York correspondent, Walter Winchell, who leaves you with this. Russia keeps cursing Americans for being capitalists. They'd sure be in a heck of a fix if we were paupers. Good night. Everyone is talking about the new look in fashion, a soft, ladylike look. And Jurgens meets this fashion trend with a new, frankly feminine makeup color, pink frosting in matchmates. Do try pink frosting powder. You'll be amazed at how a soft undertone of pink brings instant enchantment to your complexion. And try pink frosting lipstick across your lips. It's the new bright light shade for the new look. It's a wonderful makeup shade for the colors in fashion this fall and winter. You'll find pink frosting powder and lipstick together in the large Matchmates box at $1. Or try pink frosting powder in the 10 cent and 25 cent sizes. Yes, have the romantic new look with pink frosting. Next week, another edition of the Jurgens Journal with Walter Winchell. And now be sure to remain tuned for Luella Parsons' 15-minute program featuring his guest, Joan Crawford, which follows immediately. This is Jim Bannon speaking. The Job Center of the Air, a WEI public service feature, conducted by the speaker, Art King. This program is designed to assist veterans in New England in finding employment, and bringing to light the answers to veterans' problems. We're heard every Sunday morning at 10.30 to 11. Employers are invited to participate in this worthwhile service to the veteran by sending in available jobs or expected job vacancies. Remember, there is absolutely no charge for this service, and on today's job center, we have another long list of jobs waiting you veterans at the State Employment Office at 9 Beacon Street here in downtown Boston. In addition... Another panel discussion, predicting success in business. You'll be hearing from Dr. Robert McCarthy, chief of the psychometric unit at the Veterans Administration, Mr. Dan Kelleher, president of the Kelleher Trading Company, and a typical New England veteran, Mr. Richard McGee. But first, we're going to speak for the Boston office of the Division of Employment Security, starting the week off with another one of our Veteran Day job casts. In other words, all job opportunities to be discussed this morning are slanted towards veterans, being either exclusively for or suitable for veteran referral. 
And by the way, vets, these jobs are held in the current files of the employment office, which by this time should be familiar to all of you. I refer, of course, to the office at 9 Beacon Street, the employment office operated for your convenience at no charge to you by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The first jobs to come to my attention this morning are on the line of radio repair. Several men with radio experience, gained either in civilian life or with the armed services, are needed for this work by a shop specializing in the repair of electrical equipment. This job should be a pushover for the boys who did radio work in the service. The employer also wants men who are capable of repairing washing machines and other electrical appliances. I don't think there was much uh, washing machine repair experience gained in the services, but at least experience in repairing all kinds of other war material should be helpful to any applicants wishing to interview for these positions. The hours worked in the shop are 8.30 to 5 p.m., and the employer offers a rock-bottom salary of $40 as a starter. More to experienced and well-qualified men. Let me repeat that job order. It calls for several men with radio or elect electrical repair experience. Hours on the job, 8.30 to 5 p.m., salary $40 weekly as a minimum. Apply at 9 Beacon Street and mention the job center of the air. Next, I see a request for three men to assemble control panels for electric equipment, switch gears, and so forth. All applicants should be able to use hand tools, and if they can read blueprints, so much the better. Experience on electrical assembly will also be an asset to anyone applying. Men with qualifying experience and skill will be paid a dollar and a quarter an hour for a 40-hour week. Once more, three control panel assemblers are needed to assemble control panels for electric equipment and switch gears. Salary a dollar and a quarter hourly for a 40-hour week. Qualifications, ability to use hand tools, read blueprints, and to do electrical assembly. In the field of on-the-job training, I have two jobs, both of which I think are quite worthwhile and should interest veterans in their 20s. The first order calls for two potential managers of finance houses, and by that I mean loan officers. College graduates will be given preference, especially those with training in business administration and principles. Applicants should also have access to or should themselves own cars. They'll be trained first by outside contact with accounts and then will learn the inside handling of essential paperwork with the idea of finally becoming branch managers of the finance company. Incidentally, on the job of this sort, it's rather important that applicants have extrovert personalities, also ability to sell. Salary of $120 to $155 monthly will be paid for a 40-hour week and since the company has been approved for on-the-job training for one year, successful applicants will receive government subsistence checks up to the limit allowed. So that's 120 to 155 a month plus government payment. And that limit veterans, $200 monthly for a married man, $175 for a single man with no dependents. As I said, this is a call for two college graduates, veterans with training in business administration, and some financial background, if possible, to learn to become managers with a finance company. Salary, 120 to 155 monthly to start, plus on-the-job training government payments. The second on-the-job training opportunity is open to a resident of Medford. A jewelry store has received government approval to train a man in all phases of retail jewelry sales, store advertising, repairs, show windows, and so forth. A veteran who is at least a high school graduate is called for, and preferably one who has had at one time some experience in the jewelry line. However, failing that, the employer states he'll accept a bright lad with retail sales experience. At first, he'll be paid $25 a week, plus, of course, the government allowance, and will work a 44-hour week. As he becomes competent and of value to the employer, his salary will be increased. No marital status is set by the employer, but he does prefer a young man at least 23 years of age. I'll run over those highlights once again. A veteran for on-the-job training with a jewelry store in Medford to be trained in all phases of jewelry, retail sales, and store operations. Salary, 
$25 a week plus on-the-job training allowance. A local resident, that is one who lives in Medford, will be given prefer- preference. Apply at 9 Beacon Street and mention the job center of the year. At the job center, we've mentioned on many occasions war department jobs. There are still many of these jobs which appeal to veterans who like to go adventuring again. I'll mention some of them right now for Mr. Van Loan, representing the War Department, will be at the office tomorrow, and uh, he'll be there Tuesday night, and naturally would like as many recruits as possible. In fact, he's going to be there only this week on Tuesday night. The first position is a rather interesting one, and while veterans with the necessary qualifications will be given every consideration, it's not a job for which their military service would qualify them. Not to hold you any any suspense any longer, well, that position is that of a welfare worker in Japan, and it pays $5,657 a year. The duties of the worker will be to investigate social welfare conditions in an allotted area and report back to the military administrator in charge. Men only will be considered for this job due to the possible element of danger involved in its conduct. College graduates with at least six semester hours credit in social work and some experience with a welfare department or institution are demanded. Age limits are 21 and 50. There you are, men. It's an unusual job, but don't apply unless you have that actual experience, social welfare experience with a city or state department and are a college graduate with some social welfare credit. The position is in Japan, and it pays $5,657 a year. Here are two jobs which Mr. Van Loon feels he'll have less difficulty in filling than the one I've just described. The first is that of a property and supply clerk on the island of Guam, and it pays $3,300 a year. Here are the qualifications. Any man applying must have been a supply sergeant with the Army Engineers so that he has a complete knowledge of Army engineering equipment. Civilians who may possibly have worked in an Army engineer warehouse would qualify for this job, too. That's a request for a property or supply clerk on the island of Guam at a salary of $3,300 a year. Actual experience with Army engineering materiel is demanded. Another job in the island of Guam is that of an inventory clerk. To qualify, a man must have been a corporal or a PFC with a quartermaster corps and have worked a minimum of two years on inventory. This job pays $3,000 a year. That's a job in the island of Guam for an XGI experienced in quartermaster inventory work to act as inventory clerk for the War Department. Salary, $3,000 a year. Another position, this time in Okinawa, might appeal to fellows who did switchboard supervising at any one of the large army camps. The job is that of a telephone supervisor who will be called upon to supervise a board operated by at least three men or women. This job pays $3,300 a year. I'll repeat, a telephone supervisor, men uh, who are responsible for the work of at least three operators for work on the island of Okinawa. Salary, $3,300 to a qualified applicant. And to be qualified, a man must have worked in one of the army camps as a supervisor of a large, many-position board. Incidentally, there are openings for telephone operators, those with one year's experience on a switchboard to work in Korea. Either men or women may apply, and these positions pay $2,442 a year. That's a call for telephone operators, men or women, to work in Korea on a code switchboard at a yearly salary of $2,442 a year. Apply at 9 Beacon Street and mention the job center of the air. Now, before closing, I'd like to say that Mr. Van Loan is also interested in qualified typists and stenographers at salaries ranging from $2,700 to $3,300 a year for work in Korea, Japan, and Okinawa. All applicants will be given the federal test for typing and stenography before being referred. Details on all of these jobs 
may be had by writing to 9 Beacon Street in Boston or by visiting the office any day this week, 8.45 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon. That just about rounds out our jobs given us today by the State Department, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at 9 Beacon Street in downtown Boston. We have here two more jobs, in fact, uh, four to six jobs, offered by the Toby Deutschman Corporation of Canton. The Toby Deutschman Corporation of Canton is moving to its new plant in Norwood and have openings for four to six technically trained young men to assist in production control of electronic equipment. These young men will become production engineers after suitable training. Applicants should ask for Mr. Robert Payne at the Norwood plant, 921 Providence Highway, which is on Route 1 in Norwood. We repeat, these jobs are not available at 9 Beacon Street, but rather are being offered by the Toby Deutschman Corporation, which is moving from Canton to its new plant in Norwood. They have openings for four to six technically trained young men to assist in production control of electronic equipment. These young men will become production engineers after suitable training. Applicants should ask for Mr. Robert Payne at the Norwood plant, 921 Providence Highway, which is on Route 1 in Norwood. And so ends the first section of Job Center of the Air for today. We move on now to our panel discussion, Predicting Success in Business. You'll be hearing from Dr. Bob McCarthy, Chief of the Psychometric Unit at the VA, Mr. Dan Kelleher, President of the Kelleher Trading Company, and a typical New England veteran, Dick McGee. Okay, Dan, how about carrying the ball? Oh, thank you, Art. Uh, well, Dr. McCarty, or knowing you as well as I do, Bob, as chief of the psychometric unit, what is psychometry? Oh, Dan, psychometry is the science of mental measurement. Well, now, do you mean like the old tests we used to take in school to measure our intelligence and uh, scholastic achievement? Uh, yes and no. <clears throat> Testing has progressed considerably since you were in school. Dr. Thurston, one of our leading psychologists today, has said, whatever exists, exists in some amount. And if it exists, we can measure it. Well, overlooking that track about uh, when I was in school, I presume that you mean there are now other qualities, Bob, such as personality, ambition, ability, etc., in the human that can be measured with scientific accuracy? Oh, yes, indeed. In school, in industry, and today in the educational advisement and guidance and the vocational rehabilitation of veterans, we evaluate intelligence, scholastic aptitude, achievement, and aptitudes of mechanical, clerical, musical, and artistic jobs, as well as personality traits, manual dexterity, and other specific skills by scientifically objective tests. I see. Now, Bob, do you use a standard battery of tests for all veterans referred to you? Definitely no. Each veteran has an is an individual possessing an individual psychometric pattern, and each pattern best predicts probable success in an individual job. The Sandlotters. Here are the Sandlotters, the 744 Sandlotters program dedicated to clean living, clean sport, and good citizenship. In a moment, Judge John D. Watts and Fred Wolf. But first, this message from the people who make the Sandlotters scholarships possible. Whether it be one piece of lumber or a carload, you can get it at Mohawk Lumber and Supply Company, West Chicago at Hubble. Yes, because in Mohawk's five-acre yards, you'll find five million square feet of lumber of every type, size, and description. And incidentally, folks, a huge shipment of plywood just arrived at the Mohawk Lumber Yard. If you want to latch on to the best plywood buy, 
we suggest you hurry down to the Mohawk Yard at West Chicago at Hubble. It's first come, first served. Delivery will be made anywhere in the metropolitan area. It's Mohawk Lumber and Supply Company, West Chicago at Hubble, Detroit's most progressive lumber dealer. Sports shorts from coast to coast, Pittsburgh. Joy reigns in Pittsburgh today with a signing of slugging Hank Greenberg with the Pirates. Greenberg put the Smoky City baseball fans at high tide when he decided to play one more season. He signed a contract with the Pirates that will make him the highest paid player in National League history and perhaps in the history of baseball. Lakeland, Florida. Harold Newhauser has joined the Detroit Tiger fold today, leaving only five players who have not signed their contract. The unsigned quintet includes Paul Dizzy Trout, Bob Swift, Roy Cullenbine, Freddie Hutchinson, and Al Benton. Hot Springs, Arkansas. Middleweight champion Tony Zale today expressed willingness to put on the gloves with suspended challenger Rocky Graziano anytime, anywhere. Detroit. The Detroit Red Wings believe the world is against them. The Motor City Pucksters are desperately fighting to make the National Hockey League playoffs. So tonight, they are scheduled to meet the world champion Montreal Canadiens. Detroit. Newspaper and radio circles today are extolling the deeds of Bud Shaver, who died last night after a short illness. The 47-year-old former WXYZ and Detroit Times sports editor suffered a stroke Tuesday night and died in the Harper Hospital at 10.35 last night. San Diego, California. The two mighty mites of the fairways, Bantam Ben Hogan of Hershey, Pennsylvania, and Di Reese of England will tee off today in a 36-hole match for the mythical International Golf Championship. Detroit. George Sonny Horn, promising young middleweight from Long Island, New York, was savoring his revenge today, for he punched out a decision victory over rugged Pete Mead, Grand Rapids, Michigan, in a 10-round slugfest before over 6,000 fans at Olympia last night. The high school column. The Metropolitan Basketball Playoffs to determine a city champion which completed its first round last night proved to be a bombshell to the favorite, Southwestern. The defending city champions were beaten by Northern 39-36. to Northern, who finished in third place in the regular season in the East Side Division, was not expected to give the Southwestern boys much trouble. Pershing squeezed through over Central 30 to 28. Miller topped U of D 35 to 32. The final game saw Denby and Northwestern forced into overtime before Denby came through with some fine shooting and walked off the court the winner 35 to 31. In the parochial league, Mount Carmel 67, Xavier 21. Dick Kowalski, Mount Carmel forward, scored 29 points as they held a comfortable margin throughout the entire game. Other scores, St. Vincent 54, St. Bernard 43, Sacred Heart 30, St. Hedwig 21, St. Patrick 54, St. Casimir 26, St. Mary of Royal Oak won their 12th straight by Downing Shrine 38 to 23, St. James 39, St. Rita 17, and that's the latest from the high school column. Sandlotter's High School Sportlight. This is Judge Watts. Our high school sportlight this week shines on Tom Doran of St. Catherine's High School. And here is Fred Wolf, the voice of Mohawk Lumber, with Tom's story. If it's reliability you want, I've got the boy. That's the way Coach Harry Spielman of St. Catherine's High School sized up Tom Doran, his six foot one inch basketball center. No one could go wrong on Tom, Coach Spielman continued. He's always giving his best, whether he's in a football, basketball uniform, or at his desk in the classroom. He rates so high with the students that his senior class swept him in as president. He's an A student, you know, and Tom is bound to be a success in whatever he attempts. All the bashful Doran could muster from such a buildup was, thanks, Coach, but I'm really not that good. Tom can't give all his time to athletics at the Eastside School, however, He must help his mother support a family which was left fatherless some years ago. Yes, Tom's deceased father can be proud of his boy. So to you, Tom Doran, goes the golden basketball, and an invitation is in the mail for you to attend the Sandlotters Scholarship Dinner to be held later in the year when two $1,000 scholarships will be awarded to Detroit's two most deserving high school athletes.
time for the voice of Mohawk Lumber, Fred Wolf, and yesterday's Sportlight, the legend of the bullseye. It's a strange story, this tale of a man who was a great national hero as well as a sports idol. Eddie Grant was a big leaguer, a grand person, and truly a great ball player. It was before the First War, and much like our own Charlie Geringer, Eddie was the quiet, studious type. He was a Harvard man, strictly the pipe and book type of guy. But nevertheless, Eddie became one of the greatest third basemen for one of the toughest baseball men of them all, John McGraw. Even old John warmed up to this lad. For at third base, Eddie Grant was like a stone wall. With the grace and speed of a ballet dancer, Eddie stopped everything that came sizzling his way. He was about to step into the World Series of that year when he heard the call to colors in that first great war and enlisted as a private. His friends told him he was crazy to cast aside the gold and the glory of a World Series. But in his quiet, deliberate way, he simply answered, No, I guess I better go. It seems to me this is more important than playing baseball right now. And so Eddie Grant became Private Eddie Grant. And that's how the strange legend of the bullseye began. Months later, in France now, the ex-ball player had become a captain. He and others in his outfit had been slugging it out with the Kaiser's Legion. Ragged, dog-tired, and hungry, Captain Eddie Grant wished his outfit would be relieved. But they couldn't. Not now. The big push was on. They were a part of a battle that was to make history. The famous battle of the Argonne Forest. The Germans were putting up a furious defense. They were throwing everything they had at Captain Grant's company. But suddenly, suddenly the nerve-shattering bombardment came to a stop. A terrible silence closed in. Captain Grant, puzzled by the deathly silence, called the command post for information. CP. CP. Calling command post. CP. Answer, please. Command post. <laughs> no answer. Well, men, it, it looks as if this is it. We're cut off. That's why the Jerry stopped firing. Yes, they were cut off. The entire company was cut off from the rest of our forces. Now it was just a matter of being slaughtered by the enemy. The ball player captain pulled a map out of his pocket and with a dark pencil circled a spot in the forest carefully. Our only chance is to fall back to this spot where there are two companies. We can join them and be safe. But it means walking through two miles of the forest and... As you all know, that forest is full of snipers. But it's our only chance. Let's go. With his 200 men and the map in his pocket, Captain Eddie Grant stepped into the lead and started for the rendezvous. Death lurked behind every tree. The tired, hungry men kept up their courage only because Eddie Grant set them a magnificent example. He was always in the lead, more often exposed to fire than not. It got so every few minutes, fingers of slashing snipers led reached out to bring death to the men following Eddie. The snipers made the walk a nightmare. But Captain Grant kept pushing for that spot he had circled on the map. The ex-ball player remembered that the time to keep pushing hardest is when you're in a pinch. This meant life or death to his men, and he was going to get them through. The horrible silence was shattered regularly with a scream of sniper's bullets. The mist of early dawn made the forest a ghostly place as a ragged group approached the safety point. Now they could see our forces. It was just a matter of yards now. But sitting high on a tree branch, a sniper took careful aim and fired. For the sniper, it was a bullseye. The bullet ripped into the chest of the man leading the group. Yes, Captain Eddie Grant. Of course, Eddie's men cut the sniper down with a hundred shots. But there was the brave captain, dead in the mud of the Argonne Forest. Most of his men were saved, but he was dead. 
And as the legend goes, someone removed that map from Eddie's pocket, and strangely, it was discovered that the sniper's bullet had passed through that black circle Eddie had drawn around the safety spot, the exact spot where the lost company was saved, the exact spot where Captain Eddie Grant was killed. Fantastic? Yes, but true. Truly, one of yesterday's greatest sport lights. The legend of the bullseye. And now, the judge's corner. Here is Judge John D. Watt. Upon the death of her husband, Mrs. Barney Dreyfus was elected to the chairmanship of the board of directors of the Pittsburgh Athletic Company. Barney Dreyfus passed on in 1932 after a lingering illness. Born in Louisville, Kentucky, Florence Wolf, the youngest of 13 children, was educated in that city and married Dreyfus, then the proprietor of the Louisville Colonel. Mrs. Dreyfus has always been intensely interested in the affairs of the pirates, and to this day, ardently follows their fortunes. Mrs. Dreyfus stands out prominently in baseball, the king of all sports, because she loves the game and because to her it's the finest of all sports. She has been a credit to the game. Again, we remind the Sant Lauders of Detroit of the two $1,000 Mohawk Lumber and Supply Company and radio station WXYZ scholarships which will be awarded to two of Detroit's most deserving high school athletes. Hard work on your studies may pay dividends and scholarships, so keep working hard. Just as soon as taxes and baseball will be here, lumber prices will go up in the spring. And that's why Mohawk Lumber and Supply Company, West Chicago at Hubble, advises that you buy your lumber now. Whether it be for repairing or building your home, garage, or a snug chicken coop, your every lumber need can be supplied at Mohawk Lumber. Now here again is an illustration of a typical Mohawk lumber bargain. They have 400,000 board feet of spruce boards selling at $85 per thousand board feet. That's exactly $15 a thousand below market price. Is it any wonder that people are headed for the Mohawk Lumber and Supply Company, West Chicago at Hubble, to get better lumber, better prices, and quicker delivery? <laughs> Listen in again next Saturday at this same time for Judge John D. Watt, Fred Wolf, and the Sandlotters. Larry McCann speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. I suppose that I give a brief um, statement, and then we go on to discuss it. Well, for clarity's sake, I divide the argument <coughs> into distinct stages. Uh, first of all, I should say, we know that there are at least some beings in the world which do not contain in themselves the reasons for their existence. For example, I depend on my parents and now on the air, on the food, and so on. Now, secondly, the world is simply the real or imagined totality or aggregate of individual objects, none of which contain in themselves alone the reason of their existence. There isn't any world distinct from the objects which form it any more than the human race is something apart from the members. Therefore, I should say, since objects or events exist, and since no object of experience contains within itself the reason of its existence, this reason, um, the totality of objects, must have a reason external to itself, and that reason must be an existent being. Well, this being is either itself the reason for its own existence, or it is not. If it is, well and good. If not, then we must proceed further. But if we proceed to infinity in that sense, then there's no explanation of existence at all. So, I should say, in order to explain existence, we must come to a being which contains within itself 
the reason for its own existence, that is to say, which cannot not exist. This uh, raises a great many points, and it's not altogether easy to know where to begin. But I think that perhaps in answering your argument, the best point with which to begin is the question of a necessary being. The word necessary, I should maintain, can only be applied significantly to propositions, and in fact, only to such as are analytic, that is to say, such as it is self-contradictory to deny. I could only admit a necessary being if there were a being whose existence it is self-contradictory to deny. Uh, I should uh, like to know whether you would accept Leibniz's division of propositions into truths of reason and truths of fact, the former, the truths of reason, being necessary. I certainly should not subscribe to what seems to be Leibniz's idea of truths and reason and truths of fact, since it would appear that for him there are in the long run only analytic propositions. I don't want to uphold the whole philosophy of Leibniz. I have made use of his argument from contingent to necessary being, basing the argument on the principle of sufficient reason, simply because it seems to me a brief and clear formulation of what is the, in my opinion, the fundamental metaphysical argument for God's existence. But, uh, to my mind, a necessary proposition has got to be analytic. I don't see what else it can mean. And analytic propositions are always complex and logically somewhat late. Rational animals are animals is an analytic proposition. But a proposition such as, this is an animal, can never be analytic. Well, in take... fact, all the propositions that can be analytic are somewhat late in the build-up of propositions. Take the proposition, if there is a contingent being, then there is a necessary being. I consider that that proposition, hypothetically expressed, is a necessary proposition. If you are going to call every necessary proposition an analytic proposition, then in order to avoid a dispute in terminology, I will agree to call it analytic, though I don't consider it a tautological proposition. But the proposition is a necessary proposition, only on the supposition that there is a contingent being. That there is a contingent being actually existing has to be discovered by experience. And the proposition that there is a contingent being is certainly not an analytic proposition. Though once you know, I should maintain, that there is a contingent being, it follows of necessity that there is a necessary being. The difficulty of this argument is that <coughs> I don't admit the idea of a necessary being and I don't admit that there is any particular meaning in calling other beings contingent. These phrases don't, for me, have a significance, except within a logic that I reject. A contingent being is a being which has not in itself the complete reason for its existence. That's what I mean by a contingent being. You know as well as I do that the existence of neither of us can be explained without reference to something or somebody outside us, our parents, for example. A necessary being, on the other hand, means a being that must and cannot not exist. You may say that there is no such being, but you will find it hard to convince me that you do not understand the terms I am using. If you do not understand them, then how can you be entitled to say that such a being does not exist, if that is what you do say? Uh, well, I will say that what you have been saying <coughs> brings us back, it seems to me, to the ontological argument that there is a being whose essence involves existence, so that his existence is analytic. That seems to me to be impossible. And uh, it raises, of course, the question, what one means by existence? Uh, and as to this, I think a subject named can never be significantly said to exist, but only a subject described. And that existence, in fact, quite definitely, is not a predicate. Well, you say, I believe, that it is bad grammar, or rather bad syntax, to say, for example, T.S. Eliot exists. One ought to say, for example, the author of Murder in the Cathedral exists. Are you going to say that the proposition, the cause of the world exists, is without meaning? You may say that the world has no cause, but I fail to see how you can say that the proposition that the cause of the world exists is meaningless. Put it in the form of a question. Has the world a cause, or does a cause of the world exist? 
Most people surely would understand the question, even if they don't agree about the answer. Well, certainly, the question, does the cause of the world exist, is a question that has meaning. But if you say, yes, God is the cause of the world, we're using God as a proper name, then God exists it will not be a statement that has meaning. That is the position that I'm maintaining. <coughs> because, and therefore, it will follow that it cannot be an analytic proposition uh, ever to say that this or that exists. And take, for example, suppose you take as your subject the existent round square. It would look like an analytic proposition that the existent round square exists. But it doesn't exist. No, it doesn't. Then surely you can't say it doesn't exist unless you have a conception of what existence is. As to the phrase, existent round square, I should say that it has no meaning at all. I quite agree. Then I should say the same thing in another context in reference to a necessary being. Well, we seem to have arrived at an impasse. To say that a necessary being is a being that must exist and cannot not exist has for me a definite meaning. For you it has no meaning. Well, we can press the point a little, I think. A being that must exist and cannot not exist would surely, according to you, be a being whose essence involves existence. Yes, a being the essence of which is to exist. But I should not be willing to argue the existence of God simply from the idea of his essence, because I don't think we have any clear intuition of God's essence as yet. I think we have to argue from the world of experience to God. Yes, I quite see the distinction. But at the same time, for a being with sufficient knowledge, it would be true to say, here is this being whose essence involves existence. Yes, certainly. If anybody saw God, he would see that God must exist. So that, I mean, there is a being whose essence involves existence, although we don't know that essence. We only know there is such a being. Yes, I should add, we don't know the essence a priori. It is only true a posteriori, through our experience of the world, that we come to a knowledge of the existence of that being. And then one argues, the essence and existence must be identical. Because if God's essence and God's existence were not identical, then some sufficient reason for this existence would have to be found beyond God. So it all turns on this question of sufficient reason. And... Uh, I must say, you haven't defined sufficient reason in a way that I can understand. What do you mean by sufficient reason? You don't mean cause. Not necessarily. Cause is a kind of sufficient reason. Only contingent being can have a cause. God is his own sufficient reason, but he is not cause of himself. By sufficient reason in the full sense, I mean an explanation adequate for the existence of some particular being. But when is an explanation adequate? Suppose I am about to make a flame with a match. You may say that the adequate explanation of that is that I rub it on the box. Well, for practical purposes, but theoretically that's only a partial explanation. An adequate explanation must ultimately be a total explanation to which nothing further can be added. Then I can only say you're looking for something which can't be got and which one ought not to expect to get. To say that one has not found it is one thing. To say that one should not look for it seems to me rather dogmatic. What I'm doing is to look for the reason, in this, case, in this case the cause, of the objects, the real or imagined totality of which constitute what we call the universe. You say, I think, that the universe, or my existence if you prefer, or any other existence, is unintelligible. I shouldn't say unintelligible. I think it is without explanation. Intelligible, to my mind, is a different thing. Intelligible has to do with the thing itself, intrinsically, and not with its relations. Well, my point is that what we call the world is intrinsically unintelligible, apart from the existence of God. You see, I don't believe that the infinity of the series of events, I mean a horizontal uh, series, so to speak, if such an infinity could be proved, would be in the slightest degree relevant to the situation. If you add up chocolates, you get chocolates after all, and not a sheep. If you add up chocolates to infinity, you presumably get an infinite number of chocolates. So if you add up contingent being to infinity, you still get contingent beings, not a necessary being. An infinite series of contingent beings would be, to my way of thinking, as unable to cause itself as one contingent being. 
However, you say, I think, that it is illegitimate to raise the question of what will explain the existence of any particular object. It's quite all right if you mean by explaining it, simply finding a cause for it. Well, why stop at one particular object? Why shouldn't one raise the question of the cause of the existence of all particular objects? Because I see no reason to think there is any. The whole concept of cause is one we derive from our observation of particular things. I see no reason whatsoever to suppose that the total has any cause whatsoever. I can illustrate what seems to me to be your fallacy. Every man who exists has a mother. And it seems to be your argument is, therefore the human race must have a mother. But obviously the human race hasn't a mother. That's a different logical sphere. Well, I can't really see a parity. If I was saying every object has a phenomenal cause, therefore the whole series has a phenomenal cause, there would be a parity. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying every object has a phenomenal cause, if you insist on the infinity of the series, but the series of phenomenal causes is an insufficient explanation of the series. Therefore, the series has not a phenomenal cause, but a transcendent cause. Well, that's always assuming that not only every particular thing in the world, but the world as a whole, must have a cause. For that assumption, I see no ground whatever. If you'll give me a ground, I'll listen to it. Well, the series of events is either caused or it's not caused. If it is caused, there must obviously be a cause outside the series. If it's not caused, then it's sufficient to itself. And if it's sufficient to itself, it is what I call necessary. But it can't be necessary, since each member is contingent. And we've agreed that the total is no reality apart from the members. Therefore, it can't be necessary. And I should like to observe in passing that the statement the world is simply there and is inexplicable can't be got out of logical analysis. I cannot see how science could be conducted on any other assumption than that of order and intelligibility in nature. The physicist presupposes, at least tacitly, that there is some sense in investigating nature and looking for the causes of events, just as the detective presupposes that there is some sense in looking for the cause of a murder. The metaphysician assumes that there is sense in looking for the reason or cause of phenomena. And not being a Kantian, I consider that the metaphysician is as justified in his assumption as the physicist. When Sartre, for example, says the world is gratuitous, I think that he hasn't sufficiently considered what is implied by gratuitous. I think uh, there seems to be a certain uh, unwarrantable extension here. The physicist looks for causes. That does not necessarily imply that there are causes everywhere. A man may look for gold without assuming that there is gold everywhere. If he finds gold, well and good. If he doesn't, he's had bad luck. The same is true with the physicists look for causes. As for Sartre, I don't profess to know what he means, and I shouldn't like to be thought to interpret him. But for my part, I do think the notion of the world having an explanation is a mistake. I don't see why one should expect it to have. Your general point, then, Lord Russell, is that it's illegitimate even to ask the question of the cause of the world. Yes, that's my position. Well, if it's a question that for you has no meaning, it's, of course, very difficult to discuss it, isn't it? Yes, it is very difficult. What do you say? Shall we pass on to some other issue? Let's. Well, perhaps I might say a word about religious experience. Ladies and gentlemen, a good morning to you. This is John Cameron Swayze in the NBC News Room in New York. The New Delhi India Radio has just been heard reporting that Mohandas Gandhi has been fatally shot. Gandhi was shot at four times, according to the reports, but at first there was no information as to the seriousness of his wounds. However, the New Delhi Radio has now flatly said the Indian leader was killed and has been heard by NBC monitors in the newsroom. Now your announcer. No parent can doubt the importance of a college education or advanced technical training, Yet each year, countless young high school graduates find themselves without the means to further their educations. Their parents neglected to provide for the future. It takes money to go to college, and the best way to save money and provide for your child's education is the purchase of United States savings bonds, the government bonds that pay back $4 for every three invested. Dollars put into bonds today will pay off handsomely when the time comes for your child to enter college. Why not begin saving today? Make arrangements at your bank or where you work. Buy a bond this month and every month. Now back once again to the NBC Newsroom. 
As we noted just a moment ago, NBC monitors just before airtime heard a direct broadcast from the New Delhi, India radio reporting that Mohandas Gandhi had been fatally shot. It had been reported a bit earlier that the Indian leader had been shot at four times, but nothing was known as to the seriousness of his wounds. Details of the assassination are still lacking. His death comes shortly after the conclusion of his latest hunger strike, on which he embarked in what he termed a successful effort to bring peace to strife-torn India and Pakistan. Gandhi was born on October 2, 1869, in India. When he was 13, he married. His wife was the same age. This is a phase of Gandhi's life about which little was said in later years, for as he became more and more the religious leader, the marital relationship was interrupted, and Gandhi and his wife lived apart as he devoted himself entirely to his religious and political tasks. However, four children were born of this marriage. When he was 18, Gandhi went to England to study law, and it was while practicing the legal profession that he became incensed at treatment accorded some Hindu settlers. He renounced his profession and devoted himself to championing the rights of the people. He began his leadership of the nationalist movement in India in 1915. Again, let me repeat, there are as yet no details regarding the assassination of Gandhi this morning. In other news, Russia has formally charged the United States with violating the Italian peace treaty, according to a broadcast this morning by the Moscow radio. The Moscow report says the violation occurred when the United States sent warships to Italian ports. This was obviously a reference to the aircraft carrier Midway, three cruisers and ten destroyers, which have anchored off some Italian ports. Although nothing has been announced about it in Washington, Moscow says the note of protest was sent to the State Department on Wednesday of this week. The Russians are claiming that the American warships are giving at least moral support to the government of Premier de Gasperi, which has been under attack from the Italian communists. This is the second protest in a week, the Soviet government having also complained to both the United States and Britain over the anticipated reopening of an American-built air base in Libya. A four-motored airplane of the British South American Airways is hours overdue on a flight from the Azores to Bermuda. The plane, a civilian version of the famed British Lancaster bomber, has accommodations for 32 persons, but there has been no word whether it was carrying a capacity load. A London spokesman for the line said that Air Marshal Sir Arthur Conningham of the RAF was probably among those aboard. There has been no other announcement concerning identities, but most of the passengers are believed to have been British. The United States Coast Guard has ordered a search at sea, and a radio appeal has been sent to all vessels to be on the alert for the big plane. Early today, fire destroyed an historic inn in St. Albans, Vermont, and it's feared four persons died in the blaze. Nearly a hundred guests were spending the night at the five-story, 136-year-old Jesse Weldon Inn when the blaze broke out. A number escaped into the 16 below zero temperatures by fighting their way through flames, and several leaped from windows. Several guests were injured, and unofficial estimate of the loss is $200,000. Also in Vermont, the town of Reedsboro is virtually isolated because of the deep snow. The general weather picture this morning finds the cold area spotty, with parts of New England, northern New York, the Dakotas, and Michigan getting the worst of it. And now it's time for our direct reports. Here's the news from the nation's capital, reported by Lee Feed in Washington. The way Republicans and Democrats are shoving each other around down here in Washington, they'll all wind up on the spot by November. The White House request for new controls on grain for whiskey makers is considered a political cutie. The president used the Republicans' own anti-inflation law to put them in the squeeze between dries and wets. The House Banking Committee, with at least one eye on Kentucky, a doubtful state, killed the control bill. Kentucky is said to have several distilleries. But a lot of dries all over the country hate to see even one bushel of grain go into the stills. And that makes it quite a problem for the GOP. And at least one big House Republican says the president's request will get very serious consideration. Besides, the president says the distillers can't agree on voluntary agreements, which Republicans offer to fight inflation, and he hints that that proves that the law is no good. Of course, Republicans aren't helpless. Southern threats practically to secede from the Democratic Party are music to Republican ears. So they're planning to bring up the anti-poll tax and anti-discrimination bills and wait for the Southern filibusters to begin. They figure that will queer the Democrats with the Negro voters in the North. 
And, of course, there's a tax cut that has Democrats scrapping among themselves. There are again the Knutson bill, but they can't agree on one of their own. Otherwise, this morning, the president's all-or-nothing statement on the Marshall Plan is getting a Republican brush off. Senator Taft says, I don't think the president's statement changes the situation. This is Leif Eden in Washington. And now a quick switch to Henry Cassidy in St. Moritz, Switzerland. The Winter Olympic Games began this morning with a grand spectacle of sport and a demonstration of goodwill among men, marred only by the quarrel between two unreconciled American hockey teams. Amateur athletes of 28 nations paraded into the brilliant, sunlit ice stadium of St. Moritz, 6,000 feet up in the Swiss Alps. The teams, each in the colorful uniform of its sport, were led by Greece, ancient originator of the game. Among the athletes were former allies and former enemies, citizens of democratic countries and communist countries, all united by the common bond of fair competition. There was only one reference to politics. President Enrico Celio of Switzerland, declaring the games open, called them a symbol of peace that the world awaits. Then a cannon shot was fired, the Olympic game was lit, the flame was lit, and the men, some of whom were trying to kill each other not long ago in war, set out to defeat each other in sport. During the opening parade, the American squad included a hockey team named by the United States Olympic Committee, but on the sidelines was the team designated by the Amateur Hockey Association and accepted by the Swiss because it belongs to the International Hockey Federation. Immediately after the parade, that team, outlawed by the Olympic Federation on grounds of being professional, skated out on the ice and played for the United States against Switzerland. The upshot of the long controversy is this. The AHA team is playing here, but hockey will not be recognized officially as an Olympic sport. In its first game, the unofficial American team lost to Switzerland 5-4. to four. This is Henry Cassidy in St. Moritz. There's news of interest in Japan. To tell us about it, here's Peter Murray in Tokyo. Gilbert and Sullivan's operetta, The Mikado, opened at a Japanese theater in Tokyo yesterday. For the first time in history, the words sung by the opening chorus, If you want to know who we are, we are gentlemen of Japan, were truthfully spoken in Japanese. Japanese audiences flocked to hear the British classic which has been banned until now in Japan because its gentle spoofing was supposed to be disrespectful to the emperor. One member of the audience who came was the emperor's brother, Prince Takamatsu. I sat two rows behind him and watched. He smiled at least three times, but he did not applaud. When he left a few minutes before the final curtain, he said, I enjoyed performance very much, very amusing. But he looked puzzled. So did most of the audience. Far from being shocked, most of the Japanese just didn't get it. I asked several men whether they thought there was anything disrespectful about the Mikado who pranced up and down the stage and in colloquial Japanese sang how he would make the punishment fit the crime. Oh no, they replied, Mikado a very human man, very kind. But one aspect of the production was greeted by shocked silence. That was when the hero kissed the heroine. A kiss on stage was not only out of place, it was unthinkable. Japan may or may not have adopted democracy, but they have not taken to kissing even two years after the occupation. This is Peter Murray in Tokyo. The Bank of France is doing a bit of watchful waiting this morning. For the details, come in Leon Pearson in Paris. At five o'clock this morning, after an all-night session, the French National Assembly voted to approve the government's cancellation of the 5,000 franc notes. At two o'clock this afternoon, that is ten minutes ago, the banks reopened for business. Later this afternoon, the sleepy assemblymen will come back to work to finish their debate on the devaluation plan. It is now safe to predict that Premier Schumann, who staked the life of his government on these monetary reforms, will be supported all along the line. It is an issue, or rather a series of issues, which have surprised and shocked and divided the country. You can't withdraw 37% of a nation's currency in the dead of night and expect everybody to forget about it by tea time. Hundreds of thousands of Frenchmen are staring at their pretty blue 5,000 franc notes, wondering if they will ever get their money back. The answer seems to be that the little people who hold only one or two such bills will be repaid in full. But the fat pocket people will suffer heavily. And this goes for the French farmers who have grown rich in the past few years, selling their butter and beef at black market prices. They are no longer the poor, oppressed peasants like the couple in Millet's Angelus, staring inert in the field. They are the millionaires of France, and they have hidden their millions not in the mattress or the sock, as tradition has it, but in the wash tub. 
the new law means that a lot of wash tubs will be emptied all over the French countryside. Here is a late bulletin of a tragic character. Part of the food sent to France by the French ship train was destroyed early this morning by a terrific warehouse fire on the outskirts of Paris. Police suspect incendiaries. This is Leon Pearson in Paris. Here are some additional details of the fatal shooting this morning of Mohandas Gandhi. NBC monitors have now heard BBC report an eyewitness account by its New Delhi correspondent, Robert Stimson. Gandhi was shot a few minutes before his evening crown meeting at Birla House. I saw him carried into the house after the shooting, says the correspondent. I was only ten yards away from Gandhi when I heard three or four shots. They didn't sound very loud, more like firecrackers. Gandhi fell back, and the next thing I saw were policemen and members of his entourage grappling with a heavy-set man. As soon as it was realized Gandhi had been shot, a terrible cry of grief went up from the crowd. We'll have more news in just a moment, but now, your announcer. Say there, how's your child's education? You know, a great many American school systems weren't in very good shape when school started last September, and some nice kids were cheated out a full semester of adequate schooling. Was this the case in your local school? Or don't you know because you haven't checked recently? If you haven't, it might be a good idea if you were to drop in and see for yourself the conditions in your child's school. If conditions don't measure up to your expectations, why not do something about improving them? Do what parents have done in countless American communities, from parents' groups and fight for better school conditions. In a great many cases, they have been successful in their fight to improve school buildings, raise wages, and attract capable men and women who prefer good teaching conditions in an alert community. You can make sure that your schools are worthy of your children. So join one of your groups. If you do not have any groups, form them. Now again, back to the NBC newsroom. With reference again to the fatal shooting of Mohandas Gandhi this morning in India, we now understand that the assassin is a civilian Hindu from Pune. He was taken by police immediately after the firing of the shots. Opinion differs as to whether three or four shots were fired. However, Gandhi was shot from a range of only a few feet. The accused man has been taken to a police station and he is now being held incommunicado. Gandhi's secretary told the Associated Press as he wept, Bapu is dead. Bapu, spelled B-A-P-U, was a familiar, affectionate name for the Hindu leader that we didn't hear very much over in the United States. Gandhi was 78. And that seems to be the story, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad we could get together. This is John Cameron Swayze saying goodbye from the NBC Newsroom in New York. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is Morgan Bailey speaking for Alka-Seltzer, bringing you News of the World Night Special. Tonight, New Delhi, the only eyewitness report of Gandhi's death, a BBC-NBC exclusive. Baltimore, special report by Representative Carl Munt in person. San Moritz, the Winter Olympics. Ottawa, the big Canadian spy case reaches prison bars. Those are the headlines. I'll be back in a moment with News of the World. No doubt about it, this is the cold catching season, all right. And certainly you'll agree if you happen to have a miserable cold right now. And you know right now would be the right time to start the easy, pleasant Alka-Seltzer ABC Cold Comfort Treatment. Remember? A. Alka-Seltzer. Take Alka-Seltzer at once for fast relief from the ache all over feverish misery of a cold. And follow the directions on the Alka-Seltzer package. B. Be wise. Beware of drafts. Be sure to get more rest than usual. C. Comfort. Comfort the sore throat caused by your cold by gargling with Alka-Seltzer. Dissolve two Alka-Seltzer tablets in a quarter glass of warm water and gargle freely until relieved. Well, there it is, friends. Alka-Seltzer's ABC Cold Comfort Treatment, so try it if you have a cold. Now, be sure you have enough Alka-Seltzer on hand, for the Alka-Seltzer you don't have can't possibly do you any good. When you go to the drugstore, buy two packages of Alka-Seltzer from your druggist instead of one, then always keep an extra 30 or 60 cent size package handy. It's good advice, and if you heat it, you'll have Alka-Seltzer when you need it. Now, Alka-Seltzer brings you the noted commentator author and reporter, Morgan Beatty. World leaders offered their comment today on the death of Mahatma Gandhi. Each had his own thought to add. 
But it seems to us Senator Albert Thomas of Utah expressed the main theme when he said the world is beginning to see it's the things of the spirit which ultimately have the greatest influence. The spirit ideas are men and people and constitutions. Millions of people believed with Gandhi that truth is God and God is truth. Even in death, his influence will spread after the initial wave of violence in India, and there are riots in Bombay tonight. In a few moments, we will broadcast the only eyewitness account of Gandhi's death from New Delhi. You will hear a British voice coming to you from 9 to 12,000 miles away. This British subject will talk about a Hindu, two Americans. The British Broadcasting Corporation and NBC made technical radio history tonight to do this transcription on regular facilities. The voice you will hear is that of Robert Stimson, New Delhi correspondent, BBC. Here is Mr. Stimson's broadcast. This is Robert Simpson calling Radio Newsreel from Delhi. At three minutes past five in dim time, Mr. Gandhi he came out of Dala House. And because he was a little late for evening prayers, he stepped out more briskly than at any time since his fast. He was wearing his usual white loincloth and a pair of sandals. He'd thrown a shawl around his chest, for it was getting chilly. His arms were resting lightly on the shoulders of two companions. And he was smiling. There were only two or three hundred people in the garden, and they pressed eagerly towards him as he climbed the steps leading to the small raised lawn where the congregation had gathered. As he got to the top of the steps and approached the crowd, he took his arms from the shoulders of his friends and raised his hands in salutation. He was still smiling. A thick-set man, in his thirties, I should say, and dressed in khaki, was in the forefront of the crowd. He moved a step towards Mr. Gandhi, took out a revolver, and fired several shots at almost point-blank range. It didn't sound like a revolver, but like a Chinese cracker that a child might have let off. Mr. Gandhi fell. For a few seconds, no one could believe what had happened. Everyone seemed dazed and numb. And then a young American who had come for the prayers rushed forward to seize the shoulders of the man in the khaki coat. That broke the spell. There was a terrible cry of anguish, a wailing lament from the crowd. Half a dozen people stooped to lift Mr. Gandhi. Others hurled themselves on the attacker. I saw flailing arms beating on his head and shoulders, and soon there was blood on his face. He was overpowered and taken away. In Washington, speculation behind the scenes about the death of Gandhi asks the question, will Soviet Russia interest herself in India at a moment when the young nation is torn by strife and internal emotion? President Truman made it a point to issue a statement suggesting that Gandhi's death should spur the world to increased efforts for peace. Now, before we proceed with our direct reports, here's other top news tonight. In Miami, Florida, the American Federation of Labor accepted the advice of its most outspoken executive members and went all out against Soviet Russia. The AFL came within an ace of endorsing universal military training for America. Stronger United States defenses were demanded, and the labor organization added this. The virulent nature of the council, of, said the council, of Soviet Russian propaganda makes it evident that Russia is deliberately trying to make an enemy out of the United States. Intoxicated by their strength, and dictatorial powers, the Soviet leaders are still shrewd enough, however, to realize they cannot hope as yet to challenge the United States in open warfare. That's why they're waging a cold war and concentrating for the time being on capturing control of the remaining free nations of Europe. In Pittsburgh tonight, Philip Murray, president of the CIO, turned his attention to domestic politics. He called on voters to go to the polls in a mighty crusade for another new deal, as he put it. The men and women of organized labor, he said, like the bulk of the American people, are tired of the raw deal they've been receiving in the last few months. In Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Senator Robert Taft spoke out with a charge on behalf of the Republicans that President Truman dropped Mariner Eccles from the Federal Reserve Chairmanship because Mr. Eccles urged government economy. The senator recalled that Mr. Eccles had appeared before the Joint Congressional Economic Committee and Mr. Eccles had called for a rigid government economy. But President Truman, said Mr. Taft, has called for the largest peacetime budget in the history of the world. The senator added that high taxes are adding 25% to the cost of goods. In Dayton, Ohio tonight, Orville Wright, the airplane inventor, passed away. He was 76 years old. His death resulted from lung congestion and heart disease. 
In Washington, Secretary of State George Marshall is all set to reject notes of protest from Soviet Russia. We'll go ahead with plans to open an airfield at Malaha in North Africa. We will continue to send warships to Italy. A powerful movement is underway in Washington to express American ideas throughout the world regularly in an aggressive way. We have asked the sponsor of the plan to tell us about it. Here is Representative Carl Munt, station WBAL, Baltimore. Passage of the so-called Munt Bill to establish a United States Information Service abroad marks a new epoch in American foreign relations. For the first time in the history of our republic, this country is now equipped and prepared to wage a peace just as it must always be prepared to wage a war should conflict become inevitable. The Munt Bill provides the authority and the means by which our State Department can tell the truth about America, its policies, its purposes, and its people to every country in the world. It also equips us to answer the slanderous falsehoods now being circulated about the United States by foreign communists. Through the use of radio broadcasts, motion pictures, magazines, books, and newspapers, we shall be able to replace fiction with facts. We shall use information libraries overseas, American exhibits, the exchange of students, teachers, journalists, and other personnel to give Europe and Asia a true and honest picture of the United States. We shall expose the tyrannies of totalitarianism wherever they are practiced. We shall encourage free countries to stand firm against the false lures or the aggressive infiltrations of communism. Above all, our American information program will tell the truth. It will have as its text for all the world to hear and read, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Thank you, Mr. Mont, and back to Morgan Beatty in Washington. Next to ideas, international associations of men force us to practice what we preach to the United Nations, even when we disagree. Sports promote association. Here's Henry Cassidy's transcribed report from San Moritz, Switzerland. It looks less like St. Moritz tonight, Sir Morgan, and more like the Verdun or Stalingrad of the Olympic Games because a battle has been going on all day up here in the Alps. It all began pleasantly enough with an opening ceremony this morning that really was impressive. The athletes of all 28 nations parading into the open stadium, the view of the mountains glistening with ice and snow, the modest manner in which President Celio of Switzerland declared the games open as a symbol of peace, all that was a credit to the ancient conception of the Olympics. But then that old quarrel over hockey broke out again. Briefly, the team named by the United States Olympic Committee marched in the parade, but the team of the Amateur Hockey Association recognized by the Swiss because it belonged to the International Hockey Federation, played the first game. Incidentally, it lost 5-4 to four to Switzerland. Before the game, the Olympic Committee threatened to exclude Switzerland from the summer games in London. The Swiss offered to have their police throw the unofficial American team out of the rink, but the Olympic officials declined to go that far. After the game, the officials ruled that hockey was not an Olympic event this year, and they withdrew recognition of the International Federation as the controlling body for the sport. This is a grave decision, because hockey is a popular and profitable winter sport, and the group controlling it is in a strong position, which is a good reason for the quarrel. But tonight, the Swiss declare the Olympic decision is illegal, and they threaten to take it to their court. The Hockey Federation will meet tomorrow to decide what to do. This is Henry Cassidy in St. Marie. The famous Canadian spy case reached another climax today. Here's Blair Fraser, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Ottawa. Dr. Raymond Boyer was the last of 18 people to be tried for taking part in the communist spy plot that was broken in Canada just two years ago. Nine of the 18 have been acquitted, eight are doing time, and now Boyer got two years today, but he's free on $25,000 bail pending appeal. Boyer's part in the whole affair was told in the report of the Royal Commission on the spy plot. He's a French-Canadian, fine old family, a man of inherited wealth, a man who never had to work for a living. When war broke out, he volunteered as a scientific worker. He's a brilliant chemist, a Ph.D. One of the first ideas he hit upon was a new way for making RDX, one of the most powerful high explosives of the pre-atomic age. The formula was secret. It wasn't to be given to the Russians. Boyer admitted that he, on his own authority, gave it to the Russians. He gave it to Fred Rose, the former communist member of parliament here, 
now doing six years for spying on his adopted country. Boyer admitted that with the information he gave to Fred Rose, competent people in the Soviet Union could build a plant to make RDX. Boyer also told Rose, as early as 1943, about the building of a uranium plant for atomic research in Canada. Luckily, Rose got the information so garbled that it couldn't possibly have done any harm. And for all that, Boyer got a two-year term in Montreal today. This is Blair Fraser, and that's what happened in Canada today. Morgan Beatty will return with some more late news. With a weekend at hand, now would be a good time to see about that Alka-Seltzer supply. Late hours or regular eating habits, these can add up to a headache or an acid stomach upset Monday morning. So be prepared for relief the pleasant, effective Alka-Seltzer way. See your druggist and buy two packages of Alka-Seltzer instead of one. Then always keep an extra package handy. Never be without Alka-Seltzer in your home. Mothers, are you having trouble getting your growing children to take their vitamins this winter? Try giving them one-a-day brand multiple vitamin capsules. Each one-a-day brand multiple capsule contains all the vitamins for which the amount needed for grown-ups and children has been established. What's more, one capsule every day is all they take. And one-a-day brand multiple vitamin capsules are low in cost. A full two-month supply for only $2. Ask your druggist for one-a-day brand vitamins, good for growing children and adults. Remember, for vitamins the easy way, for vitamins the thrifty way, the brand you want is one a day. Now here again is Morgan Beatty. And here are signs of our times. Washington. The Democrats still can't get together against the Republican-sponsored six billion and a half dollar tax cut. They are not for the president's plan to give everybody forty dollars tax credit. They're not for a tax on big corporations, and they're not for the Republican tax cut. But no tax rise. The result though the experts still say, will be an overwhelming victory for the Knudsen tax plan, the tax cut in its first test Monday. Seattle, a man who was once a communist, testified today in the Washington State Un-American Activities hearing. His name is Nat Honig, a former newspaper man. He said communist officials in Moscow once asked him why he sent them no publications in the cowboy and Indian languages. Cowboys and Indians, said the Moscow officials, were oppressed minorities. It was men like this, he added, the witness added, who knew no more about America than that, who were laying down the policy for the Communist Party to follow in the United States. And that's the news of the world. Until Monday at this same time, this is Morgan Beatty speaking for Alka-Seltzer, saying goodbye from the newsroom in Washington. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, a good morning to you. This is John Cameron Swayze in the NBC newsroom in New York. In the South, a call for the Southern Convention to nominate a presidential candidate is scheduled for today. There's speculation by speculators, businessmen, and government economists about the drop of commodities. There has been a plane crash in the Ozark Mountains and a half-million-dollar fire in Philadelphia. We'll get into the news in summary and by way of direct reports in just a moment, but now your announcer. On February 12th, America will celebrate the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. And it's well worth the while to consider the words of his speech at Gettysburg in 1863. Words for the men who gave their lives for freedom. It is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of their devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Now back to the newsroom. Politics and the cost of living are both prominent in the news of the morning. There are those who are willing to predict that living costs are going down following the third straight day of limit drops on the grain markets. And the southern governors are awaiting a call to bolt the National Democratic Party with a lack of enthusiasm. Let's look at that story. In conference at Wakula Springs, Florida, the governors are expecting the call to bolt to come today from Mississippi's Governor Fielding L. Wright. That has been anticipated for days ever since the outbreak of feeling in the South early this week after President Truman announced his stand on civil rights on racial issues. 
but it now appears that by no means all of the southern governors are back of the move to both the party. When Mississippi's Governor Wright told Georgia's Governor M.E. Thompson he was going to introduce the resolution to form an all-southern party, the gentleman from Georgia responded by showing Wright an advance copy of a strong statement. It was a sharply worded condemnation of a party vote. The Mississippi governor said he would introduce the resolution anyhow, to which the Georgia governor replied, If you do, we'll beat you. He is not alone in that sentiment. At least some of those who oppose the vote are against President Truman's civil rights stand, but prefer to keep the uh, fight in the party. Besides Thompson, Folsom of Alabama said he opposed the vote. Governors Thurmond of South Carolina and Jester of Texas are reported by intimates to be cold to the idea. Lane of Maryland is against it, and so is Governor Caldwell of Florida, the party's host. Arkansas's chief executive, Ben Laney, hasn't arrived, but the chances are he'll back Mississippi's right in efforts to form a separate party, for he has said he'd rather see a Republican in the White House than accept Mr. Truman's civil rights program. However, in spite of the fact the majority seems against him, Governor Wright is apparently going ahead with his plan. The newspaper The Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi, says that Wright is going to call an all-Southern convention on March 1st to pick a presidential nominee, and that he will ask the Mississippi legislature for $100,000 to finance it. Well, there's a political prediction in the news this morning from a man who prides himself on his astuteness in sizing up the election map. James A. Farley, visiting in Detroit, said he thinks Senator Vandenberg will be the Republican nominee. He foresees a deadlock between Taft and Dewey, with Vandenberg being drafted. But as for election, President Truman will defeat the GOP. For, says Farley, our history shows that a president has never been beaten when times are good and they should still be prosperous at election. That brings us around to the economic picture of the moment. Following the crash of commodity prices for the third straight day yesterday, at least a crack is appearing in family food costs. Flour and lard are the first to drop in over-the-counter cost. Two eastern food chains have lowered flour prices four cents on a ten-pound bag, and others have indicated they'll follow suit on Monday. This traces directly to the drops on the grain markets. Lard is down four cents a pound. However, it is too soon to leap to the conclusion that everything is going down in price. Government economists who don't want to be quoted don't seem to think the retail drops will match the collapse on the commodity markets. They may go down some, but not so sharply. A number of the experts in the business field do think there's a good chance the upward spiral has been halted and there may be some reductions. It's also felt the public is apt to resist high prices more strongly. In Cleveland, American Stockyards Association President A.Z. Baker tossed in his opinion, said he didn't expect meat prices to decline, even if grains have been dropping steadily. He says his belief is based on the short supply of cattle on the hoof, the smallest since 1941. Bernard Baruch is, of course, on the record as saying commodity prices may be softening, the word is his, and that if this is true, no restoration of price controls will be necessary. And New York's U.S. Senator Ives said overnight he was glad the commodity market drops had occurred because he thought a setback in prices would help prevent a large-scale, ruinous depression. Now for our direct reports. Here's a final report on the elections in era from Merrill Muller in Dublin. Prime Minister Eamon de Valera and his defeated administration of nine cabinet ministers are all trooping to one southern Irish constituency today for a weekend of electioneering in an effort to save their ruling authority in this seventh general election. The impossible has happened. For the first time in 16 years, Eamon de Valera has been beaten at the polls. His party of Fianna Fáil capturing only 66 parliamentary seats against a combined opposition of 76. Therefore, the five remaining seats to be voted next week become all important. De Valera needs all five of those seats to further reduce his dependency on national labor and independent politicians. Otherwise, De Valera has the choice of forming a weak coalition government or going into opposition. He cannot escape some form of coalition since he lacks eight seats for a ruling majority. The De Valera party pulled more than twice the vote of its nearest competitor, the Fine Gael group, but this latter held its strength while De Valera was losing some 60-odd thousand ballots. Also, the Farmers Party was virtually eclipsed. The two-year-old People's Republic Party of Sean McBride took much of the other's losses to poll over 170,000 votes and capture 10 seats in its first general election. Socialist labor also came back strongly as the third largest party with 14 seats. De Valera's spokesmen today point out that they can rely on independence for strength and are still the biggest party in the nation. This is correct. 
but it means a coalition government for era of one kind or another and a new election not many months away. This is Merrill Muller in Dublin. Now for our Saturday visit to the Olympics. Our man is standing by, so come in. Henry Cassidy in St. Moritz, Switzerland. A blinding snowstorm has disrupted the Winter Olympic program again this morning with only one more day to go for the game. The finals of the four-man bobsled race had to be postponed until this afternoon, and the ski jump scheduled to begin right now may have to be delayed because it's impossible to see from the top to the bottom of the slope. The hockey games were held up for a while, but were finally played in the swirling snow, and the other remaining Olympic event, the figure skating for couples, is now underway. Under Olympic rules, the games are limited to 10 days and must end tomorrow regardless of conditions. But there's a bright ray in the committee rooms this morning because some kind of agreement has been reached in the long, awkward controversy over hockey. No official announcement has been made, but I understand hockey will be recognized as an Olympic sport. This despite the participation of the American AHA team that was ruled out by the Olympic Committee. What happens to international control of the sport, the real issue, is not yet clear. The agreement was made easier because the unofficial American team beaten twice has no chance to take the championship. The big game this morning was between undefeated Switzerland and Czechoslovakia. It had to be played in six 10-minute periods so the ice could be cleared, and the result was a resounding victory for Czechoslovakia 7-1. to one. America beat Great Britain 4-3. to three. Czechoslovakia is now in the lead, but if the Canadians beat Switzerland in the final game tomorrow, they will take the championship on point. Dick Button and Barbara Ann Scott received their gold medals for figure skating this morning in a ceremony at the ice stadium. The leading teams are now Sweden, then Switzerland, and third, the United States. This is Henry Cassidy in St. Marit. Back home and to check on the news in our nation's capital, we call on Arthur Barrio in Washington. The Senate Banking Committee seems to have tripped all over itself trying to come up with a new rent control bill. So it's taking a 10-day vacation from this tricky problem in order to clear away the mental cobwebs and get a fresh start. A five-man subcommittee turned in some suggestions, but when the full committee began to discuss the proposals, agreements were scarcer than the Valentines which Republicans will send to the Democrats. But here's what the subcommittee bill would do. It would extend controls through April 1949, but would extend them in what's described as greatly relaxed form. There'd be unlimited increases if landlords and their tenants get together on leases which would run through all of next year. It would eliminate, at the end of this year, all controls over the rents of those who sign leases providing for voluntary 15% increases. It would permit increases up to 15% in those cases where landlords can prove that their operating costs have gone up. It would do away with ceilings in any community where 1% of the houses are for sale or for rent. And both landlords and tenants would have the right to appeal. All of which provisions, as they say, are subject to change without notice. Otherwise, this morning, everyone's polishing up the brass at the Pentagon, for this is the day when General Ike Eisenhower steps down and General Bradley steps up as Chief of Staff. There'll be ceremonies at noon with President Truman on hand. And today, the Republicans are going around Capitol Hill muttering expressions such as impossible and out of the question. They're referring to the administration estimate that another $250 million will be needed for foreign aid. The extra money would be for China, Greece, and Turkey. This is a State Department estimate, which has the GOP saying that Americans can't stand that kind of money. And also this morning, we're told that politics is the main reason why prices are so high. The idea comes from Senator Taft who says the administration is trying to create an air of false prosperity in a campaign year. This is Arthur Barrio in Washington. Over the nation, police and sheriff's deputies are trying to reach an isolated section of the sleep-covered mountains of the Arkansas Ozarks, the spot where a plane crashed during the night. It's believed the plane was a B-25 from Wright Field, Ohio, carrying five Army personnel. There has been a half-million-dollar fire in Philadelphia, accompanied by a series of explosions that rocked the nearby area. The blaze swept a fuel oil, chemical, and storage depot. It appears there is a good chance that the Wright brothers' plane will be returned to the United States from England after all. It seems that although Orville Wright did not change his will, which gave the plane to a London museum, he did provide that the airship should be returned if he requested it in writing. Now a letter has been found among the papers of Wright, who died a week ago, which indicates he wanted the plane returned. The letter was written in 1943. 
In London, the director of the Kensington Science Museum, where the plane has been for 20 years, said that if the letter fitted in with the terms of Wright's will, the Kitty Hawk would come back to the nation where it made aviation history. In the labor news, there will be a meeting of the National Airlines officials and representatives of the Striking Pilots Union, who will get together under auspices of the National Mediation Board to try to reach an agreement. The strike still keeps Nationals' planes on the ground and a wide section of the United States is in for a wet weekend with rain and snow in the forecast and the cold hanging on in spots. More news in a moment. Now, your announcer. Say there, if you're a woman under 35 and a high school graduate, there's a career waiting for you in registered nursing. Yes, the need for trained nurses is growing and 50,000 student nurses must enroll in nursing schools this year if the need for nursing services is to be met. Now, positions are opening at a record rate all over the United States in public and private hospitals, in the United States Public Health Service, in private nursing practice, and in clinics and rapidly growing health programs. Nursing is a proud profession, and its members are respected for the merciful services which they render to the community. Furthermore, nurses are well paid. So, if you're a young woman under 35 and a high school graduate, it will pay you to investigate the many opportunities offered by a career as a trained registered nurse. You can get full information if you apply at your local hospital or the director of nurses at any hospital near your home. Now back to the newsroom. Hopscotching the globe, Philadelphia, the American Automobile Association is opposing the lower hemlines for the women. Makes it tougher for the lady pedestrians to avoid being hit by a motor car. Boston, freight loading is at a halt throughout New England by government order, and the holiday will last three days to ease congestion in snowbound railroad yards in the Midwest. The Longshoremen's Union and the Port of Boston Authority are protesting. There seems no limit to the Coast Guard's versatility. Not only do they rescue people at sea, they find time to take feed for the birds. A Coast Guard flying boat flew along the shore in the Cape Cod area yesterday, scattering 300 pounds of corn for migratory birds whose natural food had been frozen. As usual, the mission was successfully completed. Well, that's the story, folks. This is John Cameron Swayze saying goodbye from the NBC Newsroom in New York. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Good evening. I suppose I should open this broadcast in typical overseas style by saying, Hello, Canada. This is John Fisher speaking to you from London. I like that word, London. And believe me, dear old London looks pretty good after 10 or 12 days in the sea of sadness, which is Europe. There's no smile on my lips tonight. No traveler can look into the face of misery on the continent and come back joyful. There is so much to stab the heart with grief. Paris, for instance, is no longer the gay, carefree city of the world. There is a heavy, unfamiliar hand over Paris. The struggle of living is so inconvenient, so tough, that people waste their energy in merely existing and trying to get around the prices. I talk to young Frenchmen who are disconsolate. They feel frustrated and fearful of tomorrow. They just can't get anywhere. And they ask me so many questions about Canada and the possibilities there. I lived like a lord in Paris. For I belong to the privileged group of Europe, the travelers with American dollars. He can get anything he wants. Gorgeous French meals and wines served in your room if you like. And the rich French, as they do in England, the rich English can still buy if they want to pay the price. But the poor fellow on a fixed income just beats his head against a stone wall. I talked to one young Frenchman I met several years ago before the war. He is bright, intelligent, ambitious. He has a wife and one child, and he works for an importing firm. His salary is fixed. And he told me that he hadn't been able to see a moving uh, picture for two years. He couldn't indulge in luxuries. He could never take his wife out to dinner. He couldn't buy presents for the baby. He struggled all the time with rent and food prices. And each month he goes behind and can do nothing about it. Paris today is hard-pressed, hard on the middle class and the poor. The gasoline in Paris is awful. It has a terrible stench, and the old, old-looking cars puff and bark as they putter along. The bread is blackish and tasteless, and the coffee is something that I wouldn't like to see too much of. I left Paris in a sad mood, because it's such a beautiful city, and I took the train for Brussels. 
Now, I heard that Brussels was pretty good despite the four years of German occupation. But I don't think even New York that I have ever seen anything quite like it. The stores are literally bursting with goods. Every kind of material. The Belgian shopper can get chocolates and cigars, American cigarettes, Swedish cigarettes, American cars, and British specialty goods that the British would give their eye teeth to get a hold of, Swiss watches, Swedish machines, and all kinds of goods from the Belgian Congo. Brussels is like a dream after Paris. As I said on the news roundup the other night, it is the oasis of Europe, apart from Switzerland. The answer is partly that Belgium has a fabulously rich Congo. And she also has the port of Antwerp, which the Americans used to bring their supplies into Europe. Well, this gave the Belgians dollars. And instead of being down at the mouth and begging people to work hard after the occupation, the Belgians said, sure, work hard, but we'll use our dollars to get things that we've been without for years. The joker is, though... But the prices are so high that again the old squeeze game goes on. And the poor people and the fixed salaried workers find it very tempting, those stores. But the francs just won't stretch. I took the plane from Belgium, Brussels to Prague. And again I was in a different world. Prague is sad and grim. And the Czech diet is one of the toughest in Europe. It is below the calorie requirements set by international standards. The Czechs have a very fair and a strong ration system, though. They're good organizers. But the benefits go to little children and nursing and expectant mothers. The adults get very little. When I get back to Canada, I'll have some interesting statistics on just how much they eat in Prague. It was perhaps the worst city for food that I struck in Europe. Last year, the Czechs were doing fairly well on their diet. But then came the worst summer and the worst winter known in Europe since the Middle Ages. This on top of six years of war, occupation, the worst in history, too, and all the misery. It's the big word in Europe today. One hears it more frequently than any other, drought. The Czechs had to slaughter thousands of cattle for beef, and they had no tin to use for canning the meat. Consequently, the meat and milk situation is very grim. And thousands of children depend on the dried milk supplies from across the seas. You have no idea of the importance of these so-called protective foods that we are sending from Canada, the United States, the Argentine, and Australia. Talk to the doctors and nurses, and they'll tell you what it means. Of course, this drought not only hit Czechoslovakia, it was general throughout Europe, especially in the East. Well, Prague is a fascinating old city, and it's doing wonders with nurseries and playgrounds and organizations. But for my money, the most thrilling city in Europe today is Warsaw. I was told that it would be bad, but I couldn't believe it. Even after I had seen it, it's beyond the comprehension of the human mind to grasp the enormity of the destruction and the awfulness of war. It's hard to conceive that people can still smile. Well, they do. Warsaw is positively thrilling. The vitality of the place, amazing. Everybody is working with feverish activity. And they're hacking at the ruins. And they're miles and miles of them. They have no modern equipment. I only saw one machine shuttle in my whole tour. They're working with picks and shovels and horse-drawn vehicles and passing the rubble down an assembly line of hand. They told me that there were only four buildings untouched in the whole of Warsaw, and it was bigger than Montreal. Just imagine if the whole of Montreal were knocked down. Imagine if all the buildings were level flat, and on top of that, thousands of people were slaughtered. Why, in the Warsaw ghetto alone, Hitler's men trapped 56,000 Jews. He ordered his soldiers to corner them in the ghetto and then set fire to the place, shelled it, leveled it, and not one living soul escaped. And when the war finished, there was scarcely a single living pole in the whole city of Warsaw. They had been evacuated. And now, they've come back to the cellars and ruins, and they talk once again of a new and a grand city, and their faith and energy is staggering, and their capacity to rebuild are not fanatical. Well, that's the story of the adults. But for children, it's different. And for young people in their late teens and early 20s, the story is hard. Some of them have never known any fun. Take a young boy, age eight, when Hitler walked in. Now he's nearly 20. He's never known anything but rationing and misery. Never had dates like other boys. Never known a home, a new suit, or the thrill of his first dance or first skates. There are thousands of girls in Poland who have never lived through the exciting teens of boyfriends and frills and parties and new dresses and valentines at school. 
There were no schools. No place called home where they could come and giggle and tell Mama about what he said. And these things are the delights of living. Why, do you know that in Europe today there are millions of women in the productive years who will never marry simply because there are not enough marriageable men? In some cases, the proportion of marriageable ones, three to one, four and five to one. Europe must build anew on that kind of a basis. And when you throw in with that the loss of records and the destruction, it's, it's staggering. You know that there are hundreds of thousands of children who still uh, do not know anything about themselves. They don't know what their nationality is. And that's the job of the welfare officers who go to Germany to sort these kids out. A welfare officer will go in and let's say that he has a, a clue. He thinks a little girl living with a German family is of Czech parentage. He'll visit the family and put many questions with permission of allied military authorities. And the German family will probably lie and claim the girl is theirs. But perhaps the investigator will come a, a, upon a Slavic name, and that gives him another clue. He examines records. They then study the little girl's face. They ask her questions, but she knows nothing. Her eyes are big and wondrous and filled with the openness of a child. She speaks only German now. Then the welfare officer will speak to her in Czech or Polish, or Russian, or French, or Yugoslavia. He'll fire the questions at her, but no, no response. He'll wave in front of her toys, characteristics of different nations, hoping she'll respond. They will suddenly thrust something in front of her, hoping that she'll exclaim in her original tongue, but no response. These officers run through all the tests, and if they fail, they try two final ones. They'll sing lullabies in different languages, hoping for some light in the child's eyes. And when that fails, they'll usually employ the most thrilling word in the English language, mother. They will say mother in Czech or Polish or Russian or French or Belgian in the hope that that will open some inner door. And the strange part is that it doesn't always, for so many thousands of children don't even know what mother means. But when this trick brings response from a little kid, then the problems of welfare start anew. Perhaps the child responded to the Czech word for mother. So they think maybe she is Czech. But who is she? She can't tell them, for she has lost her language and only speaks German now. Where is her mother and father? That poses new problems. Records are searched. Parents of lost children send in pathetic photographs and documents. And then photographs of the child are posted. Letters exchanged. And the pathetic search goes on while the child stays in Germany. Allied military authorities will not let the child go until it is proven legally that she is Czech. If there are no parents left, the child will go to a nursery. And in Czechoslovakia, there are thousands and thousands of these war orphans in all countries. But such is the mood of these people to rebuild that Czech families en masse are asking for adoption, begging to take over these innocent victims of man's devilishness. But often in this drama of lost children, the welfare officers do find the original mother or parents. But when the child comes back, she enters the threshold as a stranger, having forgotten her language, unable to speak to her mother now, afraid, lonesome, and now longing for the people who cared for her in Germany. What a mess it is. And there are thousands of cases. Some of them will never be straightened out. But it's surprising what a little care and warm milk and clean clothes and bread and toys will be due. That's where the United Nations comes in. That's Canada's chance. Seize it well, friends. This is John Fisher speaking to you from London. The Columbia Broadcasting System, in cooperation with the radio division of the United Nations, presents Between the Dark and the Daylight, a report on the children of Europe for American Overseas Aid, United Nations Appeal for Children, and the International Children's Emergency Fund. The children whose voices you will hear are real. They were all interviewed and recorded in Europe by Alan Sloan. The narrator is Edward R. Merle. Your report on the children begins in Italy, in Rome, where the children sing. <laughs> Bella Roma, they sing. And Rome is beautiful, even to orphans. But these orphans are like no kids you've ever seen before. An American girl who helps care for them describes some of them. Well, Vittorio's sitting over here on the bench, cocking his head this way. 
He can't see anything, but he he knows something's going on. And little Juliana has no legs. She's walking around on wooden stumps watching. And uh, little Christina, she's just gotten out of the hospital. She's here with her crutch and one leg gone almost to the knee. There are 24 of them. Among them, they do not have the usual number of eyes, legs, arms, or parents. The American girl has one special child with his own special problem. Italo Grande has both arms gone to the elbow, and he's totally blind with black marks on his face. Italo will never learn Braille, as all the children here are being taught to, but one day we came across him trying to learn with his nose pressed to the Braille. You see him go over into a corner and try to read Braille with the tip of his nose. Will he ever learn? Could you? Where the children have mothers, the children's fund gives them one hot meal a day, spaghetti, bread, milk. At a feeding center in a huge hall near the Coliseum, you talk to a mother. You ask her what she needs most. What do we need? Uh, Food for the babies, milk, uh, milk uh, and uh, chocolate uh, and dress. Uh, We need very much dresses for the baby. We have not enough. Suddenly she stops. I'm very much embarrassed. Excuse me. She is embarrassed because she has had to beg. But the Children's Fund doctor who has brought you here is not ashamed to beg for help. Remember, he says, that it is not the children's fault that they are hungry. You go on to another country. You fly south across the Aegean to Greece. And in Athens, in the very shadow of the Acropolis, you talk to a woman who sings no lullaby. When you have heard her story... You understand why. Her name? Calliope Petropoulos. Calliope, the name of one of the muses. How does this modern Calliope live? I work three or four days a week. And what does she earn? I take 6,000 drachs a day. 6,000 drachs a day. And in Athens, a loaf of bread costs 5,000. You have come to talk about her child, so you ask where it is. He had died today, 15 days. It died 15 days ago. You ask, why? It had nothing to eat, so it died. It had nothing to eat, so it died. It's as simple as that. And what would Calliope ask an American mother? I would ask her, with what are you feeding your child that it looks so fat, so nice? She asks, not with envy, only wonder. And now, on the journey north to Czechoslovakia, you remember a fragment of verse you learned as a child. Between the dark and the daylight, when the night is beginning to lower, comes a pause in the day's occupation that is known as the children's hour. In Czechoslovakia, the children sing, too. Even in a Bratislava hospital ward, you ask the doctor, What is this little girl's name? Gertruda Stefkova. Gertruda Stefkova. You ask the doctor, how old is she? She will be nine years. Uh, what's wrong with this little girl? Does she know what she has? This just yes. This is too much for her. She doesn't know what she has. Does she know she's sick? This just for her. Hello. She knows she, she's sick. As a physician, can you describe her? And you look at her in her crib here. It's a girl. She's thin and pale. She has blue, hollowed eyes. Thin, pale, long fingers. Her face is a little... She has roses on the face. These roses on the face that you've just described are... This, this is a sign, this, this is a feverish sign of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Will Gertrude ever get better? Well, maybe she can be cured. But when, we, when she will return to the home, and she will have the same nourishment she had up to now, then I don't, don't see a good future for the child. In other words, you work as hard as you can to cure her? Knowing that when she goes home, the same thing will start all over again. That is probable. That is probable. Everywhere the children sing. This time, in a smoky steel town in the north of Czechoslovakia called Kladno, nearest neighbor to a village whose name comes up at once. The name of the village, Lidice. You remember Lidice. You talk with a young English girl married to a Czech. When the notorious Heydrich was assassinated, the Nazis claimed her husband had done it. Yes, they claimed that my husband was seen in Lidice soon after the assassination. And so 
his mother and father and everyone were taken away, and the majority of them were shot. That was Lydigy. By chance now, you have found a mother of Lydigy. And when you're talking to a woman of Lydigy, the words mother and widow are synonymous. In her kitchen, Mrs. Horakova tells you about her neighbor's little boy, Vaslav. He was used by the Germans as a guinea pig for experimenting their various new injections and so forth. Just kept as, as we would a guinea pig, then he was kept in the hospital, especially for experimenting. Did Vaslav know what was happening to him? The child was used to it. He was used to it all his life. He didn't expect anything else from life. He was used to it. Now, I want to ask his mother what may appear to her to be a foolish question. Was she glad to see him after five years in a concentration camp? I was very glad because he looked like my husband very much. He looked like my husband, but he only he was very thin. He is still very thin. And so you ask, does he get enough to eat? You know, there's not much to eat because the rations are just not too big, you know. The rations are not so bad, but of course he eats like a lion, and I have not enough to give him. And now the old question again. In Italy, in Greece, now Czechoslovakia. What do they want? What do their children need? It could be fruit. A chocolate. And my little Venusek would like best some chocolate. There's no chocolate to be had here, and that's what he's missing most. It's a thing, it's a luxury. They haven't had it for so long, and so the ideal actually is chocolate. That is the good old times again. But she is a poor mother, and even in the old days she did not have too much. So you turn back to Mrs. Horakova, the English girl. Now, you you would call yourself a reasonably well-to-do family here in Czechoslovakia, wouldn't you? And yet, you told me that your own little boy is undernourished. Why is that? Vitamins are... uh lacking here in his food, and because of that, he's suffering from short-sightedness, which we'll probably have now for the rest of his life. And speaking of vitamins or vitamins... Children here, really, don't know the way to eat an orange if they get it. We've had the first ration this Christmas in 18 months. And so you ask for the daily diet of a Czech child. And surprisingly, she goes off on a tangent... It's difficult to describe, really. You see, the thing we call coffee here isn't coffee at all. It's a mixture of chicory and some such things. Why do you keep talking about coffee? Children are supposed to drink milk, aren't they? Yes, but you see, we need coffee. We have it on our minds all the time. We give them this mixture because the milk isn't here for them. The milk just isn't here. Why? There's been a terrible drought, and so... so... All the cattle are being slaughtered now. Because there's nothing more to feed them with until spring. There is nothing more to feed the cows, so they kill them. And because they're killing the cows, there is no milk for the children. It is a particularly vicious cycle. Now it is another country in another language. You're in a girls' school in a working-class district of Vienna. There are 34 girls in this class. 24 have no fathers. As they sing a song about a hurdy-gurdy, which goes so fast they lose their breath, you pick at random one little girl. What's your name? Yes, Rosie Schmickal. Rosie Schmickal. And how old are you? I speak two. Eight years old. What did you have for supper last night? And how much milk did you have? She shook her head. Why didn't you drink any milk? We don't get any milk, she says. You recall a sign on the schoolhouse wall, left over from the war. It says, Sieg um jeden Preis. Victory at any price. And the price? Yesterday, I saw a little boy outside my hotel. And he was standing there with a spoon in one hand and a mess kit, a plate in the other. And he wanted the people in the hotel to give him food. Would they do that? Yeah, or deny? Yes. Why would you do it? She takes a long time answering. Then, why would she beg? I really have. Because we have nothing. Victory at any price. Another little girl catches your eye. I'd like to ask her, does she like school? Gehst du gerne in die Schule? Yes. 
Great fun. But these children are hungry. So you ask the teacher, how do they behave? They fall asleep all over and over again. They don't sleep, really, but they just uh, sort of uh, sink into their chairs, and they are so exhausted that they are um, listless. And the teacher herself? I, too, am very tired very often. The hungry teacher cannot do the work as he should do it. Meanwhile, the children are getting their noonday cocoa, furnished by the United Nations Children's Fund. As they line up, you ask one brutal question. What would happen if the food stopped? They would starve more than they do today. The darkness deepens as you go to another country. The place it all began, Germany. But the song is not German. Neither are the children singing. There are some of those the Nazis stole and whom the International Refugee Organization of the United Nations has found, fed, and sheltered. Children from everywhere. Here before you, shivering in the unheated room, is a little Estonian girl. What's your name? Where do you come from? Estonia. How old are you? Eleven. What does she like to do? Get it, Papa. I like to write. To write what? You did. Oh, you did. A fairy tales I like to like, uh, write. Fairy tales. Now, um, where is her mother? Kusan Suema. My mother is dead. Perret replies to one more question. The answer may be part of a fairy tale she is dreaming. She wants to go to America. And so you do not have to ask what she wants most of all. So many children. You spot a jaunty little fellow. Hi, what's your name? My name is Nicholas Selmy. Where do you come from, Nick? I come from 94th Squadron. You come from the 94th Squadron? What country is that? Oh, well, you mean where I come from, from home? Yeah. Well, I come from the Ukraine. And how'd you end up with the 94th Squadron? Well, when the war started with the Russians and Germans, my father was getting killed in the wartime. And then after that, my mother was had an accident with the German truck. Germans took me away on the train and took me to Germany. And then I was working on a little uh, German stone factory. They w was making a, uh, some kind of a stones. The phrase is slave labor. After that, when American soldier come, I was going to the 90th Division, like a company mascot in 358 Infantry Regiment. A company mascot, picked up by the GIs, left behind when they went home. By the way, how old are you, Nick? I'm 14. 14? A 14 year old boy ought to have a fair idea of the meaning of things. So. Nick, let me ask you. What do you think about war? Well, war. My father and mother, and yeah, they bomb my home. I ain't got no more home, no fam, no family, nobody. Nick picked up his English from the GIs. How was army life? That's only life I really know. If I wouldn't be with a soldier, I wouldn't have no clothes, no nothing yet. Wouldn't have had anything, huh? Right. What have you got now, Nick? Well. It wasn't a fair question. Come to think of it, maybe the next ones weren't either. Nick, what does tomorrow mean? Tomorrow? That's the next day what's going to come. What's happiness? Happiness? Well, happiness is that you're happy. You got everything what you want, and you got your life. You're happy. 
It means that you got your home and everything. His home and everything. A Glasterhausen, a DP camp for children. The official term for them is unaccompanied children. Children from all over Europe. Romanian, Dutch, Italian, French, Belgian, Yugoslav. Norwegian, Latvian, Estonian, Lithuanian, Russian, Ukrainian. Polish, Czech, Hungarian, Greek, Bulgarian. And nationality unknown. The Nazis must have loved the children. They stole so many of them. Including these two Jewish girls. One has a shawl over her head, freckles on her nose, twinkle in her eyes, and a very frightened smile playing on her lips. And she has a little army jacket on with U.S. brass buttons. Her sister, a little older, has her hair done up in a very complicated and unusual knot on her head. The same very doubting, frightened smile on her face. Now, what's your name? Sarah Feigenbaum. Sarah Feigenbaum. And what's your name? Feigenbaum Dora. Dora Feigenbaum. And how old are you, Sarah? Just ten. Ten. She looks about seven. And how old are you, Dora? Dora. Fourteen. She looks much older. It has been like that all over Europe. The young ones are small for their age, and the older ones are old for theirs. You ask Dora, the elder sister, Are you in good health? I feel that I am quite well, but they say to me that I have something in the lungs. Something in the lungs. And how about the little girl? How's her health? Well. Well, good. You turn to the American director of this international refugee organization settlement and ask, what's the problem with Sarah and Dora? The difficulty is that it was not discovered until these two children were sent to this children's center that the older child had had tuberculosis. Because of that, there is no possibility that she would be accepted for immigration to Canada. And what about the little one? She's okay, isn't she? The little girl would probably pass the physical examination, and there would be no difficulty with her a resettlement in Canada. But it was a serious question of whether one should separate two children who are as close as these and who have no one else in the world. The little one is all the big one has, and the big one is all the little one has. So you ask the little one if she wants to go. She nods yes, but adds... I want for mommy to you. But alone, I don't want. You turn back to the bigger one. Well, Dora... It's a better life your sister is going to. Do you want her to stay with you here? Or do you want her to go away? Yes, sister, it is the chance to I do not want to be separated from my sister. I see. Why? Why not? If she's gone to Canada and I have to stay here, then we are separated forever because they are two different worlds. Dora came to me several days ago and asked that I send the younger sister to Canada. And we decided at that time she would think about it and we would talk about it later. Apparently she's changed her mind. Yes, apparently she has. You turn to another child, a chunky brown-haired boy who has been very quiet all this while. What's your name? He has to... Slavitsky, Meyer. Meyer, Slavitsky. And where are you from, Meyer? From Poland. From Poland. Uh, Meyer, will you tell me your story? We're in Germany, so he speaks German. 1939. The war started, and I was brought to ghetto 1941. Where was that? Kelsey. Kelsey. And then? Then, nach Treblanka. Treblanka, a concentration camp. And then? Auschwitz. Another concentration camp, the worst of them all. And then? Then, 
Berlin, Oranienburg. Oranienburg. Another camp. And then? Belgium, Belgium. Belgium. Still another. And after that? We got three in Ottila, 1945. That was three years ago. He is still in a camp. Where is his family? His mother? His mother had an erschossen in Kelsey. He had built a group out to him. His mother had Translation. They shot my mother in Kelsey. I buried her myself. His father? Le Blanc. Burned. His brother? Son had an imbrude alcohol. He had to hang up his own brother. How did that happen? That he had to hang his own brother? Amara is finding it very difficult to explain. But the story, as we know it, and as he has told me, is that there were 1,503 men left in the ghetto. The Germans had given an order for 1,500 men for a work battalion. There were three left over, and these three men were taken out and gallows were erected to hang them. Among the three men was Meyer's older brother, who was two years older, who was to be hanged. And Meyer went out and asked the Germans if he be hanged instead of his brother. He said that he did not want to live. And he begged the Germans to hang him. The Germans refused to hang Meyer, but they forced him to hang his brother, because he had asked to be hanged himself. What day was that? It was the same day that he had found his mother and had buried her. I see. Meyer, I'm going to give you the microphone and ask you to say Anything you want. Could you mention what is our Bible? Could you mention what is our Bible? For the people, I want to work. As for myself, I want freedom. And anything else? And the way to Canada, as quickly as possible. You have talked to the children of Europe, here at Aglasterhausen, and they have told you their stories. Many, many questions, and many, many answers. How is this little girl singing? What's her name? Linda Brewster Baker. Linda? From the Lithuanian. I'm an Lithuanian girl. Now, how old is she? Fifteen. Fifteen. She's very small for fifteen. She has a nickname, the Baroness. And she is a baroness, too. Her father was an earl. Where is her father now? He's sick. He's dead. And where is her mother? Dead also. And what does she want most in life? A simple question. But the little girl puzzles over it. And while she puzzles, you look at her. Nice long pigtails. Sort of tawny blonde color of dark honey, green blue eyes, typical turned up nose, chubby cheeks, and she's got the way of smiling that girls have. They put their underlip below their teeth and half swallow the smile. And what's the one thing she wants more than anything else in the world? The answer is the one you knew you'd get sooner or later. It's an answer to which there is no answer. What does she want more than anything else in the world? I want to have my father and mother. There is nothing more to ask. There is nothing more you can say. You pack your recording gear and start for home. It's growing dark outside. You turn to say goodbye. And then they begin to sing. And when you hear what they're singing, in words most of them do not even understand, you unpack your gear and make one last recording. Skies are not cloudy and gray. Now you leave and you remember. 
You remember Italo Grande? Trying to learn with his nose pressed to the brain. And Baslav from Lidice, chopped like a guinea pig. And Rosie from Vienna. And Nick, the GI mascot. I ain't got no more home. No fam, no family, nobody. And Sarah and Dora, Perrette and Mayer. Kiblanka, Alsip, and Berlin, or Hannibal, Delvin Dunson. And the little Baroness, who wants... Only me to I want to have my father and mother. This little handful of the children of Europe, you will never forget them, ever, or any of the others, whom you have left behind in the land between the darkness of war and the daylight of real peace, in the land of the shadow of hunger. is Ed Morrow again. You want to do something about all this, of course. When you hear voices that reflect so much hunger, so little hope. When you realize that in parts of Europe and Asia, the odds against the survival of babies are 50 to 1. Of course you want to do something. You ought to. And do it fast. And with the certainty that what you're doing will help. The way to help is through the United Nations Crusade for Children, through a generous donation. The world of tomorrow, remember it's your world as well as theirs, needs healthy, clear-thinking citizens. A gift to the crusade for children is more than an act of simple humanity. It's an investment in the future of mankind itself. Columbia Broadcasting System, in cooperation with the radio division of the United Nations, has brought you Between the Dark and the Daylight, a report on the children of Europe, for American Overseas Aid, United Nations Appeal for Children, and the International Children's Emergency Fund. Your narrator was Edward R. Murrow. Between the Dark and the Daylight was written by Alan Sloan, who also interviewed and recorded, in Europe, the voices of the children you heard on this broadcast. This program was produced by Lee Bland, coordinated for the United Nations Radio Division by Hans von Stuyer, and supervised for CBS by Werner Michel. Bill Rogers speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. 9 p.m. by Ben Russ. B-E-N-R-U-S. That means Kaiser Fraser. That means Walter Winchell. Walter Winchell is brought to you by the men who sell and service the Kaiser Automobile and the Fraser. You, you can win one of the 145 prizes in the great new Kaiser Fraser contest. Every prize winner will receive $1,000 towards the purchase price of a new 1949 Kaiser or Fraser. Listen closely now. Go to your nearest Kaiser Fraser dealer and examine the new Kaiser. First, look at the low, low Kaiser price tag. Then, see how much Kaiser gives you for your money. The big 123-and-a-half-inch wheelbase, the 10 feet 4 inches of seating space, and the great Kaiser Thunderhead engine with its high, high high-compression ratio. Now, ask for your entry blank. On it, you'll find one simple statement for you to complete in 25 words or less. Then, mail your entry as directed. That's all. But act tomorrow. The contest closes in two weeks. But now, Kaiser Fraser, builder of cars that make automobile history, presents the reporter of news that makes world history. So who, what, where, when, why, from the man America listens to most, Walter Winchell. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. North and South America and all the ships at sea. Let's go to press. The North Pole. The seven American airmen who crash-landed 350 miles near the pole last Thursday have been rescued. Little Rock, Arkansas. Six states hit by tornadoes over the weekend counted 28 dead and 200 injured. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The two-week walkout by the coal miners, which ends at midnight tonight, cost them over $55 million in salaries. Baltimore. Airplane manufacturer Glenn L. Martin reported today that his firm suffered a net loss of over $16 million last year. New York City. 
The funeral services for Jack Tapp, 47, president of Decca Records, will be held tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock at 87th Street and Park Avenue. Greenwich, Connecticut. It's a baby girl for the Burt Parks at Greenwich Hospital. He's the MC on Stop the Music. Congratulations. New York City. It's a baby boy for the Judge Irving L. Levy's of the Supreme Court. Doctors Hospital, New York. Mrs. Levy is the former Emily Wilkins, the fashion creator. Baltimore. The Tommy Dorseys just telephoned that they will be three late in 49. Mrs. Tommy Dorsey is the former Janie New off the Broadway stage. South Bend, Indiana. Irene Dunn of Hollywood, a great moving picture star, received a very great honor today from Notre Dame University. The first actress to receive its medal in 67 years. New York City. Hugo Rogers is expected to resign very soon as the leader of Tammany Hall. There are three factions already fighting to appoint his successor. Jacksonville, Florida. Lois DeFee, the tallest of the script T stars, just reported being robbed of all her gems. Philadelphia. The police have ordered an investigation of all private clubs in Philadelphia because Hubert E. Madden, a prominent automobile executive, was kicked to death in a fight last night. Here is real news. Montreal. Dr. Ernest Eyre of McGill University perfected tests by which cancer can be detected in women one year in advance. Behind the international news, Ankara, nine major changes took place in the Soviet top command during the month of February. Vasilevsky, the conqueror of China, whose presence there was first revealed by Walter Winchell, has ordered a general mobilization of the first reserves. General Vasilevsky is now the Mr. Big of the Red Army. Moscow. The Russians have put the big squeeze on Sweden. Norway, a member of the Atlantic Pact, will consider the invasion of Sweden an act of war. London. The rumor is very strong tonight that Prime Minister Attlee is in Washington or will soon be on his way there. Paris. David Bruce, according to the diplomatic colony, may be the next ambassador to France. London. Sir Colville Sanford Barclay, son of Lady Van Sittart and Rosamund Elliot, were married here. Bern. Russia is getting ready for a military move of some kind. Most of the intelligence services believe it will be against Tito or Iran. Just as many others, however, in the High Intelligence Command think this is it. The Washington ticker. The government will shortly break another big spy case. There will be at least three big changes by mid-June in the top side of the Department of Justice. As of tonight, the next ambassador to Ireland may be Frank Matthews of Omaha. Treasury Department insiders think that the tax bill will be the same this year as last. Judge Jerome Frank has refused to testify as a character witness for Al Jahiss. American intelligence reports from Berlin, Germany, say that Ilse Koch will be convicted by the German courts. Mr. and Mrs. United States. Well, spring is finally here. Be sure not to miss it. Spring, ladies and gentlemen, is the time of youth. But you have to be a little older before you appreciate it. No matter how many nations scrap their treaties... The pussy willows always keep their word to come back and march. No matter how many hobnailed boots have marched across their fields, the brave little crocuses courageously show their colors again. The navies of the world may fight for control of the oceans, but their combined strength and force cannot control the laughter of a brook. The fastest jet plane may measure the might of man, but the first robin of spring is measured only by man's sentiment. The spring is more than a season, and only a man of shortening years can measure spring's lengthening days. The green gloves on the branches, the delicate fingers of the trees, are both a promise and a signal from a power greater than any nation. That, no matter how long the winter, the buds will come again. In that great promise are all men's hopes. No matter how many armies may be in the field, the heart of the world every spring is with the babies in the park. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I am authorized by several distinguished Americans to make the following offer to Russia's leaders. This is a deadly serious proposal. These distinguished Americans, really interested in world science, will guarantee to post bond in any city in the world for the free passage to the United States as permanent residents of three great men of science. They are named Dr. Orbelli, the physiologist, Dr. Smallhauser, the great chemist, and Professor Dubinin, the renowned biologist. Where are these three great men of science, Mr. Stalin? They are dead, aren't they? for telling the truth. The silence of these three men are the loudest arguments that debunk your stooges now masquerading as scientists in New York. A reporter's report to the people. Late success. This is the sort of debunking I enjoy doing every now and then because in a very few words, ladies and gentlemen, it exposes, it devastates the phony claims of the Russians as peace lovers. They send over their men of letters and the arts to bring men of goodwill and peace together. That's what they say. But the United Nations has long had a committee called the Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. It was chiefly set up to promote the free flow of information and to create a world alliance on a cultural and educational basis. Now get this. Forty-four nations joined it. Only one refused. Russia. <laughs> New York. The New York district attorney is the talk of our town for his quiet, dignified, unruffled, and efficient manner in which he and his staff have been conducting the wiretapping probe, now before the New York grand jury. The revelations will soon explode from here to California, and certain shysters will wind up in prison. Washington. One of the leading wiretappers in the New York case, by the way, openly boasts that he is not worried about ever being prosecuted. He brags that he has so much on nearly all the lawmakers in Washington that none of them, he says, dare go after him. Well, this is to acquaint him with the very latest news. Sometime this week, Congressman Jack Kennedy of Massachusetts, the son of Joseph P. Kennedy, the former ambassador, will offer a new bill to make any person with unauthorized wiretapping machinery as suspect as one with burglar tools. I don't know how much time this is going to take, but I'm staying on, boys. New York. General Vaughn. General Vaughn. Here is what you can call an important medal. The one just pinned on my chest by Russia. Here is the citation, as reported today by United Press, discussing the reception to Shastakovich. The Literary Gazette of Moscow said as follows. The notorious pen gangster... From the Hirsch Band and the radio liar Walter Winchell long tried to threaten the participants. Winchell hinted that the American Legion and other war veterans should picket the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, and they did. Winchell wrote, and the State Department went into immediate action. Visas were then refused to other cultural leaders. And there you are, General Vaughan. There is what you call a real decoration. The Russian government publicly denouncing Walter Winchell. Ho, ho. I'll be back with some tips of the papers on the mystery tune clue. But here is Cy Harris for Kaiser and Fraser Cars. The Kaiser is a big, big car. 123 and a half inch wheelbase. Remember that when you enter the contest. The Kaiser has more usable seating space than any car. Remember that when you enter the contest. It's the most comfortable car on the road and the easiest to handle. Remember that when you enter the contest. It's unbelievably economical to operate the Kaiser. Remember that when you enter the contest. The Kaiser has the high, high, high compression Thunderhead engine. Remember that when you enter the contest. And at today's low prices... The Kaiser is one of the great automobile values of all time. And remember that when you enter the contest. Enter the $145,000 contest tomorrow. Get an entry blank at your Kaiser Fraser dealers tomorrow. Now, back to Walter Winchell. International news. Get in touch with Park Davis. They have a thrilling story about the girl who discovered chloromycetin, the new drug that may wipe out typhoid fever. Her name, 
is Dr. Mildred Rebstock, 28, a very good-looking blonde, too. New York Mirror. Lila Ernst, the ingenue in the Broadway musicals, was married in Buffalo this week. His name is Vincent Carbone of High Button Shoes, the Broadway hit. To the San Antonio Light, a Texas girl will be married to the son of a very rich London publisher. Her name is Louise Renfro of San Angelo, Texas. She marries Bruce Tuck, the son of Sir Reginald Tuck in London, April 26. L.A. Express, Marion Bell, who is the leading lady in Brigadoon, has filed for divorce in Los Angeles. Her husband is J. Allen Lerner, who was one of the authors of that hit. They were married less than two years ago, I believe. Washington Star, Thomas Armour Jr., the son of the noted golfer, will be married to Joyce Sentner. She's the daughter of the Washington correspondent for the Hearst newspapers. They will be married at the Capitol on June 25. To the survivors of Bataan and Corregidor, the fourth annual reunion wants you at the Hotel President, Atlantic City, New Jersey, April 8th to April 10th. To the New York newspapers, thank you very much for all you are doing to enrich the Damon Runyon Cancer Fund. It will receive the entire gross receipts for the opening performance of the greatest show on earth, the Ringling Brothers Circus at Madison Square Garden next Saturday night, April the 6th. Here is another little clue to the Stop the Music mystery tune, now worth nearly $21,000. It is based on an English legend about a church and a bridge. And that, ladies and gentlemen, winds up another edition of the Kaiser Fraser News until next Sunday night at the very same time. Until then, I remain your New York correspondent, Walter Winchell, who hopes that Axis Sally is now convinced that the sword of justice is mightier than any stab in the back. Good night. Walter Winchell is brought to you each Sunday by Kaiser Fraser dealers who urge you to enter the great Kaiser Fraser $145,000 contest tomorrow. Remember... That means Kaiser Fraser. That means Walter Winchell. Remember to enter the great Kaiser Fraser $145,000 contest tomorrow. Be sure to visit your Kaiser Fraser dealer and get your entry blank from him. This is Cy Harris speaking for Kaiser Fraser. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The People's Platform, as heard at home. Today, a debate on the most pressing question facing the American people. Should the draft be restored now? Editor Walter Millis says yes. Attorney O. John Rogge says no. Dwight Cook is chairman of the People's Platform. His guests, Walter Millis, editorial writer for the New York Herald Tribune, author of many books on international affairs, including The Road to War, and O. John Rogge, former special assistant to the Attorney General and member of the National Committee for Henry Wallace. For the People's Platform debate, should the draft be restored now, we hear first from Dwight Cook. Mr. Millis, do you think that the draft is absolutely necessary right now? Yes, Mr. Cook, I do. I think it is necessary and right now. It seems to me that we have reached a serious and immediate crisis in the uh, post-war period. It is a diplomatic crisis. We have been endeavoring to meet it by the means of diplomacy. I think the results as they stand now show that behind that diplomacy, we have to have something more. We have to have a sense of resolution on our own part. We have to have some force, some power to back up our diplomats. And I think we must get it by filling the ranks of our armed services now. And I think the draft is the only way in which that can be done promptly. But you see the draft then, Mr. Millis, primarily as a weapon of diplomatic warfare, not of military warfare. I certainly do. I think no one can say what the future is going to hold under any circumstances. I cannot say definitely that the men we might draft now would never be used in war. Nobody can say that. But the reason for drafting them now, to my mind, would be to back up our diplomatic arm. I can't help but feel, Mr. Cook and Mr. Millis, that the crisis is not as you describe it. And furthermore, I see the proposed draft as following still more of the blueprint for fascism. You know, my father left Germany because he didn't like the militarism that they have there, had there. Now we are proposing to give the same thing to our sons. I can't help but feel that the big business and military men who are in control of our government and are dictating our foreign policy have, in an insidious way, given us the kind of a reaction that is but a short step from fascism, and I feel that they are prepared to take that step if necessary to protect the 
excessive profits and the special privileges of the few. As the complete bankruptcy of the Truman Doctrine becomes apparent to all the world, what do we have? The big business, military-minded administration is asking for more arms and more men, not to bolster the United Nations, but if you please, to support reaction, feudalism, and fascism everywhere in the world. I, for one, am fed up with it. You don't feel then, Mr. Rogge, that there's any great threat today from Russian communism or world communism. There's no need of, of uh, measures to countervene that. I think the danger in this country is not from communism, but from fascism. We already have incipient fascism, and we're going to get more. We're no longer a free people in this country. I want to see us stay a free people. I can't help wondering, Mr. Rogge, why you speak of fascism so insistently when the uh, most immediate, most important example of a draft army we now have is found in the Soviet totalitarian state. Of course, I don't well, think that the first thing I'd say to that, uh, I mean, if you're right about that, do we have to copy him? We're a free people, Mr. Millis. Why don't we stay that way? We do not have to copy the Russians. I merely asked why you do not uh, suggest that communism is also using the draft. But I have a further question, Mr. Raggi. Uh, I see no evidence whatever to support your statement that the big business interests, the uh, interests of privilege, are primarily behind this move. Oh, Mr. Millis, I have to say but one word in answer to that, and that's Palestine. The real, the real situation in Palestine, and why aren't we honest enough to say it? You talk about big business. I remember looking into the question just about a year ago, and I found there was as much oil in the area surrounding the, uh, the, the Gulf there, the Persian Gulf, as there is in the United States and Russia put together, and American oil companies already had half of it, and I dare say they now have more. And I can't help but feel that the real policy of the administration is to protect the oil interests of the American companies, and for that, the lives of many more human beings are expendable. Yes, Mr. Raggi, but you haven't the slightest evidence that any oil company has put any pressure whatever on Secretary Marshall or on President Truman to recommend the draft. There is no support for that. The oil we are getting from the Far East is not primarily for military purposes. That oil goes to Europe for reviving democracy in Europe. That is the reason it is so necessary now. I can't help but uh, disagree with you there again, Mr. Millis, as I've watched this administration since the death of President Roosevelt. I can't help but feel that we're trying to set up the same kind of a monopoly cartel system that we had after the First World War. We've begun by trying to rebuild a strong and industrial Germany. We have followed all the way down the line of trying to set up the same kind of a path which led us into the Second World War. Well, Mr. Raggi, I think that is taking us rather far away from the draft question. <clears throat> yeah, you said that the answer might be found in one word, Palestine. I couldn't help thinking that uh, one of the uh, few points, as far as I know, in which Mr. Henry Wallace has advocated the use of force is precisely in Palestine. Without an army, we could do nothing there to fulfill the policies which Mr. Wallace has loudly advocated. Well, I think Mr. Wallace wanted to operate through United Nations. And there again, you have a strange thing. Uh, United Nations, we bypass when we please. But when we come to a situation like Palestine, where there is a fair amount of agreement in United Nations with reference to it, we sabotage it. Well, now let's come back from Palestine, gentlemen, to the draft as such. Uh, waving aside for the moment, and I grant you it's the center of this whole discussion, waving aside from the moment the question of how much of a crisis exists, we still come to the question of the specific draft. Uh, on whether or not that will solve any such crisis if it did exist. I believe your position, Mr. Roby, is that a draft won't work anyway, isn't it? That's right. Even assuming that there were this crisis uh, that Mr. Millis is talking about, and I want to be sure that uh, I'm understood to challenge that major premise. I and I also, I also want to make the point that the draft looks to me uh, like another face for universal military training. But having made those points... Having made that point, I think you better wait a minute and let Mr. Miller say whether he thinks that the draft is another phase of universal military training, since that certainly directly concerned you. Well, it seems to me, Mr. Cook, that the draft might very well lead to the adoption of universal military training, but I distinguish the two, because universal training, universal military training, was actually a uh, system devised to uh, <clears throat> take care of our defensive requirements under a relatively peacetime establishment. That system was never put into adoption. We now find ourselves in a crisis, as I have suggested. We now need the draft to, re to uh, do what universal military training might have done, but did not since it was never adopted. Let's take that a step further, Mr. Millis, very specifically. The draft would then do what? Having had this 300,000 or 700,000 more men in an army somewhere from a million to a million 800,000, what do we do with it? 
The, uh, in the first place, the Army, it is now stated that the, the uh, armed services, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, are about 340,000 men short of the peacetime establishment which was adopted immediately on the conclusion of the World War. The first necessity for a draft would be to fill up those ranks, which we always intended to fill by voluntary action anyway. I'm a little, uh, I find it a little difficult to speak because the definite plans of the administration have not been made known. Therefore, it is impossible to criticize them. I would say, though, that the main purpose is to get uh, a certain number of established formations which are in existence and can exert military pressure, not war, but military pressure by their very existence, much as the formations of the Soviet Army now do. What I was going to say when I was uh, making, I suppose, Mr. Miller's too long an introduction and with too many qualifications, even if there were the crisis that Mr. Miller talks about, I would still say that in the atomic age, Thinking of it in terms of a draft is marginal line thinking. I have uh, as authority for that really Hanson Baldwin, who is much more of an expert than I am, and I think although he may have been referring to universal military training, it would also apply to the draft, that it's uh, horse and buggy thinking in an atomic and missile age. Even assuming that the crisis were there, the uh, way to meet it would be with a small mobile force of experts who can handle missile weapons and things like that, but not by me, a large standing army. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi has been making uh, one of the most uh, disastrous mistakes that many people do make now. If we rely on a small force of experts, which means a small force of large airplanes carrying atomic bombs, we can act only through the obliteration of Russians by the 100,000. That is all you can do with an atomic bomb. If, however, we have uh, a, a small mobile force, something corresponding to the Marine Division we used in the Pacific, you can exert diplomatic pressure at the places where it is needed without necessarily involving a war which would demand the slaughter of uh, millions of people before any result could be achieved. Well, and I would say with reference to this diplomatic pressure and armed forces, what else have we been trying to do in Greece and in Turkey and now in Italy? I would ask, are there any Russian forces in Italy and what are we afraid of at the moment? We're afraid of what uh, seem to be elections in which the Russians aren't using any armed forces, and yet I think we do have some men uh, staged in Italy. Are we afraid of the result of an election in which the people express themselves? And how much, I ask, how much benefit has uh, our armed force been in the past year? I think there's a quick answer, Mr. Raggi, to what we are afraid of. We are afraid of the capture of Italy by a minority an organized communist minority comparable to the capture of Czechoslovakia by the same methods. In other words, you're afraid, Mr. Millis, that uh, the Italian communists will take military means of their own inside the country, uh, use force and take over Italy? That's your great fear today? Well, Mr. Cook, I think the Italian communists are trying to act exactly as the Czechoslovak communists acted in Czechoslovakia. It's a combination of direct military force, that is the, uh, what are called the action committees, armed militias. It is a combination of intimidation, of organization, the net result of which is that a comparatively small minority of the country captures the country and thereafter renders it impossible for that country to escape the communist system, no matter how great a majority may later be against it. All right, then, Mr. Millis, that leads to a second question uh, before we turn to Mr. Raggi's side of this. Uh, why will a draft enable the United States to help block Italian communists inside Italy taking over the Italian government? Mr. Cook, I think the most important effect would be that if we adopt a draft, it will be a demonstration that the people of the United States stand ready to back up their principles, even by force if necessary, and even at considerable cost. If, allow me merely to finish the thought, if that demonstration is made on the part of the American people, that I think that a great many people in Italy, Italians, will be emboldened to resist the type of minority capture, minority pressure, to which otherwise they would be forced to yield through fear. Well, I'm not wondering whether it wouldn't have exactly the opposite effect. I think we're going to have to recognize in this country that Europe, with its limited resources, is going to have to have, to some extent, and I can't say to what extent, nationalization of its basic industries, as well as breaking up with the large land of the states. I'd like to ask Mr. Mellis a question. Suppose a majority of the people vote for communism. Are we supposed to fight that with our armed forces? I do not think so, Mr. Raggi. I would point out that no such case has yet occurred since the uh, rise of the Soviet uh, Union. There is no case in which a clear and honest majority has been obtained for communism. So it's a good deal of a hypothetical question. If it took place, I confess, there would be very little uh, that we could do about it. 
The thing that troubles me the most, Mr. Cook, and maybe I'm not following the discussion right down the line, but I have a point that I want to make in this connection. I really feel let's get rid of some of the generals and have more freedom in this country. I want us to stay above all a free people, and this draft is in the direction... It's following still more of the fascist blueprint. I sat at these loyalty hearings, and I've had my clients ask questions. Are you a member of PCA? Have you read the books of Theodore Dreiser, Howard Fast, and Leon Feuchtwanger? Did you go to the Stanley Theater, a public theater here in New York City, and see the picture Stoneflower? Those are the things that I've seen happen, and I know that we're losing our freedom in this country, and nothing is more essential than that, and this draft is going down the road of helping to lose still more of it for us. Mr. Raggi, I think you're again wondering rather far from the point, which is the draft. It is certainly not the uh, action of the, uh, uh, such as you speak of, the <clears throat> examination into thought control, if you like. That's an entirely different subject. I see no evidence that the generals are enforcing their will on the country or that a draft would give the generals any more command over the country than they have had in the past under conditions of universal service. Well, I'd say two things as to that. In the first place, the draft, and to my mind, as I've said before, is but another face for universal military training. I think it'll suck us into that. I accept the, that. The draft, therefore, is part of the pattern which has shown itself on many fronts all the way from the Thomas Committee to too much propaganda by the armed forces for a long, large standing army. It's all going down the direction of depriving us of our freedom. People are afraid today to say what they think, and I don't want to see us become that kind of a people. Well, that is the argument to a kind of pattern. We have a specific question here. Should we adopt the draft? And should we do so for specific reasons, which I have tried to outline, seem to me to be impelling reasons? Mr. Raggi says it is a part of a pattern. And so we can't talk in those terms. We have to ask what actions we are going to take, why we're going to take them. Well, it seems to me, having asked you a couple of fairly sharp questions, Mr. Millis, I should do the same thing with Mr. Raggi here. You, you've brought the discussion to the point where it becomes logical to do so. Mr. Raggi... Uh, in terms of your fears and worries, you then have no fears uh, of trouble or danger or urgent threat to the United States if, let us say, communists should take over even all of Western Europe. I'm pushing that question as far as possible. Yes, you may push it. And uh, I, with a lot of other people, the first time the word communism was used, I was very frightened of it. But the more I've gone along, the more that concerns me today is the loss of our own freedom. Now, I know, for instance, that the Nazis used uh, communist scare to impose fascism or Nazism in Germany. Now, so I'd answer your question by saying this, that if the majority of the people of Italy or France, for instance, wanted communism in those countries, and I sometimes wonder whether we shouldn't define what we mean by communism, I'd have to add this. It's inconceivable to me that the people of those countries, even if they make changes, won't make them consistent with their own culture pattern. So that the results you're going to have in France of uh, nationalization, if they have it to some extent, is going to be different from what it was in Russia. In Russia, you had uh, totalitarianism under the czars. You've got it under the communists. They followed their culture pattern. We're going to follow ours. Ours is freedom. Let's and, keep it. And their culture pattern following it along the lines you see them doing it, Mr. Raggi, would not be a serious threat to the culture pattern and the freedoms of the United States. That's right. I would have to say I'm primarily interested in this country, and I see a greater threat from the reactionaries who are in control of our government who want to see to it that the special few keep too much rather than see to it. I'd say let's arrange our system so that all the people in this country have a minimum of the good things of life, and I don't think you've got any communist threat I would threat uh, here. like to be very glad if Mr. Raggi would make it clear who the reactionaries who are in control of our country are. Most of the reactionaries I can think of, or at least they believe themselves, that they are totally, have totally lost control of the country. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi is talking this year. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi is talking this year. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi is talking this year. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi is talking this year. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi is talking this year. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi is talking this year. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi is talking this year. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi is talking this year. It seems to me that Mr. Raggi is talking this series of fictions. He says that if these changes take place in Europe, they will be in accordance with the European culture patterns. I defy him to say that the change recently took place in Czechoslovakia was in accordance with the democratic Czech culture pattern. Although Czechoslovakia was a country in which nationalization had already been carried to a very large extent. Well, now, Mr. Millis brought up several things, and as he was talking, I started listing some of the people uh, who I think are big business representatives in the present administration. You have Forrest, you have Harriman, you have Snyder, you have Levitt. There were a whole fistful. There are more big business representatives with this administration than any administration I know of, and you also have more generals 
and admirals having key positions. I think there are 170 military men that have key positions with this administration. Mr. Rocky, if I may interrupt, I think you're using a technique which was once uh, justly celebrated in this country as the technique of the Red Network. You can list a dozen businessmen in the government. You can list a dozen generals. You can't prove by that that business runs the country or the generals run the country. All right, I'll go to other reports. And I'll point out to you that big business after taxes this last year made $17 billion, which you can compare with the $12,500,000 in the year before. I, I also call attention to the government's uh, economic report of his economic advisors in uh, January of this year, which brought out that the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. Would you make the connection, Mr. Rogge, between those billions of profits and fascism and no threat from communism? Would you come back to the center? Well, I, I say that uh, our whole structure in this country... And uh, it's just as Lincoln explained it uh, one time with reference to the Dred Scott decision, I think it was. He pointed out how you have all various logs. They all fit together. They make a certain kind of a structure. Therefore, they hang together. So here you have big business and uh, military-minded men who are in control of this administration, and you have big business making more profits than it ever had before. You get rid of OPA, you oppose public housing. I could go into many more circumstances, and when you add it all up, to my mind, uh, you can't help but say you've got the kind of a reaction in this country already that's but a short step from fascism, and they'll push it still farther if we aren't careful. Well, it is the Red Network technique, Mr. Raggy has... You are not applying. You are not talking, Mr. Millicent, the Red Network about any radio network. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. by no means, Mr. <laughs> that was farthest from my mind. It is the old technique of picking out one or two people, then associating them with others. It is the one technique which Mr. Raggy himself re objected to a few minutes ago. It is the technique of saying that uh, because this person is there, therefore he is in control. It proves nothing whatever about the actual state of our society, which remains by far the freest society, the one in which there is the greatest opportunity for the ordinary man, the one in which the wealth of the corporations to which he mentioned has uh, promoted more than in any other society the well-being of the masses of the people in any other society we now know. It seems to me uh, that what you two gentlemen have been saying, your central position so far, can be summed up in two cartoons in this morning's paper. See if I'm right. Mr. Rogge, I saw one cartoon with a great witch labeled ignorant. You would also put on that witch the label big business, drawing a circle called war is inevitable around a dwindling and very pathetic picture of peace. Is that a fair that, enough? That's right. And then, Mr. Millis, another cartoon in the same paper showed a group of congressmen uh, arguing among themselves on top of a cliff which might be labeled freedom in the United States, and underneath that cliff, a great sickle is packing it away so that it's ready to topple over. That's that's the center of your position, is it not? That's very much, Mr. Cook. Well, now, now we get two cartoons of two positions which are about as diametrically opposite as they could. May I uh, recall another cartoon, Mr. Cook? Uh, this appeared in another uh, newspaper some days ago. It uh, represented uh, Congress building the Marshall Plan. The representation was the Marshall Plan was a bridge between the United States and the distressed and starving peoples of Europe. And the bridge was being swung into place when uh, some of the uh, congressmen, representatives, engineers, were making the suggestion that uh, it was too expensive and perhaps we ought to take off a few feet from each end. The result, of course, would be that the bridge wouldn't reach. Well, do you suppose, do you suppose that some of these congressmen might have seen the uh, king and queen of Greece and uh, some of the reactionaries who have been getting our money on the other side? And by the way, I want to come back to something else. You say there were just a few. I could go on and list 20 or 30 big business representatives who hold one high post or another, Mr. Millis, in this administration, and I think some 170 military men. And I'd also like to make another comment when you talk about the pattern. You know, it's a strange thing. We can, uh, you get uh, measures for public housing, for things like soil conservation, for things like Missouri Valley Authority, and that's and some things like that, St. Florence Waterway Project, that I'd like to see some of the money spent. We talk about, and again, I think I have Hanson Baldwin's figure, somewhere between well, 15 and $25 billion a year for this. And you know, when well, you, talk, Rocky, when you uh, talk, I'm going to finish my point, when you talk about a little money for things like public housing, ah, they're opposed to that. But for the military, anything you want, you get it. Mr. Raggi, I was, I was still under the impression we were here to talk about the draft, and it seems to me that the essence of your argument is not relating to the draft, it's an attack upon the whole American system. The pattern, after all, is the pattern of our system by which we live. You are attacking the situation in the United States. You're not talking about the draft. I am merely saying that we have reached a point where, if we are to uh, fulfill our system, if we are to continue the policies uh, which 
on which that system rests, if we are to defend the interests of this country in the world as it now exists and in the crisis that now exists, then the draft is a necessary part of it. Well, Mr. Millis has said that I attack our system. I'd like to explain what I think is our best characteristic. I'd always regarded us, Mr. Cook and Mr. Millis, as a free people. A heterogeneous people. I dare say that there isn't an idea of what in the world but what some American hasn't held it. And it's always been my idea of this country as a free people that that person was entitled to say what came to his mind. Now, it's that it's characteristic of being, of being a free people that we are losing, and in my opinion, the draft is one more thing to push us down the road where we are no longer that kind of a free people. All right, as we express our opinions as free people this morning, gentlemen, let's take the next step here in terms of the draft. Let us suppose for the moment, it's a double question in, in terms of what happens next if what is happening doesn't happen, a bad phrasing of it. Mr. Millis, if Congress will not pass the draft, what do we do then? Mr. Cook, I don't see that we can do much except what we are endeavoring to do now. It seems to me that the draft is a necessary means to implement, if that somewhat unpleasant word can be used, to implement our present policy. Of course, if Congress refuses to pass the draft, our policy will fall short by that much. And Mr. Rogge, if we do not have a draft now, what do we do instead now? Well, I'd like to see us use some of the money that we use for the draft and use it for certain social improvements, for public housing, for a Missouri Valley Authority, for soil conservation, so that we make the most of our human and natural resources in this country. The fact that we don't pass the draft uh, pleases me rather than troubles. So Mr. Rogge, you would then surrender our foreign policy as it now stands. The Truman Doctrine has ended in complete bankruptcy. Yes, I say repeal the Truman Doctrine, and the sooner the better. May I ask it in a little more specific fashion? You would resign Europe, Western Europe, to the Soviet Union, to Soviet imperialism. <clears throat> no, I wouldn't put it that way, but I'll resign the different countries of Europe to the form of social structure which the people in those respective countries want. Let the Italians set up what kind of a system they want, and the French what kind of a system they want. And I say to you that Rocky you are Rocky. not going to get a system there which is too inconsistent with their own existing culture pattern. That is beyond your power to surrender the Italians to the kind of system they want, unless you take those steps necessary to save the Italians from absorption or capture by the Soviet system, which they do not want. Let's rephrase this whole discussion, gentlemen, in terms of, of the people who are listening who are necessarily worried here. I'm sure all over this country there are millions of mothers and fathers who are wondering about their sons in the draft and the possible danger of war. And there are millions of boys between 18 and 25 who wonder whether they should be in the Army now, wonder whether they should be in the draft. What would you say to all these people, Mr. Mills? I would say that uh, the uh, draft is not a very serious burden, that a great many of those boys themselves would not object to going into it and that it is something that we properly should ask of the American people. Mr. Augie, what would you say to the same group? And I'd say to the same group, let's keep ourselves sound and strong. Let's go ahead and send those children on to college for the best training that they seek in whatever profession it may be. And uh, I'd also like to say to labor, let's have a strong labor movement because labor is the backbone of democracy. And let's see that we establish a structure where everybody has a minimum of the good things of life, and there isn't a one among us who doesn't feel free to say whatever comes to his heart. This is a debate on the American democracy. It's not a debate on the steps necessary to fulfill that democracy. Well, I think the best way to fulfill the American democracy, if you please, is to make us strong in the way that I've suggested, to build up a country where everyone has a certain of the minimum a certain minimum of the good things of life. And, and, Mr. and I'd further say this, Mr. Millis, I want to come back that even if there is the crisis which you assume and which I question, that the way to handle that is not by putting our 18-year-olds in the Army, but you have to have a small trained force of technicians in this atomic and missile age, and you aren't going to train 18-year-olds to be that either in six months or in one year or in two years. And, Mr. Raggi, in doing that, you abandon Western Europe to communism with the only possible uh, move you can ever take against it is to destroy Russia with atomic bombs. I that seems to me a savage and a cruel policy. I quite... Well, of course, uh, throwing atom bombs on Russia, there are people in this country who want to do that now. But I question your assumption, Mr. Mellis, that what you're going to have, what we're doing is abandoning Europe. I say that you'll turn Europe over to the peoples of the respective countries without our own military forces. You've questioned each other's assumptions a good deal, gentlemen, but in that process you brought out a good many facts. 
uh, a recent AP poll this morning showed that some uh, 57 senators are undecided what to do about the draft in universal military training. You brought out a good many of the arguments pro and con and what they should do. You have been listening to a debate on the question, should the draft be restored now, as heard at home on People's Platform. Speaking in the affirmative was Walter Millis, editorial writer for the New York Herald Tribune, and deposed was O. John Rocky, former special assistant to the Attorney General. The summary was briefed by the moderator, Dwight Cook, chairman of the People's Platform. The opinions expressed were not necessarily those of the armed forces of the United States. United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Here's a letter from Mr. Nelson H. Watson, Brampton, Ontario, rural route number 5. Does the atom bomb affect the weather? Can the experiments with uranium at Chalk River, Port Hope, etc. have anything to do with the extremes of weather? Well, Gil, what have you to say about the atomic bomb and weather? Not much more, Bill, than I said last summer over the CBC in response to a similar question. Were it not for the risk of leaving a dangerous impression, I would say that the force of the atomic bomb has been overestimated. However, as a scientist, I hasten to add that the horrible effects of our experiments with the atomic bomb to date cannot be overestimated. Whatever I have to say about the relative energy of the bomb or the size of the explosion, I cannot caution people too, too strongly to remember the devastating results of the bomb measured in terms of human lives and destruction. It's difficult for anyone to comprehend the insignificance of an atomic bomb explosion compared with the energy of the Earth's atmosphere. By limiting the comparison to a single storm, such as moves across eastern Canada about every third day during the winter, we can get a better idea of the relative energy involved. It has been reliably calculated that the energy of the atomic bomb is approximately one one hundred thousandth of the energy in a normal province-wide storm. In other words, it would take one hundred thousand atomic bombs to equal the energy of an average storm. To appreciate that figure, this difference is equivalent to the difference between the energy you would expend in lifting a piano and in lifting a feather. Perhaps a comparison of the area of the atomic bomb explosion with the area of a normal storm would give a better idea of why the bomb has had a negligible effect on the world's weather. Think of an average storm as about 1,500 miles in diameter and quite flat, very much like a phonograph record. Now, to show the atomic bomb explosion on the same scale, you would have a speck on the phonograph record too small to be seen without the aid of a magnifying glass. Let me repeat. I'm not minimizing the destruction and death which accompany such man-made explosions as the atomic bomb. I am saying that the magnitude of nature's forces cannot easily be grasped. In short, that the atomic bomb has had no noticeable effect on the world's weather. 
Cross-Section USA with Dwight Cook. CBS and its affiliated stations present another cross-country visit with our neighbors as a group of the USA's largest national organizations join CBS for these weekly reports. And every Saturday at this same time, spokesmen for millions of our neighbors in farming, labor, and business bring us their recommendations for action on the urgent issues which will shape our jobs and our future security. Cross-Section USA with Dwight Cook. Good afternoon. Here in Washington, as I'm sure you know, the cherry trees are in full bloom against today's clear blue and sunny sky. But the men of responsibility here in Washington haven't had much chance this week to enjoy those cherry trees. For both the White House and the executive departments and up on the Hill in Congress, these men are faced with the same difficult question we all are. How much defense does the USA need now? Last week, cross-section discussed this from the point of view of men for defense of universal military training in an emergency draft. Today we'll go around the USA and hear from leading experts and official spokesmen of top national organizations in which millions of our neighbors are joined. We'll ask them to give us their recommendations for action in the whole area of money for defense. In other words, how much money should we spend for what kinds of defense? Many figures have been flying around Washington just as highly colored as the cherry blossoms. But boiled down to official request to Congress, the president and the armed forces say we should spend about $15 billion this year. That includes the regular Army, Navy, and Air budgets, the cost of UMT the first year, and the cost of a draft to raise our forces to about 2 million men. But that $15 billion, and it's almost as much as we plan to spend on the whole Marshall Plan in the next four years, that $15 billion may be only a beginning. There's talk in Washington today of the need of up to $2 billion for military lend-lease to Western Europe. And what about enlarging the air forces from 55 to 70 or more groups? Mr. Forrestal thinks that might cost us another $15 billion. So in this confusion of fears and figures, cross-section asks our guests, what's the score? How much money do we need to spend for what kind of defenses right now? And can we spend such sums without a new inflation which could wreck us all? For the first of our quick and informal answers to that question we'll turn to the recommendations of the USA's largest organization of labor unions, the American Federation of Labor. Since the AFL's headquarters are here in Washington, we'll stay here for their official spokesman, and Bob Lewis of WTOP will ask the question, so go ahead, Bob. Well, thanks very much, Dwight. And to get this discussion moving, I'll ask Mr. Keenan first how he'd vote for the president's budget if he were a member of Congress. Would you I would vote for it. You'd vote for the yes, $15 sir. billion. Dollars. Yes, sir. Or would you vote for more than that? I would if... We would I with reasonable facts that we needed. Well, would you go up to twenty-five billion or fifty billion? I would go to whatever amount was necessary to maintain this kind of government. Now I think that we somewhere along the line we must come to a point. How much is this kind of government that we love so much worth? And I think in the past we went up to almost a hundred billion dollars in order to maintain it. And I certainly would invest $50 billion if it was necessary to maintain it. Well, if you would invest this $50 billion, then what would you spend it? Would you spend it all on air, or would you spend it on atomic bombs, or on jet propulsion, or UMT, or what? Well, uh, no, I would certainly have, have it spent in such a way that it would meet the requirements due to the experiences, the services brought to us as to the kind of weapons our enemies would be developing and using. I think that war is a fluctuating thing. It changes overnight. And in order to meet the requirements, we would have to have developed uh, any emerg- in any emergency, any new, any new type of device that was used against us. In other words, airplanes, dra- uh, jet propulsion, and all that, you would increase. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of atomic energy. The budget this year calls for about a half a billion dollars. Would you double that? Would you triple it? I would certainly would. I think today that the atomic bomb is the only reason that we're in the position that we're in. I think if the tables were turned and that the, and if the Russian had the atomic bomb instead of us, that they today would be demanding certain things that we could not defend ourselves against. And we should pray to the Lord that we had foresight enough to develop it and have it today as a safeguard against any kind of an offensive. 
by the Russians or any other country. Well, Mr. Keenan, what kind of a uh, what kind of a yardstick would you use in weighing these requirements as set forth by the military as opposed to the other people? In other words, how would you arrive at a decision on how much you'd vote for? Well, of course, uh, here in this country, we have spent billions of dollars in our naval academy and in our our, in our uh, in the, at West Point for the purpose of developing people to to set up our military organizations and to set up whatever uh, defenses are necessary. Now, they're the only source that we have today to depend upon. Our admirals and generals. Our admirals yeah. and generals. Now, when, they, when the chiefs of staff come in with a figure up to the present, we, as civilians, can raise a protest. But when they give you all of the information, as a civilian, you're afraid to go only to a certain point. Now, if we're not satisfied with this kind of a procedure, then I feel that we must develop a civilian, non-political organization and train them, the same as you do your admirals and your generals, as a check or a balance against whatever the demands of the military may be. All right. What about uh, such things as prices and, uh, and wages and taxes if we have a budget up to $25 billion? Well, of course, uh, you then must come upon some kind of controls. Controls? I, controls. I think that mm. you must control prices. Wages. And it will be necessary to control wages. But I think you have to put controls all across the board. You would put that as part of the defense program? If we come to a shooting war, yes. You sir. absolutely control it, and you would vote for that along with your, your expenses? Absolutely, so from experience. I find that when we have a, a, the military drawing off all of the civilian supplies, and we uh, uh, come upon a great scarcity, if we don't have some kind of controls, you're just bound to have runaway inflation. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Keenan. That was Joseph D. Keenan, assistant to the executive secretary of the AFL's Political Education League. And, Dwight, that's all of the AFL's position for defense. Thanks, Bob Lewis. And I must say also thank you to Mr. Keenan because for a nice, frank, clear, quick, and informal answer to some very difficult questions, I don't think you could ask for a clearer statement of where an organization stands than Mr. Keenan just gave us. Now, as cross-section continues our survey on what we should spend for what kinds of defense... Mr. Keenan has said, in effect, we should spend the work for whatever is necessary. We'll jump across the country for two West Coast pickups. One in San Francisco, the official spokesman for the Chamber of Commerce, the USA's largest organization of businessmen, and one in Los Angeles with a spokesman for the International Association of Machinists, one of the USA's largest independent labor unions. First to KQW in San Francisco, where Carol Hansen is waiting with his guest. Give us five seconds to throw a lot of switches in control rooms around the country, and we'll continue this cross-section on the West Coast. Well, Dwight, out here in San Francisco, Mr. Dunlap, C. Clark, and myself have been listening attentively to the AFL's Mr. Keenan. And I think our guest, Mr. Clark, is certainly qualified to discuss the question of money for defense. He's not only a director of the United States Chamber of Commerce and chairman of its Committee on National Defense, but he's a banker, the president of the Central Bank in Oakland. Well, Mr. Clark... Uh, how did you agree with Mr. Keenan's ideas? Mr. Hansen, personally, I'm very much pleased at the very sound attitude expressed by Mr. Keenan, and in the main, I go along with him 100%. How about the various amounts of money that he uh, suggested as to atomic energy and that sort of thing? Well, that's uh, rather difficult to come actually down to dollars and cents. It seems uh, somewhat questionable to me how anyone outside of the Department of National Defense and the Congress can attempt to evaluate in dollars and cents how much should be spent now. Uh, there's been too much careless and carping criticism unjustly accusing the armed forces of always asking too much money. And I'm very happy that Mr. Keenan did not take that attitude. It should be realized that money spent now, calmly in peacetime, will buy far more materiel than under the pressure of forced procurement and production during the emergencies of war. Uh, incidentally, Mr. Hansen, during World War II, I served as a colonel on the War Department general staff under the budget officer for the War Department, and therefore I know from experience how carefully the budget estimates of the different branches of the service are screened and boiled down before submission 
to the Congressional Appropriations Committees. I see. Now, Mr. Clark, uh, what is the Chamber of Commerce's attitude on, on national defense spending? Well, the policy declarations of the Chamber of Commerce have always stressed the desirability of maintenance and development of adequate national defense in peacetime. One sentence from a current declaration to be adopted at our annual meeting in Washington later this month epitomizes the attitude very well, I think, and I quote, We hope that adequate appropriations at this time to the several purposes of national security may produce a tremendous saving in the foreseeable future in the outlay of our national treasure and the lives of our people. And don't overlook that. And the lives of our people. Well, now, Mr. Clark, speaking as a banker now, and not as a Chamber of Commerce official, how much do you think should be spent for national defense? Well, as I uh, remarked earlier, uh, I wouldn't attempt to evaluate that, but I would certainly follow along very closely with the recommendations made by these gentlemen who have spent their lives uh, in studying the requirements of national defense, namely those who are now the top men in our Department of National Defense. Well, now, is there any place where this money should be spent other than for military needs? And by that, I mean for research, propaganda, for government subsidies, such as the aircraft industry and that sort of thing? Yes, of course. That uh, is taken uh, account of in our whole national defense program. Aside from the uses of manpower, you have your research and development program, you have your industrial mobilization of industry, and uh, then again, you have uh, your selective service, uh, which has been proposed, and the possibility of universal military training. Well, what's all this going to do to our national economy? Is it going to bring back price controls and rationing in some forms? Presumably it might. It depends, again, on how much is spent and how rapidly that money flows into uh, our uh, whole uh, civilian economy setup. Uh, personally, I hope that it won't come so fast that we have to clamp down controls but if we do, in order to achieve the objective of a strong national defense, then we will have to go along. Well, thank you, Mr. Dunlap C. Clark, so much for coming up here this afternoon. Well, Dwight, that's about it from San Francisco. Let's go down the coast now to Stuart Novins at KNX in Los Angeles. Dwight, I'd like you to meet a man from Los Angeles. He's Mr. Ernest White, who represents the International Association of Machinists. Hello, Dwight. We in Southern California are certainly interested in this program as this is the principal production center for the aircraft industry of this nation. Well, Mr. White, uh, just what is your opinion on the money to be spent for the draft, for universal military training, for that 70-group Air Force, or any of the other elements that were mentioned by Mr. Uh, Keenan and Mr. Clark a few moments ago? Well, I'll certainly subscribe wholeheartedly to the statements of uh, Brother Joe Keenan that we should spend as much money as is necessary to continue the form of government that we have at the present time. And I would certainly stress the need for industrial mobilization, particularly in industries that are right at the heart of our necessary production in the event of an emergency of the type that we are fearful of at this time. Well, do you feel that the major emphasis of any money to be spent should be placed on industrial mobilization rather than on manpower? I certainly do, because our power and ability to produce our industrial capacity in this country is one of our greatest natural assets, and I believe that we should certainly stress that productivity rather than stress the training of vast armies. Well, from your experience, how long would you say it would take to produce an adequate Air Force, uh, so far as the planes themselves were concerned, if we were to start right now? Well, I met at first hand the production problems of our aircraft industry during the last war, and if our orders were placed today, it would be a, about two years before those planes could be produced in quantity if they were a new type of airplanes. Uh, do you feel that there is an advantage to being in a production now rather than starting, uh, say, with new production a couple of years from now or next year if the national defense uh, officers feel that it's necessary then? Well, certainly a 70-group Air Force, and I'm not going to question the adequacy of that size, is going to need not only ships, but it's going to need replacements for the ships that they have. And uh, if they are in production on ships at that time, you can rapidly convert to new ships and ships of different type if you're already in production. You feel it's better to make the conversion if you're in production than to start from scratch at the time of a basic emergency? Uh, certainly, you can do it much more rapidly. Well, now, uh, you've placed the emphasis on industrial production rather than on men. Uh, to get away from aircraft for a moment, how do we shape up in other industrial fields? Well, certainly our steel capacity is a bottleneck. It was a problem during the last war, and it isn't adequate at the present time to meet our civilian needs. And, of course, if, as long as steel is tight, 
Naturally, that's going to reflect on rolling stock for our railroads and other essential transportation facilities. Would you recommend that some of the money to be spent should be spent in priming these basic industries rather than on manpower? It certainly should be, and it should be well planned so that it's not wasted, but there should be an integrated, well-thought-out program of expediting our industrial mobilization. Well, now, uh, when all this money is poured into industry, as you recommend, uh, won't that bring about an additional spurt to an inflationary spiral? Well, I'm going to have to subscribe to the ideas of Brother Joe Keenan. If we reach that problem, we're certainly going to have to have some type of controls to hold it in balance. Uh, how do you feel about bringing men, either through the draft or through UMT, uh, into the service so they can take over these planes and equipment as they're being produced? Well, of course, the average American young man is basically a pretty good mechanic. And our experience during the last war in training ground crews and bringing them into the factories so that they could observe at first hand the fabrication of the products with additional classroom training, supplemented by trained technical people from the factory themselves who examined the equipment under battle conditions, I believe functioned very effectively and is the normal approach to that problem. Well, now, uh, as a labor representative, doesn't that put you in the position of advocating underscale labor from military sources to compete with your own machinist union members? Not exactly. We don't consider these boys as competition, and we're thinking as citizens from the standpoint of national defense. Well, those are the opinions, Dwight, of Mr. Ernest White of the International Association of Machinists, who will be waiting with me to hear your other guests after five seconds when we'll be back on the East Coast with Dwight Cook. Well, if you wanted some clear and precise answers on what we ought to do about defense now, you couldn't ask for better than you've been getting so far from our guests on cross-section. You've heard an ex-vice chairman of the War Production Board speaking for the AFL, an ex-colonel in the Army Budget Department speaking for the Chamber of Commerce, and an aviation expert for the machinists. Now let's go on to the Middle West and see what the oldest organizations of farmers in the United States, the National Grange, has to say. Their official spokesman is waiting in Indianapolis with Harry Martin of WFBM. So, all right, Harry, take it away. Well, thanks, Dwight. Here in Indianapolis, I've been sitting with Herschel D. Newsom, an Indiana farmer who is also the master of the Indiana Grange, and listening with a great deal of interest to the comments of your earlier guests. Mr. Newsom, would you tell us now, after listening to these comments, just how much money you think we should spend now for defense? Harry, I'd like to agree with them in the one statement that they've made to the effect that we must spend enough to do the job so long as that's possible without completely wrecking our economy. And, of course, if we get to the type war that they're talking about, uh, the latter qualification has to go out the window because we have to spend enough to do the job in that case, regardless of the consequences. You mean there's more than one kind of a war? There certainly is. Uh, my, my main difference of opinion uh, with the predecessors on this program is that I think we're already in the most important phase of this war. We're in this bloodless uh, economic war, propaganda war, which, in my opinion, we must win. A military war would create such disastrous chaos in this country that, as I see it, uh, it's entirely possible uh, that the communistic ideology uh, might thrive despite everything we can do. Our stakes are so high that it therefore follows that we, we simply must do the job in this bloodless economic propaganda uh, war, uh, of which we're already a very definite part. Would you be willing then to overlook the universal military training and armament angle? I am still opposed to universal military training. I am not opposed to selective service as I understand it. I, I see no fault to find with the program that Secretary Forrestal has outlined, uh, except uh, for that particular uh, reference that he made to universal military training. Well, now, why our, pardon me. Our first line of defense, Harry, is this uh, economic system, this structure that we have here in our own country. We must continue to put all the emphasis on, on this job of First of all, creating an example to the rest of the world. And secondly, stepping up our own productive machinery to the very maximum so that we can give every possible necessary assistance to those countries and the rest of the world that have demonstrated a will to win. Are you willing to spend money for armaments now? I certainly am. I think we must spend 
uh, money for armaments in reasonable amount. I'm just saying that I want the emphasis on this Economic Cooperation Administration program, uh, about which I'm even more enthusiastic than ever because of the able leader that's been chosen in the person of Paul Hoffman. You think he's the man to do the job? I do. I sincerely hope that he'll be given the privilege of doing it without interference from the State Department or any place else, because I have confidence in him. I believe America does. Well, now, getting back to how much <clears throat> money we should spend, Mr. Newsom, do you think that we should spend as much on armaments now as Forrestal recommends? Yes. I'm inclined to think that that's a sound expenditure. I still believe that our economy can support this economic warfare that I'm talking about, though, in addition uh, uh, to... Uh, the military expenditures as they've been outlined. I want to, to hasten to say that um, this military program, the Secretary of Forrestal outlined, in, in my opinion, is absolutely necessary for the most part if we're going to demonstrate our determination to support not only the economic warfare program that I'm talking about, but to support the United Nations in the final analysis no. and support this Western Union in Europe. But all the way through, you're thinking of two phases of warfare, the economic warfare and the preparedness with, in a military way. Yes. Don't let us ever forget for a moment that the world's greatest potential in a uh, war productive machine is to be found in Western Europe and chiefly in Western Germany outside of the United States. I mean, we're first and that area is second. So we have <clears throat> to keep spending our money in two ways, for defense in the military way and in this economic cooperation program. Is that right? That's right. And, uh, and let me emphasize this one fact. This social revolution that's been taking place in the world for all this period of time, perhaps a hundred years, is very definitely the type thing that we can't stop. We probably shouldn't stop it if we wanted to. We must direct it to uh, the greatest production that's possible. And in my opinion, that means our kind of an economy. All right there, Dwight, you have the opinions of Herschel D. Newsom, master of the Indiana Grange. And now we're returning you from Indianapolis to Dwight Cook in Washington. You know, farmers are supposed to be traditionally isolationists, and especially isolationists out in the Middle West, of which Indianapolis is a part. You can judge for yourself in terms of what the master of the Indiana Grange had to say, whether you think American farmers are isolationists in any sense today. Now, as we do a little more pulling together this cross-section of the USA on money for defense... We'll hear next from a great nonpartisan organization of our neighbors, which includes labor business and farming representatives, the National Planning Association. We'll go south to hear from their spokesman and their research director down to Durham, North Carolina, where Frank Jarman of WDNC has his questions already, so okay, Frank. Dwight, I'm happy to be questioning Dr. Calvin B. Coover on this very timely and important subject. Dr. Hoover is director of research of Natural Planning Association for the South, He's head of the Economic Department of Duke University here in Durham and a member of the Harriman Committee on European Aid. You know, it seems to me that uh, most of our speakers this afternoon have agreed on most of the points brought to light. So let's find out how Dr. Hoover feels about the matter. I am amazed and deeply glad that I am in agreement with all the speakers who have spoken up till now. I think we feel basically the same about money for defense. In particular, our last speaker, he referred to the Economic uh, Cooperation Agency under Paul Hoffman, for which I'm now working. And I couldn't overemphasize uh, his remarks. And uh, the, I would like to say also that, just as he did, that far from being any conflict between national defense and European aid, the two are absolutely complementary. Now, on what scale does money for defense need to be provided, Dr. Hoover? I mean, uh, is it a question of just another billion or two in total budget of some 40 million, or are the amounts required large enough to change the whole financial and the whole economic picture? The funds needed are very large, enough to uh, affect our economic and financial system very profoundly. I think the best answer is to ask another question. Suppose in 1939 or 1940 or early 1941, we had known that Pearl Harbor was going to happen. What would have been the scale of our preparation then? How much money for defense would we have provided? Well, our problem now is to provide the kind of national defense that will prevent a Pearl Harbor or a baton from happening. Uh, what defense need do you think that they are for which funds have not yet been asked for by President Truman? 
Well, as you know, funds have been asked for uh, universal military uh, training and for selective service and for bringing our uh, forces up to their authorized strength. But there are a number of things that have not been covered. One of them, of course, is raising our uh, air power from uh, 55 groups to 70. I think that needs to be done very badly, and it needs to be done as fast as it possibly can. In the beginning, uh, it would require, no doubt, at least uh, $2.5 billion for that item alone. Uh, Probably that sum would be required even in the first year. There's a whole series of other things. Uh, a radar warning system uh, for the North American continent. Uh, In addition to that, uh, arms for Western Europe, the countries which uh, are going to stand with us in resisting uh, Soviet aggression. That's not a complete list, and perhaps later we can refer to still others. Well, does this mean, uh, Dr. Hoover, that money for defense on the scale which would wipe out the recent tax reduction? I think it does mean that. Uh, Indeed, I think uh, we should be increasing taxes rather than reducing them. Of course, the reduction of taxes is now under the bridge. It's something that's happened. But I think it's quite likely that in the future we will have to raise them again and in the not very distant future. And do you think that the crisis is as serious as President Truman stated? And do you think that money for defense is needed in the amounts as great or greater than those asked for by President Truman in his recent special message to Congress? I'm sure the crisis is as grave, and I would even say graver, than President Truman, Secretary Marshall, and Defense Secretary Forrestal have stated. And I think the needs are substantially greater than have yet been called to the attention of Congress. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hoover. I wish we could go on. You said you had a few more things that you'd like to tell us about, but uh, our time's just about up. And that, Dwight, is the way that the National Planning Association views the question of money for defense. Well, I suppose if you started to sum this up, the first thing you'd sum it up with is a phrase, at least I would, that I used a few minutes ago, and that is, what should we spend for national defense? The works. And when you think of what's been going on in this one radio program this afternoon, I just think it might send a few chills down the backs of people who think the American people are sort of a vague, spineless group who don't know the score anywhere in the world. Because remember, everyone who was on today's cross-section spoke for a great national organization of our neighbors. No one of them had any idea what anyone else on the program was going to say. And each one of our guests spoke purely extemporaneously and informally to the frank and open and very direct questions which our interviewers around the country asked them. The net result, as we all heard as it came by our ears, is a very unanimous stand in terms of all the organizations concerned in this program on a whole group of vitally important American problems. They all agree that the situation is extremely serious. They all agree that we must have enough spent to do the job, whatever it costs. And they all admit that at this present time, the military has got to decide how much that will be. They all stress that spending now will mean saving later. They all agree that we need a larger air force. And they all say that we must have whatever controls are necessary, industrial, labor, or what have you. And just to bring it right back in our own laps, Mr. Hoover, who's a financial expert, among other things, reminded us just before we came back to Washington that we also are probably going to need to have higher taxes and it's going to cost us all more to do what they all agree we must do, come what may. Next week, we're going to turn to a purely domestic issue and take up the question of the Taft-Hartley Act and strikes. We'll have representatives of labor and business at that time to discuss this act and tell us why they think it's good or bad and contributing towards strikes or keeping from it. I hope you'll want to be back with us next week at the same time for that cross-section. Listen in again at the same time next Saturday when Dwight Cook takes you on another cross-section of the USA, this time on what official spokesmen of the country's largest national organizations in business and labor have to say about the Taft-Hartley Act and strikes. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Maxwell House, the coffee that's always good to the last drop, brings you Wendy Warren and the news. Hello, folks. This is Wendy Warren with news reports from the women's world. But first, here's Douglas Edwards with the latest headline. The Palestine story leads again today. The fight for the Arab city of Jaffa has begun again with the Irgun attacking against the advice of Haganah, the Jewish militia. 
There's no report on casualties, and other information is sketchy. British officials announced that all air services have been suspended at Lydda Airport in line with evacuation plans. And a report comes from London that Britain will not consider helping police Palestine until Jews and Arabs agree to stop fighting. But a dispatch from Cairo says King Abdullah of Transjordan is preparing to march into Palestine at the head of the Arab Legion. At Lake Success, the U.N. General Assembly is considering the French plan to safeguard Jerusalem by making it an open city. On the other side of the world, there was new rioting today in the Japanese port city of Kobe, and occupation officials blame it on the communists. Balloting for a vice president of China stopped over the weekend because of a lack of candidates is expected to be resumed tomorrow at the National Assembly in Nanking. A big political week is beginning in the USA today. Primary elections in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania tomorrow and Republican conventions in eight other states in the next six days to choose 186 delegates to the GOP convention in Philadelphia. Harold Stassen visits Oregon today to strengthen his campaign for the May 21st primary there against Governor Dewey. In Washington, the House squares off for a tough fight over a proposal to repeal federal taxes on oleomargarine. Representative Rivers of South Carolina is leading the fight for the bill to repeal the 10 cents a pound tax on colored oleomargarine and the quarter cent tax on the white variety. Speaker Martin says there's not much doubt that the bill has sufficient backing to pass the House, but an uncertain future awaits it in the Senate. Dairy state congressmen make it very clear they'll battle repeal every inch of the way. The Senate is expected to confirm with little or no opposition the nomination of Averill Harriman to be the roving overseer of the European Recovery Program, and the Senate Appropriations Committee has begun hearings on House-approved legislation to provide the immediate expansion of the Air Force. Now here's Wendy with some pleasant news from London. Yes, Doug, Queen Elizabeth of Britain was a picture of loveliness today as she accompanied King George through cheering throngs to St. Paul's Cathedral, where they offered thankful prayers for their 25 years of married happiness. She wore a soft blue dress and hat set off by the darker blue of the Order of the Garter, and she acknowledged the ovation with a white-gloved hand. Meanwhile, American women are observing the first national YWCA week under the direction of Miss Lillis Barnes, first American president of the world YWCA, and Mrs. Arthur Forrest Anderson, president of the national board. The walking baby of Lewiston, Maine, Robert Cartland, Jr., who took his first stroll when only five days old, is now five weeks old. Examining doctors are amazed at the advanced coordination of the infant, who they say is otherwise normal in every respect. And now here's Bill Flood with a word for you. Good living is something we all aspire to, isn't it? That's why Maxwell House coffee is such a universal favorite. Yes, it's because that good to the last drop flavor adds so much real enjoyment to good living that Maxwell House is America's favorite of all brands of coffee at any price. Expert blending explains that good to the last drop flavor. You see, Maxwell House combines not one, but many premium Latin American coffees, radiant roasted to the peak of perfection. Yes, friends, when you buy Maxwell House, you get the very best in coffee drinking pleasure. And yet you pay but a fraction of a penny more per cup than for the lowest priced coffees sold. Maxwell House gives you so much more for so little more. Extra flavor, extra value. That's why we say insist on Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. Broadcast over. And I have a visitor, Bill, so see you tomorrow. Hi, Wendy. Hello, Mark. Hello, Wendy. What brings you to town? Oh, I came to see my publishers. They've been hounding me for a synopsis of the novel, so I brought it in. And? They seem to like it fine. If I can finish it by late July, it'll go on the fall list. Wonderful. You'll be back in the swim again. Mm Mm-hmm. Say, I'm sorry about my behavior at your folks the other evening. Must have looked a little headstrong the way I ran out. I was surprised that none of you had heard the news about Adele until I told you. Lang's kept it under the hat for obvious reasons. Did you see him that evening? No, there's no one at home. But I went back the next night. I saw him. He's really pulled a fast one this time. He's got Adele right where he wants her, and he thinks he's going to get away with it. Mark, you don't mean... Oh, no, I, I can't believe anyone could be capable of railroading someone into an asylum. Not even Charles Lang, after what you know about him? But she, she's self-committed, Mark. He can't be lying about that. Not if she signed the commitment in front of witnesses. How do we know what really happened? I... Well, what a ghastly idea. Mark, 
you could be wrong. I don't think so. The last time I talked to Adele, she was as sane as you and I. Well, I felt that, too. When she told me about taking a cruise and, and her plans for studying music again, it was such a shock when Gil told me where she really was. Gil told you? Oh, yes. Charles Lang had phoned him for business advice or something. Why? I... Nothing. If I could only find out where Adele is. I'd like to know, too. I asked Gil, but he hasn't any idea. If I can get to Adele and talk to her, even for just five minutes, I'll find out the truth. If he's locked her up just to keep her from talking, I'll, I'll get her out of it. It's the last thing I ever do. I'm so glad there's someone to help Adele. You're very fond of her. At first, I was just sorry for her. And now? She's taken a kicking around. She's got spunk, but she's all mixed up. I'm not in love with her. I might have been, but I'm not. I guess you know why. Do I? If you don't know, you should. The Douglas Hart won't take over crowding. Only room for one. Well, I guess I've spread my quota of gloom for the day. Might as well tip my hat and beat it. Mark, I might be able to help. How do you mean? About Adele, finding out where she is. Oh, well, if you could, Wendy. Not the least bit sure, but I can try. I have an idea. There'd be no harm in trying, even if it shouldn't work. I'll see what I can do, Mark, and let you know. <laughs> At five, Gil Kendall leaves his office and goes directly to Nona Marsh's apartment. Waiting for her in the living room, he paces restlessly, then absently turns the radio on, lights a cigarette, and stubs it out a moment later. He's frowning, out of sorts. Hello, Gil. <laughs> Hello, Nona. You weren't expecting me. I... Well, I was, and I wasn't. I hoped you wouldn't come. <laughs> You certainly make a fellow feel welcome. We made a definite date over the phone on Friday. It was a moment of weakness, darling. We agreed that we wouldn't see each other alone anymore. I didn't agree. Would you like to fix a drink? You'll find everything on the tray. All right. Have a good weekend? Not particularly. What's the matter? Oh, lots of things. Such as? Wendy's made a crazy proposal for the summer. She wants us to live in the Long Island house. Commute. Just the two of us. No servants. <laughs> Wendy's so impractical. She doesn't think so. She keeps harking back to the two weeks we were there. Wendy wants a perpetual honeymoon. What woman wouldn't? It was fine. We enjoyed living there, playing house. Two weeks isn't a summer. She wants you to be alone together. Do you mind if I turn off the radio? No, not at all. I didn't even realize it was on. Here you are. Thanks. Cheers. Uh -huh. I guess you owe it to her, actually. I don't see that. She's done a bang-up job of being Mrs. Gilbert Kendall in the public eye. Why not? Wendy's my wife. <laughs> Maybe you should have married me, Pet. We seem to like the same kind of life. Apparently, Wendy tires of it. Are you going to do what she wants? No. There are too many things against it. How could we entertain out there? Charles Lang, for instance. It'd be unpleasant. Wendy has a mind of her own, hasn't she? Not that that's anything against her. I wouldn't be able to see you so often. I thought we'd decided... Forget that. You're a pretty stubborn fellow, Mr. K. I'm used to having my own way. So am I, though. And it hurts not to have it. But sometimes it's wiser. Why are you so worried about Wendy? Aren't you? Only about one thing. If she should find out about my deal with Charles, 
That definitely wouldn't be good. I agree. But this wouldn't be good either if she found out about us seeing each other this way. That's why I think it ought to stop, Gil. Not because I want to, but for your own peace of mind. I'll take a chance on that, Nona. May I put my foot in it? Why not? Isn't marriage all it's cracked up to be? Are men sometimes a little disillusioned, too? Don't be silly. I married Wendy because I'm in love with her. Does that answer your question? I withdraw my extensively shod foot. Seriously, knowing Wendy as well as I do, I think you're going to have difficulties when you say thumbs down on her plans for the summer. They'll be settled in good time. But of course, you can always come and cry on Nona's fair white shoulder. That's what it's for, you know. So you see things my way now. Brilliant men are sometimes so stupid where women are concerned. I've always seen things your way, darling. I always will. Remember this old timer? Yes, it's Sweet Adeline, most famous of all the barber shop ballads. Recalling memories of red and white barber poles, cigar store Indians, and the gaslit street lamps of the early American scene. The American scene of which Maxwell House coffee has long been a part. For we Americans love coffee, and more of us buy and enjoy Maxwell House than any other brand of coffee at any price. The reason for this tremendous preference is flavor. Famous Maxwell House flavor. And naturally, that good-to-the-last drop flavor doesn't just happen. From the careful selection of choice Latin American coffees, through the skillful blending and uniform radiant roast process, everything possible is done to bring you coffee at its very peak of flavor perfection. And all that wonderful flavor comes to you roaster fresh. For Maxwell House is ultra-vacuum-packed. Yet with all these flavor dividends, Maxwell House costs but a fraction of a penny more per cup than the lowest-priced coffee sold. Today, enjoy Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. Mark has enlisted Wendy's assistance, and in so doing, has unwittingly drawn her into the drama surrounding Adele. Be sure to listen at this same time tomorrow for Wendy Warren and the News. Brought to you by Maxwell House, the coffee that's bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand. Maxwell House, the coffee that's always good to the last drop. Coconut, baker's coconut, coconut for sale. Delicious baker's coconut. It's the Coconut Man bringing wonderful news. Now you'll find more Baker's Coconut in the stores. So let's celebrate with a big fluffy coconut cake covered with a snowy white blanket of tender, delicious Baker's Coconut. Remember, it's better if it's made with coconut, and it's better coconut if it's Baker's. Get Baker's Coconut. Be sure to listen again tomorrow for Wendy Warren and the News. This is CBS. The Columbia Broadcasting System. And they're off and the getaway to a good start with a little bumping. Grand Pierre bumped into Billings. He bumped into my request, but my request recovered quickly on the outside. Cold Town over there on the inside is trying to outrun Citation. Grand Pierre is trying to outrun them both. But as they come to us, it's going to be Cold Town showing the way. Cold Town, with Jockey Pearson sitting still on him, is a length and a half in the lead. Grand Pierre from California is second by three lengths. Citation is back in third place. Billings is now third. Escadrue is trying to get third and he got through on the inside to get into third place. And my request is the last horse as they go around that turn. And it is Coal Town breezing along in front. By four lengths, he's as fast as they said he was. The citation is now moving up the challenge. Grand Pier Escadru is in fourth place. And my request going up fast on the outside is now in fourth place himself. 
And so into the back stretch, it is Pole Town showing the way by five lengths. Ruin may get four lengths, with citation second by two and a half. And my request is driving hard to get third place. Billings is sticking to him. The last horse in the race is at Cadru. And now Grand Pier has dropped back out of the race and is beaten. Going around the far turn in Cold Town shows no sign of weakening so far. He's but no, he's only in the three and a half in front now. By three and a half, and Citation is coming up to him. Citation is second, four lengths in front of my request, who is battling with Billings for third place. It's a two horse race at the stage, ladies and gentlemen. It is Cold Town and Citation. Cold Town is still there by two and a half, and Citation has gone to work to catch him. And he is catching him. He's got him. At the head of the stretch, Citation is up to him. And they're turning for home. Cold Town and Citation head and head. And it looks like Eddie R. Carroll has got his derby. They're coming in there just like they were the enemy, riding each other close. And it is Citation coming to the front. He's everything they said he was. He's going to win with his ears pricking. It is Citation by two, pulling away. And the other horse, Cold Town, is hanging on gamely. But that's all he can do is hang on gamely to be second. Citation wins this derby just as he pleases. His ears pricking. R. Carroll smiling to himself. And Citation is home the winner by three and a half lengths with Cold Town second, three and a half in front of my request, who is two and a half in front of Billings, and it was very close for last place, and I think Grand Pierre was fifth with Escadrew sixth. Ah, oh, there's your Kentucky Derby. The Carnation Contented Hour, sponsored by the Carnation Company, usually heard at this time, and the Fred Waring Program, sponsored by General Electric, usually heard 30 minutes from now, will not be heard at this time in order that NBC may bring you a debate between ex-Governor Harold E. Stassen of Minnesota and Governor Thomas E. Dewey of New York. The program will be moderated by Mr. Donald R. Van Boskirk, chairman of the Multnomah County Republican Central Committee. Mr. Van Boskirk. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For the past few weeks, Oregonians have been participating in a red-hot political campaign between Governor Thomas E. Dewey of New York and former Governor Harold E. Sasson of Minnesota. As the campaign has progressed, it appears that the primary issue on which these candidates are diametrically opposed is, should the Communist Party in the United States be outlawed? So that these opposing viewpoints might be heard consecutively, the Multnomah County Republican Central Committee is sponsoring this debate. And now, speaking for the affirmative, is the Honorable Harold E. Sasson of Minnesota. Chairman Van Boskirk, Your Excellency Governor Dewey, my fellow citizens. During the recent war, I saw many young Americans killed. I watched ships explode and burn, planes crash in flames. Men, our men, my friends, fall. I met thousands of prisoners of war as they were liberated from indescribable conditions of imprisonment and suffering. I viewed the devastation of cities and of farms. In the midst of these experiences, I thought more deeply than ever before of the way in which men should live, of the preciousness of freedom, of the future of America. I made a quiet resolve to do everything within my power after V.J. Day to keep America free and to prevent a third world war. Four principal objectives appeared to be essential. First, to maintain a sound and humanitarian free American economy, which would include avoiding inflation booms with their out-of-reach prices, preventing depression crashes, crashes with unemployment, wisely developing the superb natural resources of water, forests, and minerals, constantly improving housing and health, establishing a fair balance between capital and labor, assuring to agriculture a fair share of the national income, advancing in civil rights, decreasing discrimination and bigotry, and constantly endeavoring to win happier homes throughout America. And second to keep America and other free countries strong in a military sense, especially in the air. And third, to safeguard against the undermining and overthrow of free governments and to defend the freedom of men. And fourth, 
to establish a strong organization of United Nations for peace and economic progress without a veto and with a real system of justice. With a firm conviction that an open and frank discussion would lead to better answers of the manner in which to make progress toward these objectives, I've talked directly to the people of my views and invited their questions and welcomed any opportunity to meet with others in a joint discussion. This is the background for my Oregon campaign. I've submitted to the people of Oregon my position on the building of the resources and the rapid development of the Columbia Basin and the Willamette Valley, the need for long-range programs in agriculture and forestry, and the importance of that fair balance between management and labor and of progress in housing and health. I presented my view of a strong foreign policy for America with alert and trained military position, the Marshall Plan, leadership toward amending and strengthening the United Nations Charter, the stopping of shipments of machine tools and electrical equipment to Russia, the direct outlawing of the communist organizations in America and in the free countries, and positive action in ideals and moral standards and justice on a worldwide basis. I presented my optimism, my hope that such policies would lead to a future of peace and of progress for ourselves and for others without the tragedy of a third world war. One part of my proposed program for America has been directly challenged. It's been challenged by a man for whom I have great respect, a man who is a fellow Republican and who has joined in campaigns in Wisconsin and Nebraska and now in Oregon. Tonight we meet in a joint radio discussion of that one point. I will give you my position on this one point in detail and give the reasons why I have, I have reached this conclusion. When World War II ended, I felt that the key question as to future peace would arise if bad policies were followed by the Soviet Union of Russia and by the World Communist Party directed from Moscow. I therefore gave special study to their actions, to their methods, to their apparent intentions. I journeyed to many of the European countries and to Russia, questioned leaders of many nations for a first-hand look-and-listen trip. I followed closely the results of the peace conferences of Potsdam and Yalta and the developments in country after country. I have reached the conclusion that the communist organizations in the world are absolutely directed by the rulers of Russia in the Kremlin. I have reached the conclusion that the objectives of these communist organizations in the world are to overthrow free governments, to destroy the liberties of men, and to bring other countries under the domination of the dictators of Russia. I have watched country after country in which these communist organizations have taken every legal advantage but have recognized none of the corresponding obligations and moralities. The most recent and extreme instance was Czechoslovakia. The communists never had the support of a majority of the people of Czechoslovakia, but they were given full legal standing, and communists were appointed to some of the ministries of government. The people of the country were free. They were rebuilding from the war. There was no tyranny. There was no threat to Russia. There was a politeness and a friendliness toward the communists. But the communist organizations directed from Moscow, took all of these legal blessings and at the same time moved underneath the surface, established communist action committees in all the departments of government, in the big labor unions, in key industries, and in the universities and colleges. Then a few weeks ago, the overground and underground moved together. Czechoslovakia was betrayed. The liberties of the people were wiped out. And another country was brought under the domination of the Kremlin. These developments do give rise to a danger of war. Analyzing what they mean, it seems clear to me that the free countries, including America, do not now have adequate laws to safeguard themselves in the face of this menace. I consider it to be clear that these communist organizations are not really political parties. They are actually fifth columns. They are quizzling cliques. 
If we are to have the best chance of winning through for freedom without the horror of a third world war, the free countries must take action to protect themselves against this fifth column in this unsettled period which has been called a Cold War. I do not think it is generally realized in America that we do not now have any law to effectively oppose the actions of these communist organizations, either overground or underground. There's now no law in America to prevent these communist organizations from secretly developing organizations of hidden members, from carrying on secret conspiracies to promote strikes, to stir up hatred between races and religions in America, and from following their directions from Moscow. Neither is there any present law to prevent the communist organizations from maintaining large offices with telephone switchboards and a network of communication to be used in reaching and coordinating these underground activities and in recruiting new members. In facing up to the problem, we must maintain complete constitutional rights and liberties in America. The right of free speech, of free press, of freedom of conscience, and freedom of religion must be kept inviolate. It must always be open for any individual in this country to protest, to object, to dissent. But there is no constitutional right to carry on organizations above ground or below ground directed by the rulers of a foreign power for the purpose of overthrowing the government of the United States and taking away the liberties of its people. I therefore have urged for some months that we need a new law to directly outlaw these communist organizations. Governor Dewey has insisted that our present laws are adequate. I submit that a new law is needed. It should directly make it illegal after its passage to carry on any organization, either above ground or below ground, which is directed by the rulers of a foreign power for the purpose of overthrowing the government of the United States, destroying the liberties of its people, and bringing this country under the domination of the rulers of a foreign power. Such a law would not outlaw ideas. It would not outlaw thoughts. It would make illegal, organized conspiracies of fifth columns. Such a law is constitutional under Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution. A very eminent lawyer, the Honorable William L. Ransom, past president of the American Bar Association, agrees on its constitutionality in an able article in the American Law Journal this month. In the language of the Supreme Court of the United States, in the case of Ohio versus Akron, indicates that the Supreme Court would uphold its constitutionality. In fact, the National Congress is right now moving to do this very thing. A law has been introduced known as the Munt Nixon Bill, which provides that it shall be unlawful to attempt in any manner to establish in the United States a totalitarian dictatorship the direction and control of which is to be vested in or exercised by or under the domination or control of any foreign government, foreign organization, or foreign individual, or to attempt to perform any act toward those ends. The report of the committee that had investigated the communist activities before preparing that bill specifically found that the communist organization was an organization whose basic aim, whether open or concealed, is the abolition of our present economic system and democratic form of government and the establishment of a Soviet dictatorship in its place. Now, the chairman and secretary of the Communist Party of America have protested that this bill would outlaw their organization. I agree that it would, and I say that it should. The United States Congress indicated in a preliminary way, their approval of the bill when they voted on last Friday by a vote of 296 to 40 to bring it up for action on Tuesday. It might well be amended to some extent before it is finally passed by both houses because in some causes directed against individuals, it goes even beyond what I have urged. But I do believe that it will pass in the near future in a form that will definitely outlaw these communist organizations in both their underground and overground activities. I further believe that this will be a precedent for similar action by the other free countries of the world, 
and that effective means will be developed to safeguard against the fifth column infiltration of the communists. Now, I recognize full well that there are some who very sincerely oppose my position in this matter. I'm not certain of the reasons for Mr. Henry Wallace's opposition to my position, but I am confident that Governor Dewey's opposition is completely sincere. But I respectfully ask him to reconsider his opposition, as I believe he is mistaken. His position, in effect, means a soft policy toward communism, and all the evidence around the world shows that a soft policy wins neither peace, nor respect, nor improvement from the communists. We must not coddle communism with legality. They grasp every concession made and continue their undermining action. Consider these facts. There are now 11 countries of the world under the domination of the communist leaders in Moscow. They are Russia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. In none of these 11 did the communists ever receive majority support of the people in a free election. The last three were taken over by force during the war and held ever since. In every one of the remaining eight, the communists used the legal recognition of communist organizations as an overground nerve center and recruiting station for their underground movements until they had seized power and brought the nation under the dictation of the Communist Politburo. Russia was the first communist-dominated nation. It came under this dictatorship through a combination of two main reasons. First, the bad government of the Tsar. Second, the organization developed by the legalized Bolshevik Party, which formed throughout Russia and elected six members to the Russian parliament in the last election held in that country before the communists came to power. There seems to have been some mistaken idea that the communists were outlawed in Russia. This is not correct. The Bolshevik party was active in Russia right up to the first war with Germany. The communists carried on a nationwide election campaign in Russia in 1912 and elected six members to the parliament or Duma. They used this means of developing their revolutionary organization. And when they were caught in the attempted revolution in 1905 and in various sabotage and train wrecking and bombings, they were severely punished, but they were not outlawed as an organization. When this present Communist Party did come into power in Russia, they promptly wiped out all other political parties and took the whole peoples under a firm and dictatorial grip. In each of the other countries, Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria... Albania, and finally Czechoslovakia, the communists used the blessing of legality as an aid to organizing an underground movement and finally betrayed the liberties of the people brought them under the domination of the Kremlin in Moscow. These are the facts which today cause a menace to Scandinavia and Western Europe. These are the facts which today present a danger of future world war. Another mistaken impression is the claim that if we outlaw the communist organization, that we thereby endanger the liberties and civil rights of other people. This is not true. In Canada, the party was outlawed for years, and the people lost none of their liberties. In fact, the communists were permitted to operate legally again under the name of the Labor Progressive Party in 1943. And soon afterwards, in less than three years... It was found that the communists were working directly with the Russian embassy at Ottawa in a spy ring. In order that we might narrow down our discussion and find out just exactly what the differences are in our positions, I should like to ask Governor Dewey specifically these questions. One, do you agree that the communist organizations throughout the world are directed from Moscow? Two, do you agree that the objective of the communist organizations throughout the world is to overthrow free governments, destroy liberties, and bring the countries under the domination of the Kremlin? Three, do you agree that communist organizations throughout the world are a menace to future peace? Four, do you agree that because of this menace to world peace, it is necessary that we require American young men to serve in our armed forces and to take military training? To make my position then clear, I say very definitely that it does not add up to me 
to say that loyal, patriotic young Americans must of necessity be drafted, that their liberties must be taken away in order to make America strong in the face of the menace to peace caused by communist organizations, but that none of the privileges and blessings of legality should be taken away from the communist organizations themselves, which in fact are causing the menace that makes the drafting necessary. The fundamental principles of human liberty upon which this nation is founded are drawn from our basic religious concepts. Our founding fathers did believe that man has a spiritual value, that he is endowed by his creator with certain inalienable rights, that he should have a human dignity, a respect for the welfare of others, that there is a brotherhood of man. The constitutional rights in America are based on that concept. When one speaks of the constitutional right of organizations that are seeking to destroy freedom, there's a misconception of the deep basis of constitutional rights. There's no such thing as a constitutional right to destroy all constitutional rights. There's no such thing as a freedom to destroy freedom. The right of man to liberty is inherent in the nature of man. To win it and to maintain it requires courage and sacrifice, and it also requires intelligence and realism and determination in the establishment of the laws and the systems of justice to serve mankind. I submit that the communist organization in America and in the freedom-loving countries of the world should be outlawed. Thank you, Governor Stassen. And now, speaking for the negative, is the Honorable Thomas E. Dewey, Governor of New York. Mr. Von Buskirk, Mr. Stassen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to participate in this discussion with my distinguished confrere and have listened with great interest to his eloquent discussion of the subject and of all of the other matters which he brought up. He answered, he asked me four questions. One, do you agree that the communist organizations in the world today are under the direction of the Kremlin in Moscow? Certainly. Second, do you agree that the world communist organization is a threat to world peace? Certainly. Third, do you agree that the objectives of these communist organizations is to Destroy the liberties of other men. Certainly. Finally, uh, fourthly, uh, do you, if you agree to these things, under what provisions of the Constitution, uh, as I took my quick notes here, and what legal action are you against uh, outlawing them when we are drafting young men in time of peace to build up the defenses against communist aggression? This, uh, the last question, of course, entirely begs the question. The question is not whether anyone is interested in helping any communist preserve his liberties. No one in America has the slightest interest in the communists. My interest is in preserving this country from being destroyed by the development of an underground organization which would grow so colossally in strength were it outlawed that it might easily destroy our country and cause us to draft all of the young men in the nation. Now, I find that the difficulty here tonight is that Mr. Stassen has not adhered to his subject or his statements. He says he is for the Munt Bill because, says Mr. Stassen, it outlaws the Communist Party. But the fact of the matter is, he is in grievous error. The only authority he quotes is the head of the Communist Party, which is not exactly a very good authority for what is true. Usually, if a communist says it does this, you know, it does the opposite. So let's find out whether the Munt Bill does up outlaw the Communist Party. That's the first job. If the Munt Bill did outlaw the Communist Party then we would be able to debate it. Here's what Mr. Munt says. On May 14, 1948, quote, This bill does not outlaw the Communist Party, 
close quote. On February 5, 1948, Congressman Wundt Munt said, I have been one of those who has not looked with favor upon proposals to outlaw the Communist Party or to declare its activities illegal because I fear such action on the part of Congress would only tend to drive further underground the forces which are already largely concealed from public view. What I want to do, said Mr. Munt, is to drive the communist functionaries out of the ground into the open where patriotic Americans of every walk of life can come to learn their identity and understand their objectives. Now, we have uh, the head of the Communist Party saying that it does outlaw them, and Mr. Stassen says so. Mr. Munt, whose bill it is, says his bill does not outlaw the Communist Party. So, as between that debate, let us now see what the committee says. After all, it is a committee bill. And the committee presumably knows what it bill does. In short, I have studied the bill. What it says is that it shall be a crime to endeavor to, to teach, to advocate, or to conspire to establish in the United States a dictatorship under the control of a foreign government. Well, if that isn't a crime now, then I greatly misread all of the sections of the laws as they now are. But, before going to that, that's number one in the Munt bill. That certainly does not outlaw the Communist Party. That simply says it's a crime to try to overthrow the government of the United States and establish a dictatorship under the control of a foreign power. And if that isn't good, sound doctrine, I don't know good, sound doctrine. But it doesn't outlaw the party. It says that communists can't hold public office. Well, theoretically, they're not supposed to be allowed to hold it now. It provides they can't get passports, and, of course, everybody's for that. That's the Munt bill. Now, does that outlaw the Communist Party? Mr. Foster, the head of the Communist Party, and Mr. Stassen say it does. Mr. Munt says it doesn't. So, what does the committee say? Committee reports. This is the report of the Congressional Committee on Un-American Activities, whose bill this is. This committee has been widely criticized in our country because it has been called a red-baiting committee. As a matter of fact, it's been doing a fine, solid good American job for a great many months. It has done a fine job of exposing communists and bringing them out in the open where they belong. Here's what the committee says about the Munt Bill, April 10, 1948. Quote, Too often a cursory study of this problem leads people to believe that the answer is very simple, that all we have to do is outlaw the Communist Party or pass a law requiring its members to register and that the problem will solve itself. This is not the case. The Communist Party and its operations presents a problem which is something new under the sun. It changes its spots, its tactics and strategy without conscience. I'm continuing to quote the report. Several bills before the committee attempt to approach this problem by outlawing the Communist movement as a political party. The subcommittee has found it necessary, and mark you this, to reject this approach. I think it's perfectly clear that the Munt bill does not outlaw the Communist Party, and Mr. Munt and the committee say that it doesn't. But just to complete it, let me give you the rest of the point so there can be no possible misunderstanding that both Mr. Stassen and Mr. Foster, the head of the Communist Party, are wrong. The report of the committee on the Munt bill continues. The committee gave serious consideration to the many well-intentioned proposals which attempted to meet the problem by outlawing the Communist Party. Now I'm skipping a little. Oh, well, I'll read it all. Opponents of this approach differed as to what they desired. Some wanted to bar the Communist Party from the ballot in elections. Others, others would have made membership in the Communist Party illegal per se. The committee believes there are several compelling arguments against the outlawing approach, and then it gives them. One, illegalization of the party might drive the communist movement further underground, whereas exposure of its activities is the primary need. Two, 
Illegalization has not proved effective in Canada and other countries which have tried it. Three, we cannot consistently, and this is of the greatest importance, we cannot consistently criticize the communist governments of Europe for suppressing opposition political parties if we resort to the same totalitarian methods here. Four, if the present Communist Party severs the puppet strings by which it is manipulated from abroad, if it gives up its undercover methods, there is no reason for denying it the privilege of openly advocating its beliefs in the way in which other political parties advocate theirs. It is absolutely clear that the Munt Bill does not outlaw the Communist Party, was not intended to, and that is the exact opposite of what the Munt Bill was intended to accomplish and does accomplish. So, let's get back to the debate. Mr. Stassen said here in Oregon on April 27, I hold that the Communist Party organization should be promptly outlawed in America and in all freedom-loving countries of the world. And he repeated this in... Uh, uh, many states all the way from New Jersey to Oregon. That is the issue, not the Munt Bill. The issue is, shall we pass a law outlawing the Communist Party? Now, I suppose if you say let's outlaw the Communist Party and preserve our liberties, and if you say it fast enough and don't think, it seems to make sense. But, my friends, it makes no sense. You cannot do both. And no nation in all the history of the world ever succeeded in doing it. The question before us is, shall the Communist Party be outlawed? The only way I know that could be done is to declare by law that people calling themselves communists would be denied a place on the ballot, and that anyone who's a member of that party after the passage of the law should be tried, convicted, and sentenced to prison for a crime. I believe in keeping the Communist Party everlastingly out in the open so we can defeat it and all it stands for. Now, this outlawing idea is not new. It's as old as government. For thousands of years, despots have tortured, imprisoned, killed, exiled their opponents, and their governments have always fallen into the dust. This outlawing idea is as old as communism itself. It is the fact... And uh, I might again refer, refer, just to get our history straight, to the report of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. I quote from page 11, no, page 13, of the report dated... Well, I can't find the date. It's, uh, it's the report of the hearings before the Subcommittee on Legislation, the Committee on Un-American Activities... 80th Congress on H.R. 4422 and H.R. 4581. I quote from page 13. The Communist Party was illegal and outlawed in Russia when it took over control of the Soviet Union. Close quote. The fact is that the czars of Russia were the first people in the world to follow this idea of outlawing the Communist Party. They whipped them and they drove them to Siberia. They shot them. They outlawed them. And in the very year 1917, Lenin and Trotsky were exiled. And what was the result? This outlawing gave them such colossal following, such enormous force, such great loyalty on the part of the people that they were able to seize control of all Russia with its 180 million people. And the first nation to outlaw communism became the first communist nation. That's what I do not want to happen to the United States of America. For 25 years, Mussolini outlawed communists. And they grew and flourished underground despite their punishment and their exile and their shooting. As a result, four weeks ago, the communists and their allies polled more than 30% of the vote in the recent Italian election. In all of Nazi Europe, the communists were, egg were underground. And they emerged at the end of the war... So strong that they were popular heroes, the French Maquis and others almost seized power in the governments of Europe at the end of this war because of the enormous strength that came to them from being underground. And Czechoslovakia is another beautiful example, and I'm grateful to Mr. Stassen for bringing it up. For seven years in Czechoslovakia, the communists were underground by the Nazi tyranny. 
And in those seven years, they developed such enormous strength that they were able, shortly after the liberation of Czechoslovakia, which we could have done, but our troops were pulled back and the Russian troops were allowed to go in, into Prague, they were able before long to take over the whole nation because they had flourished in the dark, underground. Here's an issue of the highest moral principle and practical application. People of this country are being asked to outlaw communism. That means this. Shall we in America, in order to defeat a totalitarian system which we detest, voluntarily adopt the method of that system? I want the people of the United States to know exactly where I stand on this proposal because it goes to the very heart of the qualification of any candidate for office and to the inner nature of the kind of a country we want to live in. I am unalterably, wholeheartedly, unswervingly against any scheme to write laws outlawing people because of their religious, political, social, or economic ideas. I'm against it because it's a violation of the Constitution of the United States and of the Bill of Rights, and clearly so. I'm against it because it's immoral and nothing but totalitarianism itself. I'm against it because I know from a great many years' experience as a, in the enforcement of the law that the proposal wouldn't work. And instead, it would rapidly advance the cause of communism in the United States and all over the world. Now let's look at this. There's a war of ideas in the world, and we're in it. It's also a war of nerves. It's a conflict between two wholly different ways of life, the system of human freedom and the brutal system of the police state. On one side of this great world struggle are arranged all of those who believe in the most priceless right in the world, human freedom. We believe that every man and woman has a right to worship as he pleases, to freedom of speech, of assembly, and of the press. We believe that every man and woman has an absolute right to belong to the political party of his choice. We believe, in short, that human beings are individuals and that they do and should differ among themselves. We know that each of us has within himself a portion of error, and we believe each of us has within himself a touch of God. On the other side of this struggle, hating us and all we stand for, are the advocates of the all-powerful totalitarian state. They believe human beings are cogs in a machine, godless creatures, born to slave through life with every thought and every act directed by an overpowering, all-powerful government. Everywhere, these two conflicting schemes of life, the free system and the police state, are struggling for the soul of mankind. The free world looks to us for hope, for leadership, and most of all, for a demonstration of our invincible faith that the free way of life will triumph so long as we keep it free. Now, as in all the days of our past, let us hold the flag of freedom high. As I have watched this proposal, this easy panacea of getting rid of ideas by passing laws, I've been increasingly shocked. To outlaw the Communist Party would be recognized every place on earth as a surrender by the great United States to the methods of totalitarianism. Stripped to its naked essentials, this is nothing but the method of Hitler and Stalin. It is thought control, borrowed from the Japanese war leadership. It's an attempt to beat down ideas with a club. It's the surrender of everything we believe in. There's an American way to do this job, a perfectly simple American way. We have now 27 laws on the books, and I have the whole list of them in front of me, outlawing every conceivable act of subversion against the United States. I spent 11 years of my life as a prosecutor in New York, if that was in the days when they said nobody could clean up the organized underworld. They said we had to use the methods of dictators. We had to go out and string them up. I've had judges and people in high places tell me that. But a group of young men took it on. And week after week, month after month, year after year, they worked. And they delivered the city of New York from the control of organized crime. And they did it by constitutional means and under the Bill of Rights. We can do that in this country. All we need is a government which believes in enforcing the law, 
a government which believes wholeheartedly in human freedom and an administration of our government which will go ahead and do the job. I have no objection to the strengthening of the laws. In fact, I have spent a good many years of my life endeavoring to strengthen the criminal laws of our country, and they should be strengthened. But let us remember, for all time to come in these United States, we should prosecute men for the crimes they commit, but never for the ideas that they have. Now, the times are too grave to try any expedients that have failed. This expedient has failed. This expedient of outlawing has failed in Russia. It failed in all Europe. It failed in Italy. It failed in Canada. And let me point out that in Canada they tried it once, and the Communist Party grew so powerful and so dangerous that they repealed the law in 1936. And in 1940, they tried it again, and the Communist Party came right up with a dozen new false faces, exactly as it would do if you passed this ludicrous law to outlaw them now. They would come up under 40 new fronts. They would then say, we're not communists anymore, exactly as they did in Canada. We are just good Canadians working to support our government. And what happens? What it would happen in Canada exactly what happened would happen here. They became so strong that during the war, in the face of a law which said it is illegal to belong to the Communist Party, they developed the greatest atomic bomb spiring in history, and Canada had to repeal the law. Let us not make such a tragic blunder in the United States that we build up these dangerous, venomous, subversive people with the power to overthrow our government. Let us never make the blunders that have been made throughout the history of the world. Let us go forward as free Americans. Let us have the courage to be free. Thank you, Governor Dewey. We pause now 10 seconds for station identification. And now, to offer the rebuttal for the affirmative is Governor Stassen. Grand Buskirk and Your Excellency Governor Dewey, my fellow citizens, apparently we've narrowed this question down uh, very much. It hinges now primarily on the, the Munt-Nixon bill. The Munt-Nixon bill says it shall be unlawful for any person to attempt in any manner to establish in the United States a totalitarian dictatorship the direction and control of which is to be vested in or exercised by or under the domination or control of any foreign government, foreign organization, or foreign individual, or to perform or attempt to perform any act with the intent to facilitate such end. Now, I hold that that directly fits and applies to the Communist Party organization in the United States and in the world today. The question then is, does it so apply? Obviously, you cannot and should not draft your law in such form that a mere name results in an outlawing. It's being directed by a foreign power for the purpose of undermining the liberty of the American people and overthrowing our government, which is the key point. They are so doing. There should be no doubt of that. Here is a quote from uh, Louis Bedens, who left the Communist Party. He said, we must understand then, before we get to the meat of the matter, that we are dealing with a conspiracy to establish Soviet dictatorship throughout the world. Many such instances. Generalissimo Stalin himself said in the speech to the American delegation in 1928, and they're now reverting to that policy, the Communist Party of America, the section of the Third International, must pay membership dues to the common turn. All the decisions of the Congress of the Third International are obligatorily carried out by all the parties affiliated. In other words, the decision in Moscow by the Kremlin must be carried out in America. So that definitely and directly, the Munt-Nixon bill will outlaw the Communist Party as it is now functioning in America and in the world. In fact, perhaps we're coming down to a point where we can reach agreement. 
Although I heard the governor say that he did not think the Munt Nixon bill would outlaw the Communist Party, I did not hear him say whether he would support that bill. Now, if he will say that he approves of and will support the Munt Nixon bill, I will be satisfied that we have reached an agreement that we have thereby outlawed the Communist Party as it actually operates, and therefore we can go on on these other very important issues in this campaign. I reiterate, if the governor feels that he can support the Munt Nixon bill, I will agree that that is sufficient to outlaw the party as it is now constituted, and we can go on to other important issues in the development of Oregon and in America. Now then, on this matter of the Communist Party in Russia, the actual report, the history of the Communist Party, which is an established work on what happened in Russia, states very positively that the Communists were not outlawed, the Bolshevik Party, so to speak, were not outlawed in Russia, and elected six members to the last Duma in the last election which were held. So I, of course, realize that we cannot in these few minutes left in the debate check references, but I submit to the governor that he should look up his references in the history of what happened uh, in Russia. Now then the governor says that we have effective laws now, 17 of them, that all they need to do is use them. May I ask them, why is it that the Communist Party organization has been growing so strong in New York? New York is the national headquarters of the Communist Party of America. New York, with 9% of America's population, has 40% of the communists in America. New York is the capital communist center in America. And from that center, from the national headquarters in New York, they've been reaching out and infiltrating in the labor organizations of America. They've been prejudicing the sovereignty of this country and the harmonious relationships in labor. Clearly, does the governor not agree that they have been operating underground now? It's not a matter of driving them underground by the passage of a law. They are underground and overground, and they themselves pick out which one best serves their purposes in each instance. Now, I submit, so far as I've observed, there's only been one conviction of a communist in New York in the last eight years, and that was the uh, publisher or editor of The Daily Worker, and he was published or he was convicted for a libel against another editor that really had no connection with communist activity. If there are these laws now that are adequate, why have they not been used in New York? Why have they been not used in the federal government? And has the governor of New York called upon the federal government to use federal laws in cooperation with the state? We found in a limited way in Minnesota, where we did have some communist infiltration in 1938, which was causing strikes and violence and killings on the streets of Minneapolis, we found that we could make progress if we cooperated with the federal government, the state government, and the local government, moving together with the assistance of loyal, patriotic American workmen to gradually weed them out. But we found we were greatly handicapped in completing the job because there was no law that directly related to the manner in which the communists took their orders from a foreign power. Let's be specific. If an underground order came from the Kremlin to the communists in America, and they held a secret meeting at which it was agreed that they were going to seek strikes in certain essential industries and stir them up with, say, industries that were going to develop some great dynamos for hydroelectric power, some great generators, or in other way interfere with the potential of this country. Even though every fact of that secret move was discovered, there's no law now under which we could act. Or suppose this underground word came and said that the communists should move in around the Panama Canal and in Alaska and just establish themselves in various jobs. And secret meetings were held where that was arranged. There's no law at this time in the books of this country that would pre permit us to move directly against that conspiracy. Under the present laws, you'd have to wait until a move of force was made or until they uncovered their hand in a very flagrant way. What we need is a law that goes directly to the problem of the way in which the communist organizations have been operating since the end of the war. They are the threat of war. 
We should not stumble along with laws that are out of date. We should bring our thinking up to date. It's not a matter of outlawing any ideas. It's not a matter of any thought control. What constitutional provision would prevent a kind of a law like the Munt-Nixon bill? Which article of the Constitution would it violate? I know of none that says that an organization may carry on in the manner in which the communist organization is carrying on now. Therefore, it's open for legislative action. And I submit to the governor that he earnestly can reconsider his position. And specifically, if he will say that he will now agree to support the Munt-Nixon bill unequivocally, then I will agree that we have reached a point of union on this important issue, and we will go forward with a constructive campaign in Oregon on those other very important questions that are before the people of this great state and before our America in the wake of war. Thank you, Governor Sasson. And now in Sir Rebuttal is Governor Dewey. Um, Mr. Van Buskirk, Mr. Stassen, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, gather from Mr. Stassen's statement that he has completely surrendered. The uh, Munt bill obviously does not outlaw the Communist Party. Mr. Stassen, in these words, has from Oregon to New Jersey and back again gone before audiences the American people demanding in these words that the Communist Communist Party be outlawed in the United States and in the other free nations of the world. The Munt Bill does not outlaw the Communist Party. The only authorities Mr. Stassen cites for the fact that for his claim that it does are the present head of the Communist Party and a former communist. Whereas I point out very clearly that the author of the bill, Mr. Munt, The committee which sponsored it both say in the official records of the Congress of the United States that the bill does not outlaw the Communist Party. Now, if Mr. Stassen says that that is all he wants, then he has completely surrendered because he admits that he didn't mean it when he's been demanding from one end of this country to the other that the Communist Party be outlawed, and he's willing to settle now when confronted with the facts for a law which the author and the committees say does not outlaw the party, which, of course, it doesn't. Now, as a matter of fact, there are 20... I made a mistake a while ago. There are not 17 laws. There are 27 laws in the United States on this subject. There's the 1938 Act requiring all agents of foreign governments to register under penalty of five years' imprisonment and $10,000 fine. The Voris Act of 1940 requiring registration of all subversive political organizations, the Smith Act, which makes it unlawful to teach or advise the desirability of overthrowing the government of the United States by force or to publish any literature, teaching, advising, suggesting, or to conspire to do so, all under penalty of 10 years' imprisonment and $10,000 fine. All of the things of which Mr. Stassen has spoken are covered by the Smith Act, by the treason bill, the misprison of treason, inciting rebellion, insurrection. I'm reading a few of the titles. Criminal correspondence with the foreign government, seditious conspiracy, subversive activities, sabotage, sabotage, broad conspiracy, enticing desertions, sabotage, non-mailable matter, inciting mutiny, espionage, mutiny, sedition, conspiracy to commit espionage or sedition. Uh, That's about it. The list is endless. The Munt bill is perfectly harmless, probably. I have some doubts about its constitutionality. It supplements the uh, these bills in a very small way. It doesn't outlaw the Communist Party. It may have the virtue of helping to keep them out in the open because its main provisions are that the Communists must register, must register all their members and keep them everlastingly out in the open. That is a very good provision of law. The other parts of it, if they're constitutional, they're swell. Now let's get on to the rest of the subject. Mr. Stassen has surrendered. He is no longer in favor of outlawing the Communist Party. 
He is now willing to content, be content with a bill which simply says what is practically already in the law and which all the sponsors in the Congress say does not outlaw the party. But this is so dangerous, this idea. It is so fundamental to American liberties that I should like to enlarge upon it just a little. Mr. Stassen has spoken of New York. He's spoken of our history. Let me give you just a bit of history. 150 years ago, the French, the French were the Bolsheviks of the world. They had a violent revolution, and they beheaded their nobility, just as the communists did in Russia. First they had purges of the old government, then they had purges among themselves. And then they started rattling their swords for world conquest. It's all just like the movie we've been through, and this is where we came in. You see the same thing now, 150 years later. Many people in the infant American Republic were trembling in their boots, just as some Americans now tremble in theirs. They were afraid for the cause of free government. The Federalist Party was at power, in power, and it proceeded, but, but let me quote from Chaffee, one of the great American historians. He writes, In 1798, the impending war with the French, the spread of revolutionary doctrines by foreigners in our midst, and the spectacle of the disastrous operation of these doctrines abroad, I'm still quoting, facts, all of which, says Mr. Chaffee, have a familiar sound today led to the enactment of the alien and sedition laws. These laws punished false and malicious writings against the government, the Congress, or the president. If they were intended to excite the hatred of the people or to stir up sedition or excite, excite resistance to law or to aid any hostile design of any foreign nation against the United States. The acts created such a furor and opposition that the whole country was in turmoil. The only Federalist leader who dared speak out for the Bill of Rights was John Marshall, who later became the great Chief Justice. But the Federalists went bullheadedly ahead. The act was used to punish even Republican editors who had criticized President Adams. And ten of them, all Republicans, were fined and sent to prison. Soon every person who was prosecuted, however violent the language he'd used, was treated as a martyr and a hero. Adopting what the historians Charles and Mary Beard describe in their basic history of the United States as underground political tactics, Thomas Jefferson wrote an indictment of the laws and persuaded the state of Kentucky to declare them null and void. At the next election, Thomas Jefferson was elected president of the United States, and the Federalist Party was utterly wrecked. Jefferson pardoned all the victims of his laws. Congress later refunded all the fines, and Thomas Jefferson's party held uninterrupted office in the United States for 20 years. That was the result of an early American idea, of a merely American attempt to shoot an idea with a law. You can't do it. And now that Mr. Stassen has surrendered on his outlawing idea, let's nail this thing down so hard no American will ever again seek give the slightest impression to our people that it can be done. It can't. It is self-destructive. Even in the midst of the Civil War, General Burnside tried to suppress the newspapers that were hostile to our government. General Burnside put them out of business, and Lincoln gave him orders to quit, saying in strong language that it is better that the people hear what they have to say than fear what they might say if they were suppressed. Now, we have a lot of communists in New York. We have a great many of them, and they cause us great trouble. But we lick them. The number in the country is down from 100,000 two years ago to 70,000 last year to 68,000 this year in New York. Their influence is at the lowest ebb in its history. They ganged up with the Democrats, the American Labor Party, the miscalled Liberal Party, and the PAC to beat us two years ago, the communists labeled me as their public enemy number one, and we licked them by the biggest majority in history. Why? Because we kept them out in the open. Because we everlastingly believe in the Bill of Rights. Because we know that if in this country we will always keep every idea that's bad out in the open, we will lick it. It will never get any place in the United States. Thank you, Governor Dewey. We Oregon Republicans are proud that our party has represented 
by two such capable and outstanding gentlemen. And we will all give our wholehearted support to the winner. We sincerely hope all those who are listening will feel the same. You have just heard a debate by Governor Thomas E. Dewey of New York and ex-Governor Harold E. Stassen of Minnesota. Free time has been made available by NBC and its affiliated independent stations to present this special program. Listen next week over most of these same stations for the Carnation Contented Hour and the Fred Waring Program. This broadcast came to you from Portland, Oregon. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The National Broadcasting Company presents Clifton Utley with a commentary on the news. Here is Mr. Utley speaking from Chicago. Good evening. By speedily recognizing the new state of Israel, the United States achieved the rather dubious distinction of having had three Palestine policies inside the past six months. First, we favored partition. Then, when we discovered that the Arabs were prepared to resist partition with considerable force, we immediately reached the conclusion that partition could be carried out only with the aid of substantial international forces, acting under the United Nations. And since Russia would have the power to veto the sending of any United Nations force of which he didn't approve, it stood to reason that Russia would insist on Soviet contingents being included in any peace preservation forces the UN Security Council might decide to send to Palestine to carry out petition. But as we had long since learned that Russian troops seldom left any territories where they became involved, and since we also had a pretty good idea that any Russian troops in Palestine would have side instructions to create as much unrest and chaos as possible, we quickly came to the conclusion that we could not afford to have Soviet troops included in United Nations forces that would go to carry out the petition program. Much better, so our policy leaders seem to conclude, much better no petition at all than partition which would give Moscow a toehold in the Near East, even though that toehold was achieved as part of the United Nations force. At that point, we reversed our whole partition policy, and after an agonizing week at the U.N. during which it wasn't clear whether we had any policy at all, we asked the U.N. to abandon the partition program which we had sponsored and to create a temporary U.N. trusteeship over Palestine. The fundamental reason for this was a desire to keep Russian forces out of the Near East, since there is no veto in the trusteeship council, it was conceivable that a temporary trusteeship could be set up in Palestine, whereupon the trusteeship council could then vote to send an international contingent made up, well, say, of American, British, and French troops to do the required policing. The Russians, so the idea ran, would not like being left out in the cold and having Palestine policed without aid of a contingent of Soviet troops, but since there was no veto in the trusteeship council, the most the Russians would be able to do would be to make some unfriendly speeches, and they do that anyhow. They could not either compel the inclusion of Russian forces to police a trusteeship, nor, in default of that, could they hold up the sending of an international contingent without Russian troops. This calculation was perfectly sound except for one thing. It failed to take into consideration the fact that a number of European nations which had not been very enthusiastic about following our petition program, for it was our program, in the first place, that a number of these European nations might be even less anxious to follow our lead after we'd led the UN up the street and then back down again in the whole petition question. In fact, of course, that was what happened. When we were first arguing in favor of the petition program, various European countries warned privately of the petition scheme were it to be enforced by the United Nations, would inevitably run into the necessity of using Russian troops in the policing contingents. These nations warned that unless we were ready to permit the Russians to get this Near East foothold, partition was a bad gamble from the United Nations standpoint. And so when their predictions about partition under the United Nations came true, and we changed the trusteeship policy, it was small wonder that a great many countries refused to follow our lead, wherefore the entire trusteeship program went into the scrap heap. Thereupon, we advised the Jewish leaders not to proclaim the independence of Israel immediately following the end of the British mandate. But since we were unable to promise the Jewish leaders any definite reward in case they followed our advice, and since by that time it was perfectly clear that the Arab countries were going to invade Palestine whether Israel did or did not declare its independence, the Jewish leaders did the quite natural thing. They declared independence the moment the mandate ended and then forced our hand. Whereupon we acting with an alacrity exceeding even that shown by the late President Theodore Roosevelt when he recognized the Republic of Panama two days after a vote, in which we were not entirely free from complicity, we immediately recognized Israel. You can write your own ticket regarding the reasons. 
This being election year, a desire on the part of President Truman to recoup his position with the Zionist vote is obviously a factor that can't be excluded, any more than it could be excluded in the development of previous stages of our Palestine policy. But only the completely cynical would ascribe the quick Palestinian recognition primarily to considerations of our domestic electoral politics. Clearly, a major motivating factor was the fear that if we didn't move quickly, the Russians would recognize Israel before we did. And as we didn't want another case of losing the initiative to Russia, we felt we'd better move rather quickly. Quite obviously, we're by no means out of the woods yet. And equally obviously, the quixotic and apparently capricious nature of our policy in recent months is not going to inspire others, even our friends, to follow our lead in policy moves from here on. By recognizing Israel, we have climbed back on the partition bandwagon. We recognize it as an accomplished fact. Let us be fully aware of the fact that such speedy recognition of a new country is very unusual in international relations. The United States was very severely criticized internationally when Theodore Roosevelt extended his super-quick recognition in the Republic of Panama case, and then, at the same time, practically forbade the Republic of Colombia, from which Panama had revolted, to try to reconquer its revolting territory. In the present instance, where we are the one great power to have recognized Israel so far, we are bound to be under strong pressure to give additional aid, and to the extent that fortunes of war should go against Israel, should that prove the case, the pressure on the administration is bound to be doubled and redoubled. And in this connection, the importance of domestic campaign considerations in connection with the pressure cannot be overlooked. The probable next steps are, I think, quite clear. There's already been the demand from Israel that the arms embargo be removed, allowing Israel to purchase arms in the United States. The next step following will be a demand for the supplying of arms to Israel on lend-lease account, and there we may run into some difficulties. We could represent a removal of the arms embargo as an act of neutrality and impartiality. Of course, it wouldn't be neutral because it would be designed to aid Israel. Still, our State Department could say that once the embargo was removed, both Israel and the Arab nations were both free to buy arms in this country, wherefore there was no one-sidedness. However, once we go the additional step, once we begin to supply arms to Israel on Lend-Lease account, then there's no longer possibility even to pretend the action is neutral. At that moment, we incur the even greater enmity of the Arab countries. And we set up a situation which clearly invites Russia to fish in the troubled waters of Arabic nations. To this one can reply that the Arab leaders, no matter how much they may hate us, simply cannot play ball with the Russians, since the present leaders of the Arabic countries belong to the landholding classes, that is, those very classes whom the communists would be the first to dispossess and to shoot if they ever came into power in the Near and Middle East. All of which is perfectly true. But it's also true that once we become involved in Lend-Lease aid to Israel, thereby enabling the Russians to make effective propaganda among the Arab peoples, holding us up as enemies of the Arabs, it's also true that the Russians, once able to do that, may be capable of fomenting considerable pro-Soviet and anti-American activity among the masses in Arab nations. The net result of that could well be additional chaos throughout the Near and Middle East and more trouble for the West in getting needed oil out of the Near and Middle East regions. In connection with oil, remember this. Europe needs about one million barrels of Near and Mideast oil products a day if she is to achieve the minimum necessary economic recovery. Thus, from the standpoint of defeating the Marshall Plan and of preventing European recovery, Russia does not have to take control of the Near and Middle East. It is sufficient for Russian purposes in the Near East simply to have sufficient chaos there so that oil does not flow from the Near and Middle East in sufficient quantities. Now, I realize that in raising this question of Israel asking Lend-Lease, I'm getting a ways ahead of the story of the moment, but probably not as far ahead as many of you listening tonight will think. And then there are many other problems that are now bound to arise. Tomorrow, the United Nations Security Council meets to consider what should be done regarding the Arab nation's invasion of Palestine. Now, if all the major nations of the U.N. promptly recognized Israel, as Israel requested tonight, that would create a much simpler situation. But so far, they haven't done so. One British sp spokesman, with a tart sarcasm directed at our American policy, said yesterday that Britain was in no hurry to recognize Israel. 
There is no need to hurry, the spokesman added. There's no election in this country until 1950. We can now foresee whether other nations... We cannot foresee whether other nations will follow our lead and give Israel quick recognition. They may be deterred from doing so simply on the grounds that our policy has been so changeable and capricious in the past, wherefore they'll want to know more about what we are, where we're likely to be leading them this time before they go along. If they fail to recognize Israel in the early future, it's possible that we and some of our normal allies will be talking at cross-purposes in United Nations sessions. We asking the U.N. to prevent aggression against the nation that we recognize, while others show no enthusiasm for action on behalf of a country they do not recognize. And, of course, another reason for the restrained enthusiasm of other nations will be the question, what tangibly can be done to help Israel? Raising the arms embargo is one thing. Eventually, land lease is another. But both those things can be done by the United States alone. Suppose the United Nations, however, issued a sort of cease and desist order to the Arab nations telling them not to attack that part of Palestine assigned to Israel in the United Nations Palestine Partition Plan. And suppose the Arab nations thereupon simply laughed at the U.N. Well, you'd immediately be back at the question of sending U.N. troop contingents to combat aggression. And when you came up to that again, you would first encounter the political opposition, particularly in an election year, which would greet any proposal to send American troops to fight in Palestine. But even if that hurdle were jumped, you would then have to face the fact that if any U.N. force were sent to Palestine, Russian troops would have to be included, since the decision to send such a force would have to be taken by the Security Council. And Russia, of course, would use its veto to block the sending of any force in which Soviet troops were not included. In short, we'd be right back where we were two months ago. So we're going to find, once the U.N. begins to consider what action it should take now that the Arabs actually are invading Palestine, that a great number of countries are not very anxious to do very much. First, because they can't quite see what can be done that would be effective. And second, because following our lead has led them into uncertain bypaths so many times that they aren't very anxious to follow the lead of a nation that is likely to backtrack at any moment. It's this undermining of confidence in our leadership that is the worst aspect of our whole Palestine policy. The man who said Britain didn't need to hurry to recognize Israel because Britain had no election until 1950 may have been getting off a wisecrack, but the jest reflected something more fundamental in the minds of many Europeans and many others. Russia is always preaching that come a depression, we will up and pull out of Europe, leaving the European nations to fend for themselves, which means, of course, leaving them to be devoured by Russia. So Russia says to these nations, why not line up with us now? Well, We've been successful thanks to the Marshall Plan and various other things in encouraging these countries to retain their independence. But when this constant Russian preachment that one day we will pull out is paralleled by a quite obviously capricious American short-run policy in the matter of Palestine, well, can you wonder that some of these countries are disturbed lest an American policy that so quickly and so often reverses itself in the short run may not do so in the long run and do exactly what Russia says we will do, leave the rest of the world out on a limb to be knocked down by the heavy paw of the Russian bear? You saw an example of this European fear last week when the Russians published the declaration of Ambassador Smith together with Molotov's reply. We quickly recognized our statement for what it was, we in this country, simply a restatement of American policy designed to prevent Russian misunderstanding. But the Europeans, particularly the British and the French, did experience a momentary shiver of apprehension They feared it might be the beginnings of American negotiations with Russia behind the backs of Western Europe. And behind that fear was concern lest we might negotiate a deal with Russia, leaving Western Europe out in the cold. We explained it away, and damage in consequence was minimal. But perhaps some damage remains. In sum, it all comes down to this. A great nation cannot be capricious in one part of its policy, say, Palestine, without paying for such capriciousness in decreased world confidence in all aspects of its policy everywhere. It is this oneness of policy that we Americans need increasingly to bear in mind. Good night. You have heard Clifton Utley with a commentary on the news. Mr. Utley is heard each Sunday night at this time speaking from the NBC Newsroom in Chicago. 
This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. We have two cases of history where these two gentlemen are concerned. Now, Johnny Addy up in the ring with the announcement. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I want to introduce one of America's greatest tenors. We're now going to have the Star Spangled Banner. Great pleasure in introducing to you star of radio and the stage, Joe Moran. Joe Moran, come up, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air came through through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wear History must repeat itself tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Rather a broad statement, we'll admit, but remember we have two cases of history where these two gladiators are concerned. In this three-bout series that had its inception at Yankee Stadium in September in 1946. What I'm... Here tonight at Bears Stadium in Newark, New Jersey. has hosted so many outstanding championship battles in the past. When Mel Allen takes the microphone for the blow-by-blow -blow description, he should feel right at home. Mel is known to the world at large as the best baseball broadcaster in the business, and this is a ballpark, isn't it? And there'll be plenty of pitching and plenty of catching. That's why we say that history must repeat itself tonight, since they'll put the KO on Rocky in their first Brannigan. Rocky turned the tables last year, and both boys will be satisfied with nothing less than a decisive knockout win tonight. Not just a win, but a knockout win. There'll be ring courage by the car load on exhibition in this middleweight championship affair such as both men have shown since the starts of their professional careers, that Zale started way back in 1934 and Rocky in 1942. And remember, one big item tonight, the state of New Jersey has insisted that the contenders in there use the eight-ounce gloves, which is two ounce heavier than the gloves with which they fought the last time, and that one item could make quite a difference in the outcome of this championship battle as Rocky Graziano defends over here under the auspices of the Tournament of Champions and uh, Abe Green, the president of the NBA and the uh, director of boxing for the state of New Jersey, has come up with what appears to be a honey because while there was a lot of talk for a while that the weather had handicapped this affair, nevertheless, we have what looks like a sellout tonight, and here comes Rocky Graziano, the champion of the world in the middle leg division into the ring. Rocky has a heavy beard. He has a green jacket around him with Rocky Graziano emblazoned on it in uh, white letters. And his entire retinue come through to take the corner to our right, to the right of the microphone. Mel Allen is here. We haven't heard from Mel since we've uh, been over here for the start of festivities. And we want to bring him in just for a word because we know that uh, he's got a lot of work to do before taking over for the blow, blow, blow. But first, here comes Tony Zale, the uh, challenger for the middleweight championship of the world in the ring. Mel Allen, come in and tell me how you think both boys look tonight. Hello there, everybody. They really look uh, in grand condition. We've seen them before, but they've both come, come into the ring with serious looks on their respective faces because they know it's really going to be a terrific battle. And incidentally, Tony Zale, it's a little cool out here this evening, he's wearing long trousers to keep himself as warm as possible. But by the way, Russ, 
When our old friend Valentine's Bard heard that you and I were broadcasting this Graziano's Dale fight, he begged to put in an appearance, too, in a neutral corner. You mean in the Valentine Poets corner? <laughs> well, of course, Russell. <laughs> so our long-haired friend dipped his worn quill pen into the ink, shut his eyes for a moment, and scribbled this little jingle on the back of a Valentine label. I can't wait. Goes like this. When you're watching a fight in the ring, you want action with plenty of zing. And after the bout, three rings fairly shout that avails... Valentine is the king. And it takes only one round to prove that, Mel. Yes, folks, one taste of Valentine ale, and you'll count yourself among the millions who agree Valentine is the finest ale man can make or money can buy. And let me tell you, right now is the perfect time to enjoy Valentine. Before the fight gets underway, slip out into the kitchen and get yourself a bottle. Or if you're listening in at your favorite tavern, just ask the men for Valentine, America's largest selling ale. Well, you didn't miss anything. An announcement was made begging the uh, fans to take their seats before the start of the scrap, and a battery of uh, leading boxers of the day take over in the ring to soon be introduced. Paul Cavalier has just been introduced as the referee for the middleweight championship fight of the world here at Bear Stadium in New York, New Jersey, and that is a very important post because the referee is the sole judge tonight. His vote is what counts. There is no voting by judges, as is uh, done in New York and in rings, other rings around the country in some states. Here in New Jersey, the referee's vote is all that counts. So now, of course, you see the usual activity that is going on in the ring with uh, the gloves being produced. Zale looking very quiet and very confident over his corner. Both boys, of course, heavily bearded, haven't shaved for three days. Zale is in a white terry cloth bathrobe with, as Mel told you, the long trousers to keep him warm. Now, remember, Tony's complaint from the Chicago affair was that it was too warm there for him, and this cool night in Newark may be exactly what he wants. It is not a night that uh, we would say is at all cold. The temperature is at least 60, but the boys should be able to work up a fine sweat and put up a wonderful encounter. Incidentally, movies are being made of this entire contest, so you fans around the nation can see them very soon in your, uh, in your neighborhood theaters. So uh, we're looking right up now at Paul Cavalier, who has a very fine record of refereeing in the state of New Jersey. Now up to the ring announcer, Johnny Addy. Ladies and gentlemen, your very kind attention, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be very brief, just one announcement, and we'll go through these gentlemen very quickly. On behalf of the Tournament of Champions and the State of New Jersey, in the name of Mr. Ben Bodney, President, Andy Niederreiter, Promoter, and their associates in this promotion, permit me to express our keen appreciation for your wonderful attendance here tonight. We sincerely hope you will be with us again in future championship presentations. That's all. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx Express challenges the winner of tonight's contest, Jacob LaMotta. The always pleasing Bayonne welterweight, Tony Riccio. Former light heavyweight champion of the world, Milio Bettina. And now making a successful comeback, one of the contenders for light heavyweight honors, Johnny Colan. Here, ladies and gentlemen, considered by boxing experts, as one of the cleverest boxers of all time, Tippy Larkin. And here's the Irvington New Jersey contender for Ray Robinson's welterweight crown, Charlie Pusari. Another popular JBIite, lightweight from Rahway, New Jersey, Freddie Russell. And also the pleasing New York welterweight, Billy Graham. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here's a newcomer from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Undefeated in 40 professional bouts. Undefeated as a middleweight, Lee Sala. And here, ladies and gentlemen, the leading contender for light heavyweight championship honors, Isa Charles. As is Charles. Also here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, 
Attention, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll try to get them all, please. Hero of World War II, former lightweight and welterweight champion of the world, Bonnie Ross. Come on up, Bonnie Ross. They're waiting on uh, Barney Ross to come up, and now Johnny Addy will introduce someone else. The dandy of the welterweight division, the welterweight king, Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray Robinson has been introduced and is trying to fight his way also, through the mob at ringside. Here's the another announcement. The outstanding personality in the ring today, boxing's wonder man, the light heavyweight champion of the world, Gus Lesnovic. Gus Lesnovich, who makes his home very close to here, has just been introduced. And now Barney Ross has finally been able to work his way up through the crowd to uh, take Ladies his uh, bow. Here he comes to the ring Ross. now. He looks wonderful as he climbs through the ropes. Barney Ross, who was the lightweight and welterweight champion, and then a terrific Marine out at Guadalcanal. Barney's put on a pound or two, and his hair is gray, but we know that he still could find his way around that ring Ladies if somebody were to put a pair of gloves Roller, on him. heavyweight champion of the world, the Manassa Mola, Jack Dempsey. Dempsey coming up the aisle to our right. That is Ladies coming into Rocky Graziano's corner. And Gus Lesnovich is flying through. Light heavyweight king and the boy that has met them all and right now is the kingpin. Now Dempsey is shaking hands with Graziano and the Manasseh Baller at over Hi, 50. Dempsey. Looks wonderful. Dark blue suit. White and black sports shoes. Walks around that ring with a cat-like tread. Light heavyweight champion of the world, Bob Owen. Bob Owen, the former light heavyweight champion, shaking hands with Jack Dempsey right now. I believe Bob outweighs gentlemen. Jack. Undefeated heavyweight champion of the world, Gene Tunney. Gene Tunney. We're going to have another meeting in the ring between Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney. Gene Tunney, who took a the title away from Dempsey in 1926. Billy Stoops. Come on up. Billy Stoops has also been introduced, and he's about ready to come up. All of those that have been introduced represent a regular who's who in the boxing Ladies profession, famous fighters of all time. Tunney. Here's Gene Tunney. And it seems almost impossible that uh, it was way back in 1926 that Dempsey and Gene got together. They both still appear to be in wonderful physical trim. They shake hands, Gene in his gray suit, Jack Dempsey in his uh, dark blue suit. And there's a battery of cameras all over them as they're taking pictures to be shown to you folks around the country. And uh, also now Johnny Addy, the Announcer comes over to the ring. What they're trying to do is to get some uh, poses out of uh, Tony and Dempsey. Tony Torito of St. Paul, Minnesota, who took a voting poll all over the nation for Rocky Graziano, showed out of 11,000 votes shown, showed it 34 to 1 for Rocky to fight again, and Rocky said Torito helped him 100% in getting back into the ring. Looking around now, as we have a little time, looking up at Ray Arcel, who is in Tony Zales' corner. And Whitey Bimstein over in Rocky Graziano. Some of the famous writers who are here tonight. Gene Castro of the Chicago Times. Johnny Hoffman of Chicago. Mayor O'Dwyer of New York City has entered just about a half hour ago and got his usual final right, ovation. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being so wonderful. Thank you. Others here tonight. Willie Ratner of the Newark News. Hi, Goldberg of the Newark News and of the Sports Ladies Album. Ladies and gentlemen. Here's Johnny Addy again. This is the main event. 15 rounds for the middleweight championship of the world. Introducing from Gary, Indiana, wearing purple trunks, the outstanding challenger for the middleweight title, Tony Zale. From Gary and his tonight. opponent from Brooklyn, New York, wearing black trunks, the middleweight champion of the world, Rocky Graziano. Rocky takes a full spin and a bow, and he's got a very confident grin on his face. I'll certainly say that. Attention, please. The weight. Weight. Jail. 158 and three-quarter pounds. 
Graziano, 158 and a half. Ladies and gentlemen, the ring officials assigned for this contest by the new JV State Athletic Commission. Timekeeper, Bill Mullet. Counting for the knockdowns at the bell, Nat Fleischer. Referee, Paul Cavalier. Main event, 15 rounds for the middleweight championship of the world. Two other bouts to follow. Hey, fans, are you listening on your home set, sharing this exciting bout with good friends? Well, the instructions are being given up in the ring. Just over our heads. Particularly when I say break, I want you boys to break clean. You understand that? Now, the one who disobeys my orders is being fought against. And they mean the winning or losing of this fight. Now, you both understand that, here, boys? Now, look, in case I'm not down, I want you to go to the fire crew for sure. home. We just want to remind you that boxing in Valentine is a great combination. So why, right now, why don't you do yourself proud and treat your friends to a round of Valentine Ale or Beer? That's right, Valentine Ale or Valentine Beer. The instructions are over up in the ring. Nat Fleischer is getting ready to count for the knockdowns, if any, and we have an idea. The middleweight championship is on the line, and here to tell you all about it is Mel Allen. Come in, Mel. Waiting for the bell for round one, ladies and gentlemen. There it is. Both men come out to the center of the ring. They're looking a left hook to the chin by Graziano. Dale flicks out with a left jab. They're looking at each other, looking each other over very carefully. A left hook to the chin by Zale and another left hook to the chin by Graziano. Zale flicks out with a left, looking for an open throw. The left hook and a left to the chin and one to the midsection. They're trying to pull the ropes and Zale is throwing left and right to Graziano's head off the rope. And Rocky is trying to drive back in and they go into a tie-up on the ropes over the far side of the ring. All right, Paul Cavalier separates them. A little uh, crimson on uh, Rocky's head as Tony Zale got in a few good punches. They're looking each other over again. Zale watching very carefully. He throws a right to the heart of Graziano. Graziano retaliated with a light right and a left hook to the chin by Zale. And Graziano ties him up as they go into the infighting. Separated by referee Paul Cavalier. Just underway round one. And there's a good left hook and down goes Graziano. Left hook to the chin by Zale. Rocky gets up immediately at a count of two, three, four. He's up. And now we're ready. And Zale over in the corner near the microphone. Throws a left hook high on the head of Rocky Graziano. Rocky throws a wild right to the heart. And Zale comes back with a left hook to the chin. And now they're separated. And there Zale throws a right to the heart a little bit short. Now Rocky looks in, trying to get there, takes a left hook on the head. Zale throws a left that misses. Zale is misses, uh, ducks away from a wild right swing by Rocky. And Zale comes in the end fighting, misses a wild right to the head. Rocky hasn't thrown a good punch yet. He uh, ducks away from a left, but gets a right under the heart. They go in close as they go into the clinch. And they're separated now by Paul Cavalier. Zale's nose a little red. Rocky throws a left hook, just grazes the nose of Tony Zale. Tony, stalking his opponent, throws the left, it misses over the left shoulder, and he gets Rocky on the rope, throws the left to the hook, they're in tight. Rocky ties him up, a little infighting, either boy throwing any terrific punches in the infighting. They're separated again by Paul Cavalier. Rocky throws a right that's short, and Zale comes back with a hard right that's short. And now Zale throws a right to the heart. He's trying to bore in. Rocky has gotten a little bit the worst of it thus far in the first round. And now Zale starts to bore in, throws the left hook on the chin of Rocky, got him on the corner, throws the left hook high on the head. And Rocky is trying to get away as Zale comes in close to him, and Rocky ties him up. And now they're separated. Out in the center of the ring, Rocky licks out with a left that's short. Zale throws a right to the midsection, takes a right on the chin. And now as they move around, Rocky's trying to throw that right of his. Zale, the clever boxer. Rocky's a big puncher. Rocky throws a left hook that rocks Zale slightly. And now Rocky throws another left hook to the chin of Zale. Zale looking for another opening. And Rocky now is dancing around, moving around, circling to the right of Zale. Zale throws a right to the midsection, drives Rocky back onto the ropes. Rocky bounces off, comes back to the left that's short. And now Zale moving in, looking for that opening. Rocky bobbing and weaving, throws a right uppercut that misses, and the left hook that misses. And now Zale, beautifully dancing away, looking for an opening to throw on. He throws a left to the chin of Rocky. It didn't hurt him very much. And now Rocky, boring in, takes a hard right to the heart, throws a left and a right, and takes a right in turn, throws a hard right and a left hook, and then on to the rope. Zale's got Graziano, and there's the bell. See the boy hurt. They're still fighting. They're still fighting, and there's the bell again. That's the end of round one. Rest. Well, we expected to see it, and we are seeing it. Rocky Graziano went down in the first minute with a count of four from a com com combination of a terrific left hook to the midsection and a right cross to the chin, and he was dazed as he got up. As a result, Rocky was never able to really get off the rest of the round, and he has suffered a very shallow cut up uh, right at the bridge of the nose, and the claret has started to flow. Then at the end of the round, after Zale had repeatedly been pounding away at the kidney of Rocky Graziano in an attempt to bring down that uh, left-hand guard of his, 
Zale had Rocky in plenty of trouble. Rocky's eyes were glazed right up over Rocky's corner, and both boys appeared to hear the bell but decided to keep on fighting for some reason or other. Rocky had a tough round. If you remember their previous fight, they're likely to have some more tough rounds with 14 more to go. Now the warning whistle is sounded. Here's Mel Allen. Round two. Both boys come out the center of the ring. Graziano's a little trouble in that first round. He looks a little fresh. Takes a left hook onto the chin. Misses with the left himself. Now there's Tony Zale looking for an opening. Rocky dances away, throws the left that misses, and takes the left on the chin. The light one throws the left hook to Zale's chin. It didn't do too much damage. They move in close. A hard right to the head by Zale. It rocked Rocky just a little bit. Rocky still bores in, takes the left hook onto the chin. Still looking for an opening. Rocky feints with his left. He throws a left jab that doesn't get in there. Then he throws a left hook up to the head of uh, Tony Zale. Doesn't hurt too much. Tony trying to bore in. Throws out a left that's short. And now Rocky throws a right to the kidney and a left hook to the chin and takes a left to the chin. Rocky Granziano, the champion, looks in, trying to get that opening, takes a hard right to the kidney and a right to the head by Tony Zale. And now there's Rocky moving in still with Tony boxing beautifully and cleverly. Throws out a left that tries to get into the face of Granziano. Rocky throws a right that lands but takes a left on the head in return. And now there is Rocky Granziano dancing away. He and Tony Zale looking for that one opening. Looking for the knockdown early. And now there's Tony Zale eyeing his opponent. He ducks and throws a left to the chin of Rocky Granziano as he bobs beautifully and weaves. Graziano throws a left to the chin to the light one. He's boring in, boring in, and there's a light left to the chin of Graziano. Graziano throws a left hook to the chin, takes a left on the face, a light one in return. A left to the head by Tony Zale. Rocky throws a light left to the chin. Throws a hard right and takes a left and a right in return as they tie a hard left hook to the chin by Tony Zale. And now there's Rocky taking a light left on the head and a good left straight to the chin as he moves away now from Tony Zale and a hard right to the chin by Graziano and Rocky backs away and now they're sparring around a little bit out in the center of the ring Rocky bobbing and weaving looking for an opening to throw that terrific right of his he throws a left to the chin of Zale and backs Zale up a little bit he dances away Zale dances away now as they move in once more there's a light left flicked out by Graziano Zale with a hard left to the chin of Graziano Graziano circles around to the right to the left uh, Tony Zale. Zale throws a left hook to the chin, the left to the midsection, and started moving in, but Graziano danced away nicely to avoid that barrage. A hard right to the chin by Zale, and Rocky's up against the ropes. A left and a right, and a hard right by Graziano, and a left hook to the midsection, and a right to the midsection by Zale. And Rocky's on the ropes. Now he dances away, and a hard right and the left to the midsection, and a right to the chin by Zale. And Rocky takes a left to the head. Now Rocky takes a hard right under the heart, and they're right in front of our microphones, and Zale's in the corner, and Rocky goes to work on him with a left and a right to the head. And Rocky is moving. He's the aggressor. A left to the midsection. A right to the chin by Rocky. And Zale is taking it left and right. And Rocky with a hard right to the heart. And now Graziano with a left hook to the chin. He's got Zale in front of Throws a hard right to the left. And a hard right to the head and the rope. And there's Zale taking a terrific bit of punishment. And Rocky is moving up. He's following up. A left to the chin by Graziano. A hard right to the heart by Graziano. And Zale ties Rocky up over the ropes on the far side of the ring. Paul Cavalier comes in. We've got about 10 seconds left in the round separates them and now a left hook to the midsection by Zale as round two ends Russ you know folks if you could take a quick look around here at the fans of Newark Stadium you'd soon discover that the great ringside favorite for refreshment is can you guess well of course the three rings yes the Ballantine three ring trademark there's lots of fight fans here tonight sharpening up their pleasure with a bottle of Ballantine ale or beer so take a tip from them won't you look for the three rings call for Ballantine ale or beer the fellas seem to be repeating the old-time script, but before we comment on round two, let's pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Your radio box seat for baseball and boxing, KBMY in Billings. Rocky looked ready to go early in round two, but he came battling back and he had Zale ready to break ground and glad to break ground in the final seconds of round two. Round three may prove to be an entirely different story. Here's Mel Allen. Round three. Rocky throws a hard right to Zale's heart and dances away. Zale cannot retaliate. Rocky throws a hard right to the left and then Zale counters with a left and the right to the midsection. And now there's Zale cleaning with the right, throwing a beautiful left hook to the chin. He's got Rocky on the rope, throws a left and a right to the chin. Rocky is, can't see at the moment. He's down. And then he gets right up again. He almost went down. And there's Zale throwing left and right. He's got Rocky on the rope. Rocky is battling back furiously, trying to get a punch. And he takes a hard right to the heart. And Zale is trying to measure him. He's got Rocky on the rope. And now Rocky gets away from him. And there goes Rocky down with a left hook to the chin. He's down. Four, five, six, 
seven. Rocky's up at eight, and he's almost out. Paul Cavalier steps in between them, and now there is a right to the mid section, a right to the chin by Zayla. Left the head, a right to the left to the face. Zayla's got him on the rope, measuring him, going left and right, and now Rocky tries to fight back. He's sagging around the ring, a right to the mid section, and Rocky is down. A left hook to the chin, turning to four, three, four, five. Graziano's down. Six, seven, eight, nine. Dan and Graziano's knocked out by Tony Vale in the third round. And Graziano is still on the canvas. He's still on the canvas. Okay, Russell, take it away. Well, it was a terrific left hand of Tony Vale that went to work on Rocky Graziano in round three. Both of the knockdowns suffered, were set up first with the left hand, then Vale would come slipping in, fainting with his right, and then he would nail him on the chin with his left hook. Nobody hey, could Tony, stand up under the help Rocky up, Tony. Tony. That's all oh, I'm sorry. I'm and sorry. Guess the rules. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Tony Zale, who Tony just Zale. won the middleweight championship of the world, and regained it with a terrific fight. One of the best I've ever seen. What What is it? A left hook, as we call it? Left well, hook, yes. But you sent him up with the right under the heart, didn't you? That's right. Right the left hook. Well, how do you feel, Tony? Oh, well, I feel Did like... Did you take much of a punchment yourself in the yeah. round? No, it was just I didn't know. Was there ever any moment in there that you didn't think you might win it? No, I thought pretty hard. Well, that's well, Tony. Well, how do you feel about regaining the championship of the world? Wonderful, well. Thanks, Bob. It was one minute, eight seconds of the third round. Okay, so, uh, Tony Zale, the new middleweight champion of the world. Take a bow first. We said the third round, didn't we? Ray Arcel. Uh, what do you say, Ray? We picked him in the third round, and he won it in the third round. You sure did. Yeah. All right, uh... Uh, Tony, you say you want to say something. Tony Zale. Well, I must say the matter is hard ways and snap my ass. They've done a hard job getting in shape. And I'll stay ready. Well, that's swell, Tony Zale. And where's uh, Art Winch? Swell. Okay. Russ, take it away, son. All right, Melvin. One minute and eight seconds out of the third round of as savage a battle as you've ever seen. As Tony Zale got off first. In that one, as Tony Zale got off first and he stayed out in front, and Rocky Graziona never caught up with him, and Ray Arcel is, the, is feeling very happy tonight because he's in there with a the winner. Now Mel has gone over to Rocky Graziano's corner. Rocky doesn't appear to be in such bad condition. He's getting ready to talk to Whitey Bimstein, but maybe he's not going to be able to get The Rock to say anything. Rocky will get himself at least $120,000 for this performance tonight. Tony Zale better than 60, and both boys earned it. Rocky is still... Glassy-eyed, Whitey Bimstein says it's better that he does not continue. Were it not for the fact that a championship was at stake, referee Paul Cavalier could possibly have stopped this scrap after the second knockdown, but you, you hate to take it away from a champion as long as he's still on his feet. So with Rocky getting up at the count of seven and ready to battle back, Cavalier wiped off his gloves, noticed that his eyes were fairly clear, and decided to let him come back against Tony Zale, who's got himself a wonderful 34th birthday present. He was 34 May 29th, and I know all of the folks the whole family, mom, the wife, and everybody back in Gary, Indiana, are very proud of their champion who came back after a knockout last year at the hands of Graziano to become once again the middleweight champion of the world. You know, folks, it's a grand American habit, a trait of our character, to want to know why. That's especially true when you hear about an amazing record like this. Year in, year out, Valentine Ale outsells all other brands. Naturally, you want to know why. Of course, I can tell you Valentine Ale's great because of that wonderful combination of purity, body, and flavor. But those are just words. And the words haven't been invented that can explain Valentine's popularity the way a glass or bottle of Valentine Ale can. So pour yourself a glass. Take a drink to check its purity, a clean, sparkling taste. A second drink for body, so substantial and satisfying and yet so light. And the third drink's the payoff because it's for flavor, rich, tangy, robust. And there you are, purity, body, and flavor. The famous three-ring combination that puts Valentine Ale in a class by itself. Why not order Valentine Ale all around right now while you talk over the way this fight went with the gang? I know that you're surprised and you probably need to cool off. Do yourself proud, treat your friends especially well, and look for the three rings and call for Valentine, America's largest selling ale. Well, we saw it tonight. This is Albert B. Chandler. At this time, I would like to introduce a boy who will be under the leadership of Babe Ruth when Babe takes over his new job as director of baseball for the American Legion. Representing the boys of the American Legion, 
Speaking for every American boy, ladies and gentlemen, here is Larry Cutler. Thank you, Mr. Chandler. I guess there are thousands of 13-year-old fellows like myself in this country who have heard about Babe Ruth ever since the first time they learned there was such a game as baseball. It's a great honor to be here, just to be able to tell Babe Ruth how proud we are to have him back in baseball, back where he belongs. And to know that Babe Ruth is going to be with us, kids, well, that's the biggest and best thing that could happen in baseball. From all of us kids, babe, it's swell to have you back. And now, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the Bambino, the Sultan of Swat, Babe Ruth! gentlemen. You know how bad my voice sounds. Well, it feels just as bad. You know this baseball game of ours comes up from the youth. That means the boys. And after you're a boy and grow up to know how to play ball, then you come to the boys you see representing themselves today in your national pastime. The only real game, I think, in the world, baseball. As a rule, some people think if you give them a football or a baseball or something like that, naturally, they're athletes right away. But you can't do that in baseball. You gotta start from way down the bottom when you're six or seven years of age. You can't wait until you're 15 or 16. You gotta let it grow up with you. And if you're successful and you try hard enough, you're bound to come out on top just like these boys have come to the top now. There's been so many lovely things said about me, and I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to thank everybody. Thank you. Give away, Barry.